Hello everyone, welcome to the new audiobook. If you find it enjoyable, please give me a like and subscribe. Now, let's dive into the story. 1. Worst Day Ever Naomi I wasn't sure what to expect when I walked into Cafe Rev, but it sure as hell wasn't a picture of myself behind the register under the cheery headline, Do Not Serve. A yellow, frowny face magnet held the photo in place. First of all, I'd never set foot in Knockamount, Virginia, let alone done anything to warrant a punishment as egregious as withholding caffeine. Secondly, just what did a person have to do in this dusty little town to have a mug shot hanging in the local cafe? <laughs> mug shot. Because I was in a cafe. Gosh, I was funny when I was too tired to blink. Anyway, thirdly, it was an incredibly unflattering picture. I looked like I'd had a long-term threesome with a tanning bed and cheap eyeliner. Right about then, reality penetrated my exhausted, dazed, bobby-pinned to within an inch of its life head. Once again, Tina had managed to make my life just a little bit worse. And considering what had gone down in the last 24 hours, that was saying something. Can I help? The man on the other side of the counter, the one who could give me my precious latte, took a step back and held up hands the size of dinner plates. I don't want any trouble. He was a burly guy with smooth, dark skin and a shaved, nicely shaped head. His neatly trimmed beard was snow white, and I spotted a couple of tattoos peeking out of the neck and sleeves of his coveralls. The name Justice was stitched on his curious uniform. I tried my most winning smile, but thanks to an overnight road trip spent crying through fake eyelashes, it felt more like a grimace. That's not me, I said, pointing a finger with a wasted French tip manicure at the photo. I'm Naomi, Naomi Witt. The man peered at me with suspicion before producing a pair of spectacles from the front pocket of his coveralls and slipping them on. He blinked then gave me a head-to-toe scan. I saw the realization begin to hit. Twins, I explained. Well, shit, he murmured, stroking one of those big hands through his beard. Justice still looked a little skeptical. I couldn't exactly blame him. After all, how many people actually had an evil twin? That's Tina, my sister. I'm supposed to meet her here. Though why my estranged twin asked me to meet her in an establishment where she clearly wasn't welcome was another question I was too tired to ask. Justice was still staring at me, and I realized his gaze was lingering on my hair. Reflexively, I patted my head, and a wilted daisy fluttered to the floor. Whoops. I probably should have looked in the mirror at the motel before I set foot in public, looking like a disheveled, unhinged stranger on her way home from a role-playing festival. Here, I said, reaching into the pocket of my yoga shorts and thrusting my driver's license at the man. See? I'm Naomi, and I would really, really like a gigantic latte. Justice took my ID and studied it, then my face again. Finally, his stoic expression cracked, and he broke into a wide grin. I'll be damned. It's nice to meet you, Naomi. It's really nice to meet you too, Justice, especially if you're going to make me that aforementioned caffeine. I'll make you a latte that'll make your hair stand on end, he promised. A man who knew how to meet my immediate needs and did it with a smile? I couldn't help but fall just a little bit in love with him right then and there. While Justice got to work, I admired the cafe. It was decked out in what looked like manly garage style. Corrugated metal on the walls, shiny red shelves, stained concrete floor. All the drinks had names like Red Line Latte and Checkered Flag Cappuccino. It was downright charming. There were a handful of early morning coffee drinkers seated at the small round tables scattered throughout the place. 
Every single person was looking at me like they were really not happy to see me. How do you feel about maple and bacon flavors, darling? Justice called from the gleaming espresso machine. I feel great about them, especially if they come in a cup the size of a bucket, I assured him. His laugh echoed through the place and seemed to relax the rest of the patrons who went back to ignoring me. The front door opened, and I turned, expecting to see Tina. But the man who stormed inside was definitely not my sister. He looked to be in more dire need of caffeine than I was. Hot would be a decent way to describe him. Hot as hell would be even more accurate. He was tall enough that I could wear my highest pair of heels and still have to tilt my head up to make out with him, my official categorization of male height. His hair was in the dirty blonde range and was cut short on the sides and swept back on top, which suggested he had good taste and reasonable grooming skills. Both of those criteria landed high on my list of reasons to be attracted to a man. The beard was a brand new addition to the list. I'd never kissed a man with a beard, and I had a sudden irrational interest in experiencing that at some point. Then I got to his eyes. They were a cool blue-gray that made me think of gunmetal and glaciers. He strode right on up to me and stepped into my personal space like he had a standing invitation. When he crossed tattooed forearms across a broad chest, I made a squeaky sound in the back of my throat. Wow. Thought I made myself real clear, he growled. Uh, huh? I was confused. The man was glaring at me like I was the most hated character on a reality TV show, yet I still wanted to see what he looked like naked. I hadn't exhibited such poor sexual judgment since I was in college. I blamed my exhaustion and emotional scarring. Behind the counter, Justice stopped mid-latte creation and waved both hands in the air. Uh, Hold on now he began. It's okay, Justice, I assured him. You just keep making that coffee and I'll take care of this gentleman. Chairs pushed back from tables all around us, and I watched as every last customer beelined for the door, some with their mugs still in hand. None of them made any eye contact with me on their way out. Knox, it's not what you think, Justice tried again. I'm not playing any games today. Get the fuck out, the Viking ordered. The blonde god of sexy fury was rapidly plummeting lower on my sexy checklist. I pointed at my chest. Me? I've had enough of your games. You got five seconds to walk out this door and never come back, he said, stepping in even closer until the tips of his boots brushed my exposed toes in their flip-flops. Damn. Up close, he looked like he'd just stormed off a marauding Viking vessel, or the set of a cologne commercial. One of those weird, artsy ones that didn't make any sense and had names like Ignorant Beast. Look, sir, I'm in the midst of a personal crisis, and all I'm trying to do is get a cup of coffee. I fucking told you, Tina. You are not to come in here and harass Justice or his customers again, or I'd personally escort your ass out of town. Knox. The bad-tempered, sexy man-beast held up his finger in Justice's direction. One second, bud. Looks like I gotta take out the trash. (laughs) The trash? I gasped. I thought Virginians were supposed to be friendly. Instead, I'd been in town barely half an hour and was now being rudely accosted by a Viking with the manners of a caveman. Darlin', your coffee's up, Justice said, sliding a very large to-go cup onto the wooden counter. My eyes darted toward the steamy, caffeinated goodness. You even think about picking up that cup, and we're gonna have a problem, the Viking said, his voice low and dangerous. But Leif Erikson didn't know who he was messing with today. Every woman had her line. Mine, which was admittedly drawn too far back, had just been crossed. 
You take one step toward that beautiful latte that my friend Justice made especially for me, and I will make you regret the moment you met me. I was a nice person. According to my parents, I was a good girl. And according to that online quiz I took two weeks ago, I was a people pleaser. I wasn't great at doling out threats. The man's eyes narrowed, and I refused to notice the sexy crinkles at the corner. I already regret it, and so does this whole damn town. Just because you change your hair doesn't mean I'm going to forget about the trouble you've caused here. Now get your ass out the door and don't come back. He thinks you're Tina, Justice cut in. I didn't care if this ass thought I was a serial-killing cannibal. He was standing between me and my caffeine. The blonde beast turned his head toward Justice. What the hell are you saying? Before my nice friend with the coffee could explain, I drilled my finger into the Viking's chest. It didn't go very far, thanks to the obscene layer of muscle under the skin, but I made sure to lead with the nail. Now you listen to me, I began. I don't care if you think I'm my sister or that weasel who jacked up the price of anti-malarial drugs. I am a human being having a really bad day after the worst one of her life. I do not have it in me to stuff down these emotions today. So you'd better get out of my way and leave me alone, Viking. He looked downright bemused for a hot second. I took that to mean it was coffee time. Sidestepping him, I picked up the cup, took a delicate sniff, and then shoved my face into the steaming hot life force. I drank deeply, willing the caffeine to perform its miracles as flavors exploded on my tongue. I was pretty sure the inappropriate moan I heard came from my own mouth, but I was too tired to care. When I finally lowered the cup and swiped the back of my hand over my mouth, the Viking was still standing there staring at me. Turning my back on him, I flashed my hero Justice a smile and slid my emergency coffee $20 bill across the counter. You, sir, are an artist. What do I owe you for the best latte I've ever had in my life? Considering the morning you're having, darling, it's on the house, he said, handing my license and cash back to me. You, my friend, are a true gentleman, unlike some others. I cast a glare over my shoulder to where the Viking was standing, legs braced, arms crossed. Taking another dive into my drink, I tucked the 20 into the tip jar. Thank you for being nice to me on the worst day of my life. Thought that day was yesterday, the scowling behemoth butted in. My sigh was weary as I slowly turned to face him. That was before I met you. So I can officially say that as bad as yesterday was, today beat it out by a slim margin. Once again, I turned back to Justice. I'm sorry this jerk scared away all your customers, but I'll be back for another one of these real soon. Looking forward to it, Naomi, he said with a wink. I turned to leave and smacked right into a mile of grumpy man chest. Naomi, he said, go away. It felt almost good to be rude for once in my life, to take a stand. Your name's Naomi, the Viking stated. I was too busy trying to incinerate him with a glare of righteous anger to respond. Not Tina, he pressed. They're twins, man, Justice said, the smile evident in his voice. Fuck me. The Viking shoved a hand through his hair. I worry about your friend's vision, I said to Justice, pointing at the mugshot of Tina. Tina had gone bleach blonde at some point in the past decade plus, making our otherwise subtle differences even more obvious. I left my contacts at home, he said. Next to your manners, I quipped. The caffeine was hitting my bloodstream, making me unusually feisty. He didn't respond with anything other than a heated glare. I sighed. Get out of my way, Leif Erikson. The name is Knox, and why are you here? What the hell kind of name was that? 
Was it a hard knocks life? Did he tell a lot of knocks knocks jokes? Was it short for something? Knocks well? Knocks a thin? <laughs> That's none of your business, Knox. Nothing I do or don't do is your business. In fact, my existence is none of your business. Now kindly get out of my way. I felt like screaming as loud as I could for as long as I could. But I'd tried that a couple of times in the car on the long drive here, and it hadn't helped. Thankfully, the beautiful oaf heaved an annoyed sigh and did the decent, life-preserving thing by getting out of my way. I swept out of the cafe and into the summer swelter with as much dignity as I could muster. If Tina wanted to meet up with me, she could find me at the motel. I didn't need to wait around and be accosted by strangers with the personalities of cacti. I'd head back to my dingy room, take every last pin out of my hair, and shower until the hot water ran out. Then I'd figure out what to do next. It was a solid plan. It was only missing one thing. My car. Oh no, my car and my purse. The bike rack in front of the coffee shop was still there. The laundromat with its bright posters in the window was still across the street next to the mechanic's garage. But my car was not where I'd left it. The parking spot I'd squeezed into in front of the pet shop was empty. I looked up and down the block, but there was no sign of my trusty, dusty Volvo. You lost? I closed my eyes and clenched my jaw. Go away. Now what's your problem? I turned around and found Knox watching me intently, holding a to-go coffee cup. What's my problem? I repeated. I wanted to kick him in the shins and steal his coffee. Nothing wrong with my hearing, sweetheart. No need to yell. My problem is while I wasted five minutes of my life getting to know you, my car was towed. You sure? No. I never have any idea where I park my car. I just leave them everywhere and buy new ones when I can't find them. He shot me a look. I rolled my eyes. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic. I reached for my phone only to remember I no longer had a phone. Who pissed in your Cheerios? Whoever taught you to express concern for a person did it wrong. Without another word, I stalked off in what I hoped was the direction of the local police station. I didn't make it to the next storefront before a big, hard hand locked around my upper arm. It was the sleep deprivation, the emotional rawness, I told myself. Those were the only reasons I felt the jittery zing of awareness at his grip. Stop, he ordered, sounding surly. Hands off! I flailed my arm awkwardly, but his grip only tightened. Then stop walking away from me. I paused my evasive flailing. I'll stop walking away if you stop being an asshole. His nostrils flared as he stared up at the sky, and I thought I heard him counting. Are you seriously counting to ten? I was the one who was wronged. I was the one with a reason to pray to the heavens for patience. He got all the way to ten, and still looked annoyed. If I stop being an asshole, will you stay and talk for a minute? I took another sip of coffee and thought about it. Maybe. I'm letting go, he warned. Great, I prompted. We both looked down at his hand on my arm. Slowly, he loosened his grip and released me, but not before his fingertips trailed over the sensitive skin inside my arm. Goosebumps broke out, and I hoped he wouldn't notice, especially because, in my body, goosebumps and pointy nipple reactions were closely related. You cold? His gaze was most definitely not on my arm or shoulders, but my chest. Damn it. Yes. I lied. It's 84 degrees and you're drinking hot coffee. If you're finished mansplaining internal temperature, I'd like to go find my car, I said, crossing my free arm over my traitorous boobs. 
Perhaps you could point me in the direction of the nearest impound lot or police station? He stared at me for a long beat, then shook his head. Come on, then. Excuse me? I'll give you a ride. Ha! I choked out a laugh. He was delusional if he thought I'd willingly get in a car with him. I was still shaking my head when he spoke again. Let's go, Daisy. I don't have all day. Two. A Reluctant Hero. Knox. The woman was staring at me like I'd just suggested she French kiss a rattlesnake. My day wasn't even supposed to be started yet, and it had already gone to shit. I blamed her and her asshole sister, Tina. I also threw some blame in Agatha's direction, too, for good measure, since she'd been the one to text me that Tina had just walked her troublemaking ass into the cafe. Now here I was, at what counted as the ass crack of Dawn, playing town bouncer like an idiot, and fighting with a woman I'd never met. Naomi blinked at me like she was coming out of a fog. You're kidding me, right? Agatha needed to get her fucking eyes checked if she mistook the pissed-off brunette for her bleach-blonde, baked, tan, tattooed, pain-in-the-ass sister. The differences between them were pretty fucking obvious, even without my contacts. Tina's face was the color and texture of an old-ass leather couch. She had a hard mouth bracketed by deep frown lines from smoking two packs a day and feeling like the world owed her something. Naomi, on the other hand, was cut from a different cloth, a classier one. She was tall like her sister, but instead of the crispy, fried look, she went in the Disney princess direction with thick hair the color of roasted chestnuts. It and the flowers in it were trying to escape some kind of elaborate updo. Her face was softer, skin paler, full pink lips, eyes that made me think of forest floors and open fields. Where Tina dressed like a biker babe who'd gone through a wood chipper, Naomi wore high-end athletic shorts and a matching tank over a toned body that promised more than a handful of nice surprises. She looked like the kind of woman who'd take one look at me and hightail it to the safety of the first golf shirt wearing board member she could find. Lucky for her, I didn't do drama or high maintenance. I didn't do doe-eyed princesses in need of saving. I didn't waste my time with women who required more than a good time and a handful of orgasms. But since I'd already stuck my nose into the situation, called her trash, and yelled at her, the least I could do was bring the situation to a fast conclusion. Then I was heading back to bed. No, I'm not fucking kidding you, I stated. I'm not going anywhere with you. You don't have a car. I pointed out. Thank you, Captain Obvious. I am aware I don't have a car. Let me get this straight. You're a stranger in a new town, your car disappears, and you're turning down the offer of a ride because... Because you stormed into a cafe and screamed at me. Then you chased me down and you're still yelling. I get in a car with you and I'm more likely to get chopped into pieces and scattered about in a desert than end up at my destination. No deserts here. Some mountains, though. Her expression suggested she didn't find me helpful or amusing. I exhaled through my teeth. Look, I'm tired. I got an alert that Tina was causing trouble at the cafe again, and that's what I thought I was walking into. She took a long hit of coffee while looking up and down the street like she was debating escape. Don't even think about it, I told her you'd spill your coffee. When those pretty hazel eyes went wide, I knew I'd hit the mark. Fine, but only because this is the best latte I've had in my entire life. And is that your idea of an apology? Because just like the way you ask people if something's wrong, it sucks. It was an explanation, take it or leave it. I didn't waste time doing things that didn't matter like making small talk or apologizing. A bike roared up the street with Rob Zombie blaring from the speakers, despite the fact that it was barely 7 a.m. The guy eyed us and revved his engine. 
Wraith was knocking on 70 years old, but he still managed to nail an astronomical amount of tail with the whole tattooed silver fox thing he had going on. Intrigued, Naomi watched him with her mouth open. Today was not the day Little Miss Daisies in her hair would take a walk on the wild side. I gave Wraith the fuck off nod, snatched Naomi's precious coffee out of her hand, and headed down the sidewalk. Hey! She gave chase like I'd known she would. I could have taken her by the hand, but I wasn't exactly a fan of the reaction I'd had when I touched her. It felt complicated. Should have stayed in fucking bed, I muttered. What is wrong with you? Naomi demanded, jogging to catch up. She reached for her cup, but I held it just out of reach and kept walking. If you don't want to end up hogtied over the back of Wraith's bike, then I suggest you get in my truck. The disheveled flower child muttered some uncomplimentary sounding things about my personality and anatomy. Look. If you can stop being a pain in my ass for five whole minutes, I'll take you to the station. You can get your damn car, and then you can get out of my life. Has anyone ever told you you have the personality of a pissed-off porcupine? I ignored her and kept walking. How do I know you aren't going to try to hogtie me yourself? She demanded. I came to a stop and gave her a lazy once-over. Baby, you're not my type. She rolled her eyes so hard it was a miracle they didn't pop out and fall to the sidewalk. Excuse me while I go cry myself a river. I stepped off the curb and opened the passenger door of my pickup. Get in. Your chivalry sucks, she complained. Chivalry? It means, Jesus, I know what it means. And I knew what it meant that she'd use it in conversation. She had fucking flowers in her hair. The woman was a romantic, another strike against her in my book. Romantics were the hardest women to shake loose. The sticky ones, the ones who pretended they could handle the whole no-strings deal. Meanwhile, they plotted to become the one, trying to con men into meeting their parents and secretly looking at wedding dresses. When she didn't get in by herself, I reached past her and put her coffee into the cup holder. I am really not happy with you right now, she said. The space between our bodies was charged with the kind of energy I usually felt just before a good bar fight. Dangerous. Adrenalizing. I didn't much care for it. Get in the damn truck. Considering it a small miracle when she actually obeyed, I slammed the door on her scowl. Everything all right there, Knox? Bud Nickleby called from the doorway of his hardware store. He was dressed in his usual uniform of bib overalls and a Led Zeppelin t-shirt. The ponytail he'd had for 30 years hung down his back, thin and gray, making him look like a heavier, less funny George Carlin. All good, I assured him. His gaze skated toward Naomi through the windshield. Call me if you need help with the body. I climbed in behind the wheel and fired up the engine. A witness saw me get in this truck, so I'd think long and hard about murdering me at this point, she said, pointing to Bud, who was still watching us. Obviously, she hadn't heard his comment. I'm not murdering you, I snapped. Yet. She was already buckled in, her long legs crossed. A flip-flop dangled from her toes as she jiggled her foot. Both her knees were bruised, and I noticed a raw scrape on her right forearm. I told myself I didn't want to know and threw the truck into reverse. I'd dump her at the station. Hopefully it was early enough to avoid who I wanted to avoid and make sure she got her damn car. If I was lucky, I could still grab another hour of shut-eye before I had to officially start my day. You know, she began, if one of us should be mad at the other, it's me. I don't even know you, and here you are yelling in my face, getting between me and my coffee, and then practically abducting me. You have no reason to be upset. You have no idea, sweetheart. I've got plenty of reasons to be pissed, and a lot of them involve your waste of space sister. Tina may not be the nicest of people, but that doesn't give you the right to be such an ass. She's still family, Naomi sniffed. 
I wouldn't apply the label people to your sister. Tina was a monster of the first degree. She stole, she lied, she picked fights, drank too much, showered too little, and had no regard for anyone else, all because she thought the world owed her. Listen, whoever the hell you are, the only people who can talk about her like that are me, our parents, and the Anderson Town High graduating class of 2003, and maybe also the Anderson Town Fire Department, but that's because they earned the right. You haven't, and I don't need you taking your problems with my sister out on me. Whatever, I said through gritted teeth. We drove the rest of the way in silence. The knock -em out Police Department sat back a few blocks from Main Street and shared a new building with the town's public library. Just seeing it made the muscle under my eye twitch. In the parking lot was a pickup truck, a cruiser, and a Harley fat boy. There was no sign of the chief's SUV. Thank Christ for small miracles. Come on, let's get this over with. There's no need for you to come in, Naomi sniffed. She was eyeing her empty coffee with puppy dog eyes. On a growl, I shoved my own mostly untouched coffee at her. I'm getting you to the desk, making sure they've got your car, and then never seeing you again. Fine, but I'm not saying thank you. I didn't bother replying because I was too busy storming toward the front door and ignoring the big gold letters above it. The Knox Morgan Municipal Building. I pretended I didn't hear her and let the glass door swing closed behind me. Is there more than one Knox in this town? she asked, wrenching the door open and following me inside. No, I said, hoping that would put an end to questions I didn't want to fucking answer. The building was relatively new, with a shit ton of glass, wide hallways, and that fresh paint smell. So it's your name on the building? she pressed, jogging again to keep up with me. Guess so. I yanked open another door on the right and gestured for her to go inside. Knock em Out's cop shop looked more like one of those co-working hangouts that urban hipsters liked than an actual police station. It had annoyed the boys and girls in blue who had taken pride in their moldy, crumbling bunker with its flickering fluorescent lights and carpet stained from decades of criminals. Their annoyance at the bright paint and slick new office furniture was the only thing I didn't hate about it. The knock -em out PD did their best to rediscover their roots, piling precious towers of case folders on top of adjustable height bamboo desks and brewing too cheap, too strong coffee 24-7. There was a box of stale donuts open on the counter and powdered sugar fingerprints everywhere. But so far, nothing had taken the shine off the newness of the fucking Knox Morgan building. Sergeant Grave Hopper was behind his desk stirring half a pound of sugar into his coffee. A reformed motorcycle club member, he now spent his weeknights coaching his daughter's softball team and his weekends mowing lawns. His and his mother-in-law's. But once a year, he'd pack up his wife on the back of his bike and off they'd go to relive their glory days on the open road. He spotted me and my guest and nearly upended the entire mug all over himself. What's going on, Knox? Grave asked now openly staring at Naomi. It was no secret around town that I had as little to do with the PD as possible. It also wasn't exactly news that Tina was the kind of trouble that I didn't tolerate. This is Naomi, Tina's twin, I explained. She just got into town and says her car was towed. You got it out back? Knock em out PD usually had more important things to worry about than parking and let its citizens park wherever the hell they wanted, when they wanted, as long as it wasn't directly on the sidewalk. I'ma come back to that whole twin sister thing, Grave warned, pointing his coffee stirrer at us. But first, it's just me in so far today and I ain't towed shit. Fuck. I shoved a hand through my hair. If you didn't, do you have any idea who else would have? Naomi asked, hopefully. Sure, I swoop in to save the day and drive her down here, but Grizzled Grave was the one who got the smile and sweet words. Grave, the bastard, was hanging on her every word, smiling at her like she was a seven-layer chocolate cake. 
Well, now, Taint, I mean, Naomi, Grave began. Way I see it, there's two things that could have happened. A, you forgot where you parked. But a guy like you in a town this small, that don't seem likely. No, it doesn't, she agreed amicably without calling him Captain Obvious. Or B, someone stole your car. I kissed my hour of sleep goodbye. I parked right in front of the pet shop because it was close to the cafe where I was supposed to meet my sister. Graves slid me a look and I nodded. Best to just get this part over with, like ripping off a damn bandage. So Tina knew you were coming into town, knew where you'd be? He clarified. Naomi wasn't picking up what he was putting down. She nodded, all wide-eyed and hopeful. Yes, she called me last night. Said she was in some kind of trouble and needed me to meet her at Cafe Rev at 7 this morning. Well, now, sweetheart, Grave hemmed. I don't want to cast aspersions, of course, but is it possible your asshole sister stole your car? I interjected. Naomi's hazel eyes sliced to me. She didn't look sweet or hopeful now. No, she looked like she wanted to commit a misdemeanor, maybe even a felony. I'm afraid Knox here is right, Grave said. Your sister's been causing trouble since she got into town a year ago. This probably ain't the first car she's helped herself to. Naomi's nostrils flared delicately. She brought my coffee to her mouth, drank it down in a few determined gulps, then tossed the empty cup into the wastebasket by the desk. Thank you for your help. If you see a blue Volvo with a Nice Matters bumper sticker, please let me know. Christ. Don't suppose you've got one of those apps on your phone that'll tell you where your car is, do you? Grave asked. She reached for her pocket, then stopped and squeezed her eyes shut for a beat. I did. But you don't no more? I don't have a phone. Mine uh, broke last night. That's all right. I can put a call out so officers will be on the lookout if you give me the license plate, Grave said helpfully shoving a piece of paper and pen in her direction. She took them and started to write in neat, swoopy cursive. You could leave your contact info too, where you're staying and such, so me or Nash can update you. The name set my teeth on edge. Happy to, Naomi said, sounding anything but. Uh, you got maybe a husband or boyfriend whose contact info you can add? I glared at him. Naomi shook her head. No. Maybe a girlfriend or wife? He tried again. I'm single, she said, sounding just unsure enough that my curiosity peaked. Imagine that. So's our chief, Grave said, as innocent as a six-foot-tall biker with a rap sheet could sound. Can we get back to the part where you tell Naomi you'll be in touch if you find her car, which we all know you won't? I snapped. Well, not with that attitude we won't, she chided. This was the last fucking time I was riding to the rescue of anyone. It wasn't my job, wasn't my responsibility, and now it was costing me sleep. How long are you in town? He asked as Naomi scrawled her information on the paper. Only as long as it takes to find and murder my sister, she said, capping the pen and sliding the paper back. Thank you so much for your help, Sergeant. My pleasure. She turned to look up at me. Our gazes held for a beat. Knox. Naomi. With that, she swept right on out of the station. How can two sisters look that much alike and have nothing else in common? Grave wondered. I don't want to know, I said honestly, and headed outside after her. I found her pacing and muttering to herself in front of the wheelchair ramp. What's your plan? I asked in resignation. She looked at me and her lips puckered. Plan? She repeated, her voice cracking. My fight or flight instincts kicked in. I fucking hated tears, especially tears of the female persuasion. A crying woman made me feel like I was being ripped two shreds from the inside out, a weapon I'd never make public knowledge. Do not cry, I ordered. Her eyes were damp. Cry? 
I'm not going to cry. She was a shit liar. Don't fucking cry. It's just a car, and she's just a piece of shit. Neither's worth crying over. She blinked rapidly, and I couldn't tell if she was going to cry or yell at me again. But she surprised me by doing neither. She straightened her shoulders and nodded. You're right. It's just a car. I can get replacement credit cards, a new purse, and another stash of honey mustard dipping sauces. Tell me where you need to go and I'll drop you. You can get a rental and be on your way. I jerked my thumb toward my truck. She looked up and down the street again, probably hoping for some suit and tie wearing hero to appear. When none did, she sighed. I got a room at the motel. There was only one motel in town. A single story, one star shithole that didn't warrant an official name. I was impressed she'd actually checked in. We walked back to my truck in silence. Her shoulder brushed my arm, making my skin feel like it was heating up. I opened her door again for her, not because I was a gentleman, but because some perverse part of me liked being close. I waited until she'd belted in before shutting the door and rounding the truck. Honey mustard dipping sauces? She glanced at me as I slid in behind the wheel. You hear about that guy who drove through a guardrail in the winter a few years back? It sounded vaguely familiar. He ate nothing but ketchup packets for three days. You plan on driving through a guardrail? No, but I like to be prepared, and I don't like ketchup. Three, a pint-sized criminal, Naomi. What room are you in? Knox asked. I realized we were already back at the motel. Why? I asked with suspicion. He exhaled slowly as if I were on his last nerve. So I can drop you at your door. Oh. Nine. You leave your door open? He asked a second later, his mouth tight. Yeah, that's the way it's done on Long Island, I deadpanned. It's how we show our neighbors we trust them. He gave me another one of those long, frowny looks. No, of course I didn't leave it open. I closed and locked it. He pointed toward number nine. My door was ajar. Oh. He put the truck in park where it sat in the middle of the lot with more force than necessary. Stay here. I blinked as he climbed out and stalked toward my room. My weary eyes were drawn to the view of those worn jeans clinging to a spectacular butt as he stalked toward my door. Hypnotized for a few of his long strides, it took me a hot minute to remember exactly what I'd left in that room and how very much I didn't want Knox, of all people, to see it. Wait! I jumped out of the truck and ran after him, but he didn't stop, didn't even slow down. I turned on the speed in a last-ditch effort and jumped in front of him. He walked right into the hand I held up. Get your ass out of my way, Naomi, he ordered. When I didn't comply, he brought a hand to my stomach and walked me backward until I was standing in front of room 8. I didn't know what it said about me that I really liked his hand there. You don't have to go in there, I insisted. I'm sure it's just housekeeping. This place looked like it has housekeeping? He had a point. The motel looked like it should give out tetanus shots instead of many bottles of shampoo. Stay he said again, then stalked back to my open door. Shit, I whispered when he shoved it open. I lasted all of two seconds before following him inside. The room had been unappealing, to say the least, when I'd checked in less than an hour ago. The orange and brown wallpaper was peeling in long strips. The carpet was a dark green that felt like it was made out of the scrubby side of a dish sponge, the bathroom fixtures were Pepto-Bismol pink, and the shower was missing several tiles. But it was the only option within 20 miles, and I'd figured I could rough it for a night or two. Besides, I'd thought at the time, how bad could it be? 
apparently pretty freaking bad. Between the time I'd checked in, stowed my suitcase, plugged in my laptop, and left to meet Tina, someone had broken in and ransacked the room. My suitcase was upended on the floor, some of its contents strewn all over the carpet. The dresser drawers were pulled out, closet doors left open. My laptop was missing. So was the zippered pouch of cash I'd hidden in my suitcase. Sucker was scrawled across the bathroom vanity mirror in my favorite lipstick. Ironically, the thing I didn't want my grumpy Viking to see, the thing that was worth more than whatever else had been stolen, was still there in a crumpled heap in the corner. Worst of all, the perpetrator was sitting on the bed, dirty sneakers tangled in a clump of sheets. She was watching a natural disaster movie. I wasn't good at guessing ages, but I put her solidly in the child preteen category. Hey, Way, Knox said grimly. The girl's blue eyes flitted away from the screen to land on him before returning to the TV. Hey, Knox. It was a small town. Of course, the town grump and the child felon knew each other. Okay, look, I said, sidestepping Knox to stand in front of the thing in the corner that I really didn't want to explain. I don't know if child labor laws are different in Virginia, but I asked for an extra pillow not to be robbed by a pint-sized criminal. The girl spared me a glance. Where's your mom? Knox asked, ignoring me. Another shrug. Gone, she said. Who's your friend? That'd be your Aunt Naomi. She didn't look impressed. I, on the other hand, probably looked like I'd just been shot out of a cannon toward a brick wall. Aunt? I repeated, shaking my head in hopes that it would fix my hearing. Another wilted flower petal fell out of what was left of my updo and flitted to the floor. Thought you were dead, the girl said, studying me with vague interest. Nice hair. Aunt? I said again. Knox turned to me. Waylay is Tina's kid, Knox explained slowly. Tina? I parroted on a croak. Looks like your sister helped herself to your stuff, he observed. Said most of it was shit, the girl said. I blinked rapidly. Not only had my sister stolen my car, she'd also broken into my hotel room, ransacked it, and left behind the niece I didn't know existed. She okay? Waylay asked, not taking her eyes off the tornado that returned to the screen. She was probably me, and I was most definitely not okay. I grabbed a pillow off the bed. Will you two please excuse me? I squeaked. Without waiting for an answer, I hauled ass out the door into the hot Virginia sunshine. Birds were chirping. Two motorcycles drove by, their engines a deafening roar. Across the street, an older couple climbed out of a pickup truck and headed into the diner for breakfast. How could things have the audacity to look so normal when my entire life had just imploded? I held the pillow to my face and let loose the scream that had been building. Thoughts flew through my brain like a turbocharged spin cycle. Werner was right. People didn't change. My sister was still a terrible human being, and I was still naive enough to fall for her lies. My car was gone, along with my purse and my laptop, not to mention the money I'd brought for Tina. As of last night, I had no job. I wasn't on my way to Paris, which had been the plan a mere 24 hours ago. My family and friends thought I'd lost my damn mind. My favorite lipstick had been ruined on a bathroom mirror. And I had a niece whose entire childhood I'd missed out on. I sucked in another breath and let out one final scream for good measure before lowering the pillow. Okay, you can figure this out. You can fix this. About done with your pep talk? I whirled around and found Knox leaning against the doorframe, tattooed arms crossed over his broad chest. Yep, I said, squaring my shoulders. How old is she? Eleven. Nodding, I shoved the pillow at him and marched back into the room. So, Waylay, I began. 
there was a family resemblance in the upturned nose, the dimple in the chin. She had the same cult-like legs her mother and I had at that age. So, Aunt Naomi, did your mom say when she'd be back? Nope. Where do you and your mom live, honey? I asked. Maybe Tina was there now, going through her hall, figuring out what was worth keeping and what she wanted to ruin just for the fun of it. Over in Hillside Acres, she answered, looking around me to get a better view of the tornado tossing up cows on the screen. Need a minute, Knox announced and nodded toward the door. I had all the damn time in the world, apparently. All the time and not a single clue what to do. No next step. No to-do list, quantifying and organizing my world into nice, neat line items. Just a crisis on top of a hot mess, on top of a dumpster fire. Sure, I said, sounding only mildly hysterical. He waited until I passed him before stepping out after me. When I stopped, he kept walking toward the faded soda machine outside the front office. You seriously want me to buy you a soda right now? I asked, flummoxed. No, I'm trying to get out of earshot of the kid who doesn't realize she's been abandoned, he snapped. I followed him. Maybe Tina's coming back, I said. He stopped and turned to face me. Way says Tina didn't tell her anything, just that she had something to take care of and she'd be gone a long time. A long time? What the hell was a long time in Tina time? A weekend? A week? A month? Oh my god. My parents. This was going to devastate them. As if what I'd done yesterday wasn't upsetting enough, I'd managed to assure them last night on a highway in Pennsylvania that I was fine and definitely not going through some kind of midlife crisis. And I'd made them promise not to change their plans for me. They'd left for their three-week Mediterranean cruise this morning. The first big international vacation they'd ever taken together. I didn't want my problems or Tina's disaster ruining it. What do you intend to do with that kid in there? Knox nodded toward the open door. What do you mean? Naomi. When the cops find out Tina's gone and left Waylay behind, it's straight into foster care. I shook my head. I'm her closest living relative who wasn't a criminal. I'm responsible for her. Just like all of Tina's other messes until we turned 18. He gave me a long, hard look. Just like that? She's family. Besides, it wasn't like I had a whole lot going on at the moment. I was basically adrift. For the first time in my entire life, I didn't have a plan. And that scared the crap out of me. <laughs> family. He snorted as if my reasoning wasn't sound. Listen, thank you, Knox, for all of the shouting and the rides and the coffee, but as you can see, I've got a situation to handle, so it's probably best for you to go on back to whatever cave you crawled out of this morning. I'm not going anywhere. We were back to glaring at each other, the silence charged. This time he broke first. Quit stalling, Daisy. What are you going to do? Daisy? He reached up and plucked a flower petal out of my hair with two fingers. I batted his hand away and took a step back so I could think. Okay, first I need to definitely not call my parents. And I didn't really want to get the police involved again if I didn't have to. What if Tina showed up in an hour? Maybe the first thing I needed to do was get more coffee. Call the damn cops and report the break-in and the child abandonment. Knox said. She's my sister. Besides, what if she shows up in an hour? She stole your car and abandoned her kid. That doesn't earn a fucking pass. The tattooed, grouchy bear of a man was right. I really didn't like that about him. Ugh. Fine. Okay. Let me think. Can I borrow your phone? He stood there staring at me, unmoving. For Pete's sake, I'm not going to steal it. I just need to make a quick call. On a long-suffering sigh, he reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone. Thank you, I said pointedly, then stomped back into my motel room. 
Wele was still watching her movie, now with her hands stacked behind her head. I dug through my suitcase to find a notebook and went back outside. You keep a notebook of phone numbers with you? Knox was peering over my shoulder. I shushed him and dialed. The hell do you want? My sister's voice always managed to make me cringe inwardly. An explanation for starters, I snapped. Where are you? Where are you? She mimicked me in a high-pitched Muppet voice that I'd always hated. I heard a prolonged exhale. Are you smoking in my car? Looks like it's my car now. You know what? Forget the car. We have bigger things to discuss. You have a daughter. A daughter you abandoned in a motel room. Got shit to do. Can't have a kid holding me back for the next while. Got something big in the works. Why you think I named her Wele? Figured she could hang out with her Aunt Goody Two-Shoes till I get back. I was so mad I could only sputter. Knox snatched the phone from my ear. You listen and you listen good, Tina. You've got exactly 30 minutes to get back here or I'm calling the damn cops. I watched as his face got harder, his jaw tighter, showing off little hollows under his cheekbones. His eyes went so cold I shivered. As always, you're a real fucking idiot, he said. Just remember, next time you get picked up by the cops, you'll have warrants. That means your stupid ass will be sitting behind bars, and I don't see anyone rushing to bail you out. He paused for a moment and then said, Yeah, fuck you too. He swore again and lowered his phone. How exactly do you and my sister know each other? I wondered out loud. Tina's been a pain in everyone's ass since she blew into town a year ago, always looking for an easy buck. Tried a couple of slip and fall schemes on some of the local businesses, including your pal Justice. Every time she gets a little money in her pocket, she's rip-roaring drunk and wreaking havoc all over town. Petty shit. Vandalism. Yeah, that sounded like my sister. What did she say? I asked, not really wanting the answer. Said she doesn't give a shit if we call the cops. She's not coming back. Did she say that? I'd always wanted kids, but not like this. Not jumping in one step shy of puberty when the formative years were already gone. Said she'd be back when she felt like it, he said, thumbing through his phone. Some things never changed. My sister had always made her own rules. As an infant, she'd slept all day and stayed up all night. As a toddler, she was kicked out of three daycares for biting. And once we hit school age, well, it was a whole new ball game of rebellion. What are you doing? I asked Knox as he brought the phone back up to his ear. Last thing I want to, he drawled. Buying tickets to the ballet? I hypothesized. He didn't answer, just strode into the parking lot with rigid shoulders. I couldn't hear exactly what he was saying, but there were a lot of fuck yous and kiss my asses. I added phone etiquette to the growing list of things Knox Morgan was bad at. He returned, looking even angrier. Ignoring me, he produced a wallet and fished out a few bills, then fed them into the soda machine. What do you want? He muttered. Uh, water, please. He punched the buttons harder than I thought necessary, and a bottle of water and two yellow lightnings fell out onto the ground. Here. He shoved the water at me and headed back to the room. Uh, thanks? I called after him. I debated for about 30 seconds whether or not I should just start walking until I found a new reality that was less terrible. But it was just a mental exercise. There was no way I could walk away. I had a new responsibility, and with that responsibility would come some sense of purpose, probably. I returned to my room and found Knox examining the lock on the door. No finesse, he complained. Told her she should have picked it, Waylay said, cracking open her soda. It's barely eight in the morning and you gave her a soda, I hissed at Knox as I resumed my sentry stance in front of the mound in the corner. He looked at me, then beyond me, 
Nervously, I spread my arms and tried to block his view. That's some kind of tablecloth? He asked, peering past me. Wedding dress, Waylay announced. Mom said it was ugly as hell. Yeah, well, Tina wouldn't know good taste if it hit her over the head with a Birkin bag, I said, feeling defensive. Does that dress mean I have an uncle out there somewhere? She asked, nodding at the pile of lace and underskirt that had once made me feel like a fairy princess, but now only made me feel like a fool. No, I said firmly. Knox's eyebrows raised fractionally. You just decided to take a wedding dress on a road trip? I really don't see how this is any of your business, I told him. Hair's done up like she was going someplace fancy, Waylay mused, eyeing me. Sure looks that way, Way, Knox agreed, crossing his arms over his chest and looking amused. I did not like the two of them ganging up against me. Let's worry less about my hair and a dress than what we're going to do next, I suggested. Waylay, did your mom say anything about where she was going? The girl's eyes zeroed back on the screen. Her slim shoulders shrugged. Dunno, just said I was your problem now. I didn't know what to say to that. Thankfully, I didn't have to answer because a brisk knock had all three of us looking at the open door. The man standing in it made me suck in a little breath. Knock him out sure grew them hot. He was dressed in a spotless dark blue uniform with a very shiny badge. There was a nice layer of stubble accentuating a strong jaw. His shoulders and chest were broad, hips and waist tapered. His hair was close to blonde. There was something familiar about his eyes. Knox, he said. Nash. His tone was as cold as his eyes. Hey, Way, the newcomer said. Waylay gave the man a head nod. Chief. His eyes came to me. You called the police? I squeaked at Knox. My sister was a terrible person, and I was definitely going to let her know that. But calling the police felt so final. Four. You're not staying here. Naomi. You must be Naomi, the cop said. I might have been mid-panic attack, but I kind of liked the way he said my name in a friendly drawl. Knox apparently did not like it because he was suddenly placing his muscled bulk directly in front of me, feet planted wide, arms crossed. I am, I said, peering around Knox. The oaf didn't budge when I nudged him in the back. The man looked back to Knox, and whatever he saw there had him grinning. I'm chief of police around here, but you can call me Nash. It's real nice to meet you, Naomi. Sorry it's under these circumstances. Mind if I ask you a few questions? Um, okay, I said, suddenly wishing I would have taken a moment to wash my face and fix my hair. I probably looked like a deranged zombie bridesmaid. Why don't we have ourselves a chat out in the parking lot? Nash said with a jerk of his head. Waylay's attention was back on the movie as she sipped lime green sugar. Sure. I followed him out and was surprised when Knox joined us. He headed right over to Nash's SUV, which read Knock 'em Out Police down the side, and leaned belligerently against the hood. You're not necessary for this part, Nash told him. Knox bared his teeth. You want me to leave? Gonna have to make me. I'm sorry, he's been like this all morning, I explained to Nash. Honey, he's been like this his entire life, the chief countered. It didn't hit me until they turned identical glares on each other. You're brothers, aren't you? No shit, Knox grumbled. Sure are, Nash said, turning his full wattage grin on me. I'm the good one. Just do your fucking job, Knox said. Oh, now you want me to do my job. You can see how I'd be confused since... Gentlemen, I cut in. This was going nowhere fast. I didn't have the energy to diffuse the tension between the brothers, and we had more important concerns. I don't mean to overstep, but can we get to the part about my sister? 
I suggested. I think that's a fine idea, Naomi, Nash said, winking as he pulled out a notebook. Knox growled. Let's get your statement, and then we'll figure out what needs to happen next. A man with a plan and a smile. He was certainly more pleasant than his brother. You're saying I can just take possession of a human being? I clarified a few minutes later. I really needed more coffee. My cognitive abilities were fading fast. Well, I wouldn't advise on referring to it as taking possession, but in Virginia, kinship care is a way for kids to stay with a family member as guardian when they can't be with their own parents. I might have been imagining it, but I thought I saw a guarded look pass between the brothers. So I would become Waylay's guardian? Things were moving so fast. One second, I was getting ready to walk down the aisle. The next, I was suddenly in charge of deciding the future of an 11-year-old stranger. Nash swept a hand through his thick hair. Temporarily. You're obviously a stable, healthy adult. What happens if I don't? I hedged. Juvenile and domestic relations will place Waylay in a foster home. If you've got no problem staying in town for a few weeks while we figure things out, the law's got no issue with Waylay staying with you. If things work out, you can even make it permanent. Okay. I nervously wiped my hands on the back of my shorts. What things are we going to be figuring out? I asked. Mainly what your sister is up to and what that means for guardianship. I'm in big trouble. I need money, Naomi. I bit my lip. She called me last night, said she needed help and wanted me to bring cash. Do you think she's in actual danger? How about this? You focus on Waylay and let me worry about your sister, Nash advised. I appreciated the theory, but in my experience, the only way to make sure a mess was clean to my satisfaction was to do the cleaning myself. Did you bring cash? Knox asked, his eyes on me. I looked down at my feet, feeling stupid and embarrassed. I knew better. I did. She get it? I focused on Nash's face since it was friendlier. I thought I was being smart. I had half of it in the car and left the other half in my suitcase. Nash looked sympathetic. Knox, on the other hand, grumbled something under his breath. Well, I guess I'd better get back in there and introduce myself properly to my niece, I said. Please keep me posted. You're not staying here. This proclamation came from Knox. I threw my hands up. If my presence bothers you that much, why don't you take an extended vacation? If looks could boil blood, mine would have turned to magma. You're not staying here he repeated. This time he pointed to the flimsy door with the busted lock. Oh, that. I'm sure I can come up with a solution, I said brightly. Chief, call me Nash, he insisted again. Knox looked like he wanted to shove his brother's head through the already damaged door. Nash, I said, turning up the charm. Do you know where Waylay and I could stay for a few nights? Knox pulled out his phone and glowered at the screen as his thumbs moved aggressively over it. I could give you two a ride to Tina's place. It's not exactly homey, but she's a lot less likely to break in and bust up her own stuff, he offered. Knox stowed his phone in his pocket. His gaze fastened on me, and there was something smug about his expression that made me irrationally irritated. That is so nice of you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your help, I told Nash. I'm sure Knox has much better things to do than spend any more time in my vicinity. My pleasure, Nash insisted. I'll just pack up what's left of my things and tell Waylay where we're going, I decided and started back to the room. My relief at finally being free of the bad-tempered, tattooed Knox was interrupted by a thunderous rumble. 
A motorcycle with a man the size of a bear prior to hibernation rocketed down the street at a speed that was definitely not the legal speed limit. God damn that Harvey, Nash muttered. Guess you better go get him, Knox said, still looking smug. Nash jabbed a finger in his brother's direction. You and me are going to talk later, he promised, looking none too happy. Better hurry and uphold that law, Knox said. Nash turned back to me. Naomi, sorry to leave you in a lurch. I'll be in touch. Knox wiggled his fingers antagonistically as his brother hustled back to his SUV and took up pursuit with lights flashing. Once again, I was left alone with Knox. You didn't have something to do with my nice, polite ride disappearing, did you? Now why would I do that? Well, it sure as hell isn't to spend more quality time with me. Come on, Daisy, he said. Let's pack your shit. I'll take you and Wade to Tina's. I'd prefer if you kept your hands off my shit, I said haughtily. The effect was ruined by my unladylike yawn. I was running on fumes and only hoped I could hold on long enough to get away from the Viking before I crashed. Five. A vat of lighter fluid and a nap. Naomi. Hillside Acres looked more like a festive campground than a trailer park. Kids played on a small, well-kept playground on a patch of grass that hadn't quite submitted to the long Virginia summer. The mobile homes had picket fences and vegetable gardens. Creative color schemes and cozy patios added to the curb appeal. And then there was Tina's place. It was a single-wide trailer in the back corner of the park. The beige box sloped hard to the right, looking like it was missing part of its foundation on that end. Weeds that had fought their way through the gravel hit me at the knee. The trailer across the road had a cute screened-in porch with string lights and hanging plants. Tina's had makeshift cinder block steps leading to a rusty front door that hung slightly ajar. Knox was glaring again, but for once it wasn't at me. It was at the notice posted on the door. Eviction. Stay here, he ordered without looking at me or Waylay. I was too tired to be annoyed as he macho man stepped inside. Waylay rolled her eyes. She's long gone. She busted in here before the motel. On reflex, I reached for her and put my hands on her shoulders. She jumped back, looking at me like I'd just tried to give her a wedgie. Note to self, don't rush the physical affection. Uh, where have you two been staying? Waylay shrugged. I stayed at my friend's house the last two nights. Her parents don't mind an extra kid for dinner. Don't know where she stayed. The only time responsible could be applied to Tina was when she was impersonating me over the years. Even still, I found myself horrified at my sister's approach to parenting. It's clear, Knox called from inside. Told ya. Waylay bounded up the steps and I followed. The trailer was worse on the inside than it was outside. The carpet had worn through in front of the door, leaving long, gnarled strings that stretched out in all directions. A recliner faced a cheap wooden console with the dusty outline of a TV stand. A small pink beanbag sat directly in front of it. She took the TV, but I grabbed the remote while she wasn't looking, Waylay said proudly. Nice job, kid, Knox said, giving her hair a ruffle. Swallowing hard, I left them in the living room and poked my head into the dingy kitchen. The contents of the cabinets had been emptied into an overflowing garbage can in the middle of the green linoleum. Boxes of cereal, cans of soup, long since defrosted pizza snacks. There wasn't a vegetable in sight. There was a bedroom on each end. The one with the double bed had an ashtray on either side. 
Instead of curtains, thin bed sheets were tacked directly to the wall to block out the sun. The closet and dresser were mostly empty. Everything had either ended up on the floor or been hauled out the door. On instinct, I peeked under the bed and found two empty bourbon bottles. Some things never changed. She's coming back, you know, Waylay said, poking her head inside. I know, I agreed. What the girl didn't know was that sometimes it was years between visits. My room's on the other end if you want to see it, she said. I'd like that if you don't mind. I closed the door on Tina's depressing bedroom and followed my niece through the living room. Exhaustion and overwhelm made my eyeballs feel hot and dry. Where's Knox? I asked. Talking to Mr. Gibbons outside. He's the landlord. Mom owes a shit ton of back rent, she said, leading the way to the flimsy fake wood door off the living room. A hand-lettered sign said keep out in glitter and four shades of pink marker. I decided to save the lecture on swearing for later when I wasn't mostly asleep on my feet. Waylay's room was small but tidy. There was a twin bed under a pretty pink quilt. A sagging bookshelf held a few books but was mostly dedicated to hair accessories organized in colorful bins. Was it possible Waylay Wit was a girly girl? She flopped down on her bed. So, what are we doing? Well, I said brightly, I like your room. As for the rest of the place, I think we can make it work. A little scrubbing, some organization, a vat of lighter fluid, and a box of matches. Knox prowled into the room like a pissed-off lion at the zoo. He took up too much space and most of the oxygen. Get your shit, Way. Uh, all of it? She asked. His nod was brisk. All of it. Naomi. He turned and marched out of the room. I could feel the trailer shudder under his feet. Think that means you're supposed to follow him, Waylay said. Right, okay, just hang tight, I'll be back in a second. I found him outside, hands on hips and staring at the gravel. Is there a problem? You two aren't fucking staying here. Suddenly too tired to function, I collapsed against the trailer's aluminum siding. Look, Knox, my bones are tired. I've been up for a million hours straight. I'm in a strange place, in a stranger situation, and there's a little girl in there who needs someone. Unfortunately for her, that someone is me. You made up for the asshole routine with the chauffeur routine. You can just stop with the macho, inconvenienced thing. I didn't ask you for help, so you're free to go. I need to start cleaning this mess up. Literally and figuratively. About done? He asked. I was too tired to be infuriated. Yeah, about. Good. Then get your ass in the truck. You're not staying here. Are you serious right now? You two aren't staying in a motel with cardboard doors or a health violation of a trailer that's been broken into. Besides... He paused his tirade to rip the eviction notice off the door. This place ain't Tina's anymore. Legally, you can't crash here. Morally, I can't let you try. Got it? It was the longest speech he'd made in my presence, and I honestly didn't have the energy for a reply but he wasn't looking for one. So you're going to get your ass in the truck. And then what, Knox? I pushed away from the trailer and threw my hands up. What's next? Do you know? Because I haven't got a clue, and that scares the hell out of me. I know a place you can stay. Safer than the motel. Cleaner than this fucking mess. Knox, I've got no wallet, no checkbook, no phone or laptop. As of yesterday, I've got no job to go back to. How am I supposed to pay for... I couldn't even finish the sentence. Exhaustion and despair overwhelmed me. He swore and shoved a hand through his hair. You're asleep on your feet. So, I said sullenly. 
He stared at me hard for a long beat. Daisy, just get in the truck. I need to help Wele pack, I argued. And I need to go through the trash in there in case there's any important paperwork. Insurance, birth certificate, school records. He stepped forward and I moved back. He kept advancing on me until my back met his pickup. He opened the passenger door. Gibbons will let you know if he finds anything important. But shouldn't I talk to him? Already did. This ain't his first rodeo and he's not a bad guy. He keeps important shit tenants leave behind and knows what to keep a lookout for. He'll call me if he finds something. Now, get in the truck. I climbed up on the seat and tried to think of other things that I needed to do. Way, Knox barked. Jeez, keep your pants on. Waylay appeared in the doorway wearing a backpack and holding two garbage bags. My heart shivered. Her life, all her treasured possessions, fit into two trash bags. And not even the good kind with drawstrings. Knox took the bags from her and put them in the bed of his pickup. Let's go. It was a quiet ride, and apparently if I wasn't making conversation or fighting with Knox, I didn't have the energy to remain conscious. I woke abruptly when the truck jostled. We were on a dirt road that snaked its way through woods. The trees created a canopy above us. I had no idea if I'd just dozed off or if we'd been driving for an hour. Remembering my predicament, I whipped around and relaxed when I saw Wele in the back seat, sitting next to the white, fluffy mound that was my wedding dress. Turning back to Knox, I yawned. <sighs> Great. You're taking us out to the middle of nowhere to murder us, aren't you? Wele snickered behind me. Knox stayed stubbornly silent as we bumped along the dirt drive. Whoa! Waylay's exclamation had me focusing on the view through the windshield. A wide creek meandered alongside the road before curling back into the woods. Just ahead, the trees thinned and I spotted the whoa. It was a large log home with a wide front porch that wrapped around one side of the first floor. Knox continued down the drive past the house. Bummer, Waylay muttered under her breath when we drove on. Around the next bend, I spied a small cabin with dark siding tucked into a copse of trees. That's my place, Knox said, and that's yours. Just beyond it was a storybook-looking cottage. Pine trees towered over it, offering shade from the summer sun. Its white, board and batten exterior was charming. The small front porch with cheery blue planks, inviting. I loved it. Knox turned into the short gravel drive and turned off the engine. Let's go, he said, climbing out. I guess we're here, I whispered to Wele. We both exited the truck. It was cooler here than in town. Quieter, too. The rumble of motorcycles in traffic was replaced with the buzz of bees and the far-off drone of an airplane. A dog barked nearby. I could hear the creek as it burbled its way through whispering trees somewhere behind the cottage. The warm breeze carried the scent of flowers and earth and summer sunshine. It was perfect. Too perfect for a runaway bride with no wallet. Uh... Knox? He ignored me and carried Waylay's bags and my suitcase to the front porch. We're staying here? Waylay asked as she pressed her face to the front window to peer inside. It's dusty and probably stale as hell, Knox said as he propped open the screen door and pulled out his keys. Hasn't been used in a while. You'll probably need to open the windows, air it out. Why he had a key to a cottage that looked like it lived on the pages of my favorite fairy tale was on my list of questions. Just above that were questions concerning rent and security deposits. Knox, I tried again. 
but he'd gotten the door open, and suddenly I was standing on the wide wood plank floor of a cozy living room with a tiny stone fireplace. There was an old roll-top desk crammed into an alcove between the stairs to the second floor and the coat closet. Windows brought the outdoors inside. Seriously, we get to stay here? Waylay asked, her skepticism mirroring my own. Knox dropped our bags at the foot of the tiny staircase. Yeah. She stared at him for a beat, then shrugged. Guess I'll go check out the upstairs. Wait, take off your shoes, I told her, not wanting to track any dirt inside. Waylay glanced down at her filthy sneakers. There was a hole in the toe of the left one and a pink heart charm clipped to the laces of the right. With an extravagant eye roll, she towed them off and carried them upstairs. Knox's mouth pulled up in the corner as we watched her go, pretending she wasn't the least bit excited or curious. Damn it, Viking! The idea of spending a few weeks in a postcard-perfect cottage far away from the mess I'd left behind was intoxicating. I could organize the hell out of the shambles of my life while I sat on the back porch and watched the creek flow by. If I could afford it. Now what's your problem? He asked, stepping into the dollhouse-sized kitchen and staring out the window over the sink. You mean, what's wrong, Naomi? Well, I'll tell you, Knox. Now Waylay's excited about this place and I don't even know if I can afford it. She's going to be disappointed on top of abandoned. What if we end up back at the motel tonight? You're not going back to the motel. What's the rent? I asked, biting my lip. He turned away from the view, leaned against the counter, looking annoyed. Dunno. You have a key to this place and you don't know? Rent depends, Knox said, reaching out to sweep a layer of dust off the top of the old marshmallow white fridge. On what? He shook his head. On who? Fine, who? Liza J, your new landlord. My new landlord? And does this Liza J even know that we're here? I wasn't conscious of gravitating toward him until my toes brushed the tips of his boots. Those blue-gray eyes were on me, making me feel like I was under a magnifying glass. If she doesn't, she will soon. She's rough around the edges, but she's got a soft spot, he said, gaze boring into me. I was too tired to do anything but glare back at him. I picked our rooms, Waylay shouted from upstairs, breaking our staring contest. We good? he asked quietly. No, we're not good. I don't even know where we are or how to get back to town. Do you have Uber here? Are there bears? His lips quirked, and I felt my face flush. He was studying me in a way that people didn't do in polite company. Dinner, he said. Huh? was my erudite reply. I knew he wasn't trying to ask me out. Not after we'd spent an entire morning hating each other. Seven. At the big house down the road. That's Liza J's. She'll want to meet you. If she doesn't know she's my landlord, she's certainly not expecting us for dinner, I pointed out. Dinner. Seven. She'll be expecting you by then. I was not comfortable with this kind of invitation. What am I supposed to bring? Where's the closest store? Does she like wine? Hostess gifts were not just respectful. In this case, they would set the tone of a good first impression. His lips quirked as if my angst amused him. Go take a nap, Naomi. Then go to dinner at Liza J's. He turned and headed for the door. Wait! I hurried after him, catching him on the porch. What do I say to Waylay? I didn't know where the question had come from or the panicky note in my voice. I wasn't a panicker. I performed miracles under pressure. What do you mean, what do you say? What do I tell her about her mom and me and why we're here? Tell her the truth. I'm not sure what that is. 
He started down the porch steps and, again, panic clawed at my throat. The only man I knew in this town was abandoning me with a child I didn't know, no transportation, and only the crap my sister hadn't stolen from me. Knox! He stopped again and swore. Christ, Naomi. Tell her her mom left her with you and you're looking forward to getting to know her. Don't make it more complicated than it has to be. What if she asks when Tina's coming back? What if she doesn't want to stay with me? Oh, God, how do I make her listen to me? He stepped back up onto the porch and into my space, then did something I never saw coming. He grinned. Full-on, panty-melting, 100% wattage grinned. I felt woozy and hot, and like I didn't know how any of my joints worked anymore. Wow, I whispered. Wow what? He asked. Uh, you smiled, and it was just seriously wow. I had no idea you could look like that. I mean, you already look like... I waved my hand awkwardly in front of him. You know, but then you add the smile and you look almost human. His smile was gone and the familiar annoyance was back. Jesus, Daisy, get some sleep. You're babbling like an idiot. I didn't wait to watch him drive away. Instead, I went back inside and closed the door. Now what the hell am I going to do? Sleep deserted me abruptly, leaving behind a groggy, panicked confusion. I was face down on a bare mattress, a scrub brush still clutched in one hand. The room slowly came into focus as my eyes and brain returned to the land of the living. Warner. Grr. Tina. Ugh. Car. Damn it. Waylay. Holy crap. Cottage. Adorable. Knox. Grumpy. Sexy. Horrible. Yet helpful. The timeline of the last 24 hours intact, I pried myself off the mattress and sat up. The room was small, but cute, just like the rest of the place. Paneled walls painted a bright white, antique brass bed. There was a tall dresser opposite the bed, and a skinny table painted peacock blue tucked under the window that overlooked the meandering creek. I heard someone humming downstairs and remembered. Waylay. Damn it, I muttered, jumping off the bed. My first day on the job as a guardian, and I'd left my new charge unattended for who knew how long. She could have been abducted by her mother or mauled by a bear while I indulged in an afternoon nap. I sucked, I decided as I raced down the stairs. Jeez, don't break your neck or anything. Waylay sat at the kitchen table, swinging a bare foot while she chowed down on what appeared to be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with thick white bread and enough jelly to cause instant cavities. Coffee, I croaked at her. Man, you look like a zombie. Zombie needs coffee. Soda in the fridge. Soda would have to do. I stumbled my way to the refrigerator and opened it. I was halfway through the can of Pepsi before I realized there was food inside. Where food from? I rasped. I was not an easy waker from naps. In the morning, I could bound out of bed with the energy of a sugared-up kindergarten class, but post-nap Naomi wasn't pretty or coherent. Waylay gave me a long look. Are you trying to ask me where the food came from? I held up a finger and downed the rest of the soda. Yeah, I wheezed finally as the cold caffeine and sugar burned my throat. That. I paused to burp indelicately. Excuse me. Waylay smirked. Chief Nash had a delivery lady drop off a bag of groceries while you were drooling all over your bed. My eyeballs felt gritty as I blinked. The chief of police had seen to delivering food that I'd been too unconscious to provide for my niece. I was not going to get a gold star in guardianship today. Crap, I muttered. 
It's not crap, Waylay argued around a huge bite of PB&J. There's some candy and some chips. I needed to claw my way back up the scale toward responsible adult and needed to do it fast. We need a list, I decided, scrubbing my hands over my eyes. We need to figure out how far we are from civilization, how to get there, what supplies we need for the next day or two. Coffee. I definitely needed coffee. It's like half a mile to town, Waylay said. She had a smear of jelly on her chin, and besides her my aunt is a lunatic expression, she looked adorably childlike. Why are your arms and knees all scraped up? I glanced down at the abrasions on my skin. I climbed out of a church basement window. Cool. So we're going into town? Yes, I just need to take a kitchen inventory, I decided, finding my purse on the counter and digging out my trusty notebook and pen. Coffee. Food. Transportation. Job. New purpose in life. We can take the bikes, Waylay piped up. Bikes? I repeated. Yeah, Liza J dropped them off. Said we have to come to dinner tonight, too. You met our landlord? I squeaked. Who else stopped by? The mayor? Exactly how long have I been asleep? Her eyes went wide and serious. Aunt Naomi, you've been asleep for two whole days. What? She smirked. Just messing with you. You were out for an hour. Hilarious. Just for that, I'm buying Brussels sprouts and carrots. She wrinkled her nose. Gross. Serves you right, smarty pants. Now make me a sandwich while I tackle this inventory. Fine, but only if you think about brushing your hair and washing your face before we go out in public. I don't want to be seen with Aunt Zombie. Six. Asparagus and a Showdown. Naomi. At this minute... I was supposed to be jet-lagged and wandering the streets of Paris on my honeymoon. Instead, I was clinging to the handlebars of an ancient 10-speed bike, trying not to tip over. It had been years since my ass had met a bike seat. Every bump and rut on the gravel road jarred both my teeth and my lady parts. The one and only time I'd talked Warner into trying one of those tandem bikes at the beach, we'd ended up headfirst in a shrub outside the kite store. Warner had not been pleased. There were a lot of things that hadn't pleased Warner Dennison III, things I should have paid more attention to. The thicket of woods passed in a buzzing blur as we rode through swirls of gnats and the thick southern humidity. Beads of sweat trickled down my spine. "'Are you coming or what?' Waylay called from what seemed like a mile ahead. She was riding a rusty boy's bike with her arms dangling at her sides. "'What's your middle name?' I yelled back. "'Regina!' "'Waylay Regina Witt! You put both hands on your handlebars this instant!' "'Oh, come on! You're not one of those fun-hating ants, are you?' I pedaled harder until I caught up. "'I am lots of fun!' I huffed, partially because I was offended, but mostly because I was out of breath." Sure, maybe I wasn't a ride with no hands or a sneak out of a sleepover to go kiss boys fun or a call in sick to go to a concert fun kind of gal, but I didn't hate fun. There was usually just too much that needed doing before I could get to the fun. Town's this way, Waylay said, gesturing to the left with a flick of her chin. It was such a Tina gesture that it took away what remaining breath I had. We abandoned gravel for smooth asphalt, and within minutes, I spotted the outskirts of knock out up ahead. For a second, I lost myself in the historic familiarity of a bike ride. The sun on my face and arms, the warm air as it brushed over my skin, the call-in response of a billion insects in the throes of summer. I'd been an 11-year-old on a bike once heading out for adventure into the morning swelter and not returning home until I got hungry or the fireflies came out. There were sprawling horse farms on the outskirts of town with slick fences and emerald green pastures. 
I could almost smell the wealth and privilege. It reminded me of Warner's Parents Country Club. Four bikers in worn denim and leather roared past us on motorcycles, the engine rumble a vibration in my bones as they escaped the confines of town. Horse people and bikers. It was a unique combination. The farms disappeared and were replaced by tidy homes on tidy lots that got closer and closer together until we were on the main street. Traffic was light, so I was able to pay more attention to the downtown area than I have this morning. There was a farm supply store and a gift shop next to the mechanic. Opposite was a hardware store and the pet store where my Volvo had been stolen. Grocery stores this way! Waylay called from ahead of me as she took another left turn much faster than I felt prudent. Slow down! Great. Half a day in my care and my niece was going to end up knocking out her front teeth by riding face first into a stop sign. Waylay ignored me. She zipped down the block and into the parking lot. I added bike helmets to my mental shopping list and followed her. After parking our bikes on the rack by the front door, I pulled out the envelope I'd, thankfully, hidden in a box of tampons. Minutes before I was supposed to walk down the aisle, my mother had handed me a card full of cash. It was supposed to be our wedding present. Spending money for the honeymoon. Now it was the only money I had access to until I could replace my stolen credit and debit cards. I shuddered to think how much money I'd stupidly shelled out of my own savings for the wedding that never happened. Guess you can't buy too many Brussels sprouts since we're on bikes, Waylay observed smugly. Guess again, smarty pants, I said, pointing at the sign in the window. Home delivery available. Aw, man, she groaned. Now we can get a truckload of vegetables, I said cheerily. No! What do you mean, no? I demanded, waggling stalks of asparagus at Waylay. No to asparagus, Waylay said. It's green. You don't eat green foods? Not unless it comes in candy form. I wrinkled my nose. You have to eat some vegetables. What about fruits? I like pie, she said, poking suspiciously at a bin of mangoes as if she'd never seen them before. What do you usually eat for dinner with... with your mom? I had no idea whether Tina was a touchy subject or if she routinely left Waylay to fend for herself. I felt like I was blindfolded and being forced to shuffle out onto a frozen lake. The ice would break under my feet sooner or later. I just didn't know where or when. Her shoulders hiked up toward her ears. Dunno, whatever was in the fridge. Leftovers? I asked hopefully. I make Easy Mac and frozen pizzas, sometimes nuggets, Waylay said, growing bored with the mangoes and moving on to frown at a display of green leaf lettuces. Can we get Pop-Tarts? I was getting a headache. I needed more sleep and coffee, not necessarily in that order. Maybe, but first we have to agree on a few healthy foods. A man in a Grover's Groceries apron turned the corner into produce. His polite smile vanished when he caught sight of us. Eyes narrowed, lip curled. He looked as if he'd just spotted us drop-kicking a plastic light-up baby Jesus in an outdoor nativity scene. Hello, I said, adding an extra punch of warmth to my smile. He gave a harumph in our direction and stalked off. I glanced at Waylay, but either she hadn't noticed the eye daggers or she was immune. So much for Southern hospitality. Though we were in Northern Virginia. Maybe they didn't do the Southern hospitality thing here. Or maybe the man had just found out that his cat had a month to live. You never knew what people were going through behind the scenes. Waylay and I worked our way around the store, and I noticed a similar reaction from a few other employees and patrons. When the woman behind the deli counter threw the pound of sliced turkey breast at me, I'd had enough. I made sure Waylay was busy leaning over an open freezer of chicken nuggets. Excuse me, I'm new here. Am I breaking some sort of store etiquette that results in hurled deli meats? Ha! Huh. You ain't fooling me, Tina Witt. Now you gonna pay for that turkey or try to stuff it in your bra like last time? And there was my answer. 
I'm Naomi Witt, Tina's sister and Waylay's aunt. I can assure you I've never stuffed deli meat in my bra. Bullshit, she said it, cupping a hand to her mouth like she was using a bullhorn. You and that kid of yours are no good shoplifting pains in the ass. My conflict resolution skills were limited to people-pleasing. Usually I would squeak out a terrified apology and then feel compelled to buy the offended party some kind of small, thoughtful gift. But today I was tired. Okay, you know what? I don't think you're supposed to talk to patrons like that, I said. I was going for firm and confident, but it came out tinged with hysteria. And you know what else? Today I've been yelled at robbed twice, and turned into an inexperienced instaparent, and that was before lunch. I've slept about an hour in the last two days, and you don't see me hurling deli meat around. All I ask from you is that you treat me and my niece with a modicum of respect as a paying customer. I don't know you. I've never been here before. I'm sorry for whatever my sister did with her breasts and your meat, but I'd really like this turkey sliced thinner. I pushed the package back over the top of the cooler at her. Her eyes were wide in that, not sure how to handle this unhinged customer way. You're not shitting me? You're not Tina. I am not shitting you. Damn it, I should have gone for the coffee first. Aunt Naomi, I found the Pop-Tarts, Waylay said, appearing with an armload of sugary breakfast treats. Great, I said. So, I said, sliding a strawberry kiwi smoothie in front of Waylay and taking the seat across from her. Justice, the man of my dreams, had made my afternoon latte in a mug the size of a soup bowl. So what? Waylay asked sullenly. Her sneakered foot was kicking the pedestal leg of the table. I wished I hadn't run over my phone at the rest stop so I could search for ways to break the ice with kids. Uh... What have you been doing this summer? She looked me in the eyes for a long beat, then said, What's it to you? People with kids made it look easy to talk to them. I stuck my face in my bowl o latte and slurped, praying for inspiration. Thought you two ladies could use a little snack, Justice said, sliding a plate of cookies onto the table. Fresh out of the oven. Waylay's blue eyes went wide as she took in the plate and then looked up into Justice's face with suspicion. Thank you, Justice. That's so sweet of you, I said. I gave my niece a nudge. Yeah, thanks, Waylay said. She didn't reach for a cookie but sat there staring at the plate. This was an example I felt confident setting. I snatched up a peanut butter cookie and, between guzzles of my coffee, took a bite. Oh, my God, I managed. Justice, I know we just met, but I'd be honored if you marry me. She's already got the wedding dress, Waylay said. He laughed and flashed the gold band on his left hand. It devastates me to say I'm already spoken for. Uh, the good ones always are, I sighed. Waylay's fingers furtively moved closer to the plate. My favorite is the chocolate chocolate chip, Justice said, pointing at the biggest cookie on the plate. With a wink, he was gone. She waited until he was behind the counter before snatching the cookie off the plate. Mmm, so good, I mumbled, my mouth full of cookie goodness. She rolled her eyes. You're so weird. Shut up and eat your cookie. Her eyes narrowed, and I grinned. Kidding. So, what's your favorite color? We were on question 10 of my half-assed getting-to-know-you icebreaker when the door to the cafe flew open, and a woman strolled inside in ripped tights, a short denim skirt, and a Lenny Kravitz t-shirt. She had wild, dark hair worn in a high ponytail, several earrings, and a lotus flower tattooed on her forearm— I couldn't tell if she was in her 30s or her 40s. There you are, she said, grinning around a lollipop in her mouth when she spotted us. The friendly greeting made me immediately suspicious. Everyone thought I was Tina, which meant if someone was happy to see me, they were probably a terrible person. 
The woman grabbed a chair, spun it around backwards, and flopped down at our table. Ooh, those look good. She helped herself to a cookie with red frosting, trading lollipop for baked good. So, Naomi, she began. Uh, do we know you? Our uninvited guest slapped herself in the forehead. Whoops, manners. I'm already several steps ahead in our relationship. You'll just have to catch up. I'm Sherry Fiasco. Sherry Fiasco? She shrugged. I know, sounds made up, but it's not. Justice, I'll take a double espresso to go, she called. My future husband raised a hand without turning around from the order he was working on. You got it, Fee. So as I was saying, in my head we're already friends, which is why I have a job for you, she said, biting the cookie in half. Hey, Way. Waylay studied Sherry over her smoothie. Hey. So what do you say? Sherry asked, shimmying her shoulders. Huh? Aunt Naomi's kind of a planner, Waylay explained. She wrote three lists so far today. Ah, I'll look before you leap type, Sherry said, nodding sagely. Okay, I'm a business manager, which puts me in charge of several small businesses in the area. One of them is down a server and desperately needs someone who can deliver beer and be generally charming. A waitress? I'd spent the last five years of my life cooped up in an office answering emails, pushing papers, and settling human resource issues via carefully worded emails. Being on my feet and around people all day sounded like it might be fun. It's honest work, the tips are great, the uniforms are cute, and the rest of the staff is a hoot, mostly, Sherry said. I'd need to arrange childcare, I hedged. For who? Waylay demanded, her forehead scrunched up. For you, I said, ruffling her hair. She looked appalled and dodged my hand. I don't need a babysitter. Just because you're used to doing something one way doesn't mean it's the right way, I told her. You've spent a lot of time looking out for yourself. But that's my job now. I'm not about to leave you alone while I go to work. That's stupid. I'm not a baby. No, you're not, I agreed. But adult supervision is a necessity. Wei Lei muttered something that sounded suspiciously like, Bullshit. I decided to pick my battles and pretend I hadn't heard. If that's your only reservation, I can easily find someone to hang out with Wei here while you rake in the tip money. I chewed on my lower lip. I wasn't a fan of having to decide things on the spot. There were pros and cons to Wei. Research to do, routes to calculate, schedules to firm up. I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving Waylay with a stranger, I explained. Of course not, Sherry chirped. I'll arrange a meeting and you can decide then. Uh... Justice whistled from the counter. Order's up, Fee. Thanks, big guy, she said, jumping up from her chair. Well, I'll see you two ladies later. First shift's tomorrow night. Be there at five. Wait! She cocked her head. Where is this job? Honky tonk, she said as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. Bye. I watched Sherry Fiasco strut out of the cafe with the confidence of a woman who knew exactly where she was going and what she was doing. Even when my five-year plan was intact, I hadn't had that kind of confidence. What just happened? I whispered. You got a job and then turned me into a dumb baby. Waylay's face was stony. I didn't call you a dumb baby and I didn't officially accept, I pointed out. But I needed income, and the sooner the better. My checking account balance wasn't exactly going to support us indefinitely, especially not with rent and security deposits and utilities to worry about, not to mention the fact that I had no vehicle, no phone, and no computer. I picked up another cookie and took a bite. It won't be so bad, I promised Waylay. <laughs> yeah, right, she scoffed and went back to kicking the table. 7. A Punch in the Face Knox Where you think you're going? I asked lazily from my lawn chair parked in the middle of the lane. 
The SUV's bumper had stopped a generous foot from my knees, a cloud of dust rising up behind. My brother slid out from behind the wheel and rounded the vehicle. Should've known I'd find you here, Nash said, his jaw tight as he pulled a slip of paper from his uniform pocket. He crumpled it and threw it at me. It hit me square in the chest. Harvey said to pass this along to you since it was your fault he was speeding through town this morning. It was a speeding ticket written in my brother's scrawl. I have no idea what Harvey's jabbering about. I lied and pocketed the citation. I see you're still an irresponsible asshole, Nash said as if there'd been a chance I'd changed in the past few years. I see you're still a law-abiding dickhead with a stick up his ass. Waylon, my lazy basset hound, wandered his stumpy legs off the porch to greet his uncle. Traitor. If he thought he'd get more attention or more people food somewhere else, Waylon wasn't weighed down by loyalty and didn't hesitate to wander. I pointed toward the cabin with my beer bottle. I live here, remember? Didn't look like you were slowing down to pay me a visit. Nash hadn't set foot in my place in more than three years. I'd done him the same courtesy. He hunkered down to give Waylon some love. Got an update for Naomi, he said. And? And the fuck what? It doesn't involve you. You don't need to stand sentry like some ugly gargoyle. Waylon, sensing he wasn't the focal point, meandered up to me and nosed at my hand. I gave him a thump on his side and the dog biscuit I'd stashed in the chair's cup holder. He took it and pranced back to the porch, white-tipped tail a blur of happy. I raised the beer to my mouth. Saw her first, I reminded Nash. The flash of anger I saw in his eyes was gratifying. Oh, fuck you, man. You pissed her off first. I shrugged carelessly. Same thing. Might as well just wander that law-abiding ass of yours back to Liza J's. I'll bring Naomi and Wele to you. Can't stop me from doing my damn job, Knox. I got out of my chair. Nash's eyes narrowed. Give you one free shot, I offered, then drained the rest of my beer. One for one? My brother clarified. He always did pay too much attention to the rules. Yep. He placed his watch on the hood of the SUV and rolled up his sleeves. I put my beer in the cup holder and stretched my arms overhead. Never used to need to warm up before, Nash observed, adopting a boxer stance. I loosened up my neck and shoulders. Fuck off. We're over 40. Shit hurts. This was overdue. Fists were how we'd settled countless arguments for decades. Fight and move on, until the thing punching each other in the face couldn't settle. What's the matter? I taunted. Having second, Nash's stupid fist plowing into my face cut off the rest of my sentence. It was a bell ringer, right in the fucking nose. Shit, that hurt. God damn it, I hissed, prodding my face for deformities. My brother bobbed and weaved in front of me, looking a little too fucking proud of himself. I tasted blood as it trickled onto my upper lip. I got shit to do. I don't have time for conversation and kicking your... I let my fist fly, catching him in that goddamn mouth he was always running. The mouth he'd used to lay on the charm with Naomi. His head snapped back. Ow! Fuck! He swiped his arm over his mouth, smearing his own blood up his sleeve. Another bead dripped onto the shirt of his uniform. It made me feel perversely accomplished. Messing up Nash was always gratifying. We really gonna do this? He asked, looking up as his tongue darted out to taste the blood at the corner of his lip. Don't have to. You know how to stop it. She hates your guts. You don't even like her, he pointed out. I used the hem of my t-shirt to stem the flow of blood from my nose. Not the point. Nash narrowed his eyes. The point is, you always want to call the shots. Some brother. You're the idiot who doesn't know how to say thank you, I shot back. He shook his head, looking like he was going to back down. But I knew better. I knew him better. 
We both wanted this. Get out of my way, Knox. You're not getting past me today. I'd be happy to run you down with my truck. Say you were drunk and passed out in the middle of the lane and I didn't see you. Your ass would be behind bars before they even got mine to the morgue, I predicted. Something happens to either one of us around here. Everyone knows the first place to look is the other one. And what does that say about our happy fucking family? Nash spat. We were circling each other now, hands up, eyes locked. Fighting a man you grew up tumbling with was like fighting yourself. You knew all the moves even before they were coming. I'll ask you again, Knox. Why are you in my way? I shrugged, mostly to annoy him. But partly because I didn't really know why I'd planted my ass between my brother and Naomi Doe-Eyes Wit. She wasn't my type. He wasn't my problem. Yet here I was. The whole introspection thing was another one of those time wastes that I didn't bother with. I wanted to do something, I did it. You just want to put your hands on something fine and mess it up, don't you? Nash asked. You can't take care of a woman like that. She's got class. She's smart. She's needy as fuck, right up your alley. I shot back. Then get out of my way. Tired of the conversation, I threw a jab to his jaw. He returned it with a shot to my ribs. I don't know how long we traded blows in the middle of the dirt lane, kicking up dust and hurling insults at each other. Somewhere in the midst of him calling me a fucking asshole and me putting him in a headlock so I could punch him in the forehead, I recognized my brother for the first time in a long ass time. What in the holy hell are you doing? You can't assault an officer of the law? Naomi floated into my line of sight, looking exactly like the high-class woman I didn't want, exactly the type my brother did. Her hair was down now and daisy-free, draped over one shoulder, thick and sleek. Her eyes had lost the better part of the exhausted shadows. She was wearing one of those long sundresses that skimmed the tops of her feet and made men wonder what treasures lay beneath. She was carrying a bouquet of flowers, and for a second, I wanted to know who the hell had given them to her so I could kick their ass. Next to her was Wele in shorts and a pink t-shirt, holding a plate covered in plastic wrap. She was grinning at us. Nash used the distraction to throw an elbow to my gut. The wind went out of me, and I bent to catch my breath. Face is bleeding, Chief, Wele cheerfully observed. Got it all over that nice clean shirt of yours. I grinned. The kid might have belonged to Tina, but she was funny as hell, and she was in my corner. Waylon abandoned his perch on the porch and ambled back into the road to greet the newcomers. Thanks, Waylay, Nash said, swiping at his bloody mouth again. I was just coming to see you two. While Wele squished my dog's droopy jowls between her hands, Naomi peered around my brother at me. What is wrong with you? She hissed. You can't just start a fight with a cop. I slowly straightened, rubbing a hand over my sternum. Doesn't count as a cop, he's my brother. Waylon shoved his nose under the hem of Naomi's dress and stepped on her foot. He was a needy bastard. Well, hello, Naomi crooned, crouching down to pet him. His name's Waylon, Nash told her. Waylon and Waylay, she mused. That won't get confusing. My nose burned. My face fucking hurt. My knuckles were bleeding. But looking at her petting my needy-ass dog with an armful of flowers made everything else start to fade away. Fuck me. I knew what attraction felt like, knew what to do with it too, but not with a woman like this, one who didn't know it was smart to be afraid of me, one with a wedding dress and no ring, one with an eleven-year-old. This was the kind of situation that had me heading for the hills, but I couldn't stop looking at her. You're an idiot, Nash grinned, then winced. And you, Naomi turned on him. I can't imagine you take that badge very seriously if you're fighting in the street with your own brother. He started it, Nash and I both said at the same time. Then we'll leave you to it, she said primly, 
putting a hand on Waylay's shoulder. Let's go. Heading to Liza J's? Nash asked. We are. We were invited for dinner, Naomi said. Waylay raised the plate she was holding. Brought cookies. I'll walk with you, Nash said. We can talk on the way. Sounds good to me, I said, moving my chair out of the road. You're not invited, he said. Oh, yes, I am. Seven sharp. My brother looked like he was going to haul off and hit me again, which suited me just fine. Tarnishing his, uh, shucks, hero vibe would only further my cause. But just as I was about to goad him into it, Naomi stepped between us. Waylon followed her and sat on her feet. The woman couldn't read signs. She was a danger to herself, trying to get between two bucks itching for a fight. Did you find my car? She asked Nash. Did you find my mom? Waylay asked. Maybe we should talk in private, he suggested. Knox, be a good neighbor and take Waylay up to the house while I have a few words with Naomi. No way, Waylay said, crossing her arms. Fuck no, I agreed. Our stare down lasted until Naomi rolled her eyes. Fine, let's just get this over with. Please tell me what you found. My brother suddenly looked uncomfortable, and my interest peaked. Guess I'll just get right to it, Nash said. I didn't find your car yet, but I did find something interesting when I ran the plates. It was reported stolen. No shit, Sherlock. Naomi did that this morning, I reminded him. Nash ignored me and continued. It was reported stolen yesterday by one Warner Dennison III of Long Island, New York. Naomi looked like she wanted the earth to swallow her up. You stole a car? Waylay asked her aunt, looking impressed. I had to admit that I hadn't seen that one coming either. It's my car, but my ex-fiancé bought it. His name was on the title with mine. She looked like the kind of woman a man would buy cars for, I decided. Don't you mean ex-husband? Waylay piped up. Ex-fiancé, Naomi corrected. We're no longer together, and we didn't get married. Cause she left him at the altar, the girl added knowledgeably. Yesterday. Waylay, I told you that in confidence, Naomi hissed. Her cheeks turned a bright shade of scarlet. You're the one being interrogated for Grand Theft Auto. No one is being interrogated, Nash insisted. I'll talk to the office in charge and clear up any misunderstanding. Thank you, Naomi said. Her eyes were filling with what looked suspiciously like tears. Fuck. I don't know about you all, but I could sure use a drink. Let's head up to the big house and solve this over alcohol, I suggested. I didn't imagine the flicker of relief that flashed over her pretty face. I spent the short walk to Liza J's wondering when the hell I'd turned into a sundress guy. The women I dated wore jeans and leather and rocker t-shirts. They didn't have prep school vocabularies or dresses that floated around their ankles like some summer fantasy. I liked my women the way I liked my relationships. Fast, dirty, and casual. Naomi Witt was none of those, and I needed to remember that. You're seriously going to dinner like that? Naomi asked me, as Waylon wandered off the drive to lift his leg on a dogwood. Behind us, Waylay peppered Nash with questions about crime and knock him out. Liza J seen worse, I said, biting into a cookie. Where did you get that cookie? she demanded. Waylay, I said. Naomi looked like she was going to slap it out of my hand, so I shoved the rest of it into my mouth. Those are for this mysterious Liza J I'm supposed to be making a good impression on, she complained. This isn't a great way for me to meet a new potential landlord. Hi, I'm Naomi. I'm squatting in your cottage and these guys were fighting in your driveway. Please give me affordable rent. I snorted, then winced when my nose started to throb again. Relax. Liza J would be worried if Nash and I didn't show up bleeding and pissed off at each other, I assured her. 
Why are you pissed off at each other? Baby, you haven't got the time, I drawled. We reached the steps of the big house and Naomi hesitated, looking up at the rough-hewn timber, the cedar shakes. Behind overgrown azaleas and boxwoods, the porch stretched nearly 50 feet along the front. I tried to see it from her eyes. New in town, running from a wedding, no place to stay, thrown into a guardianship she hadn't seen coming. To her, everything hinged on this meal. Don't chicken shit out now, I advised. Liza J hates cowards. Those pretty hazel eyes narrowed to slits. Thanks for the advice, she said caustically. Nice place, Waylay said, joining us at the foot of the steps. I thought about the trailer. The chaos outside that little bedroom with the keep out sign on the door. She'd done her best to keep the chaos and unpredictability out of her little world. I could respect that. Used to be a lodge. Let's go. I need that drink, I said, climbing the three short steps and reaching for the doorknob. Don't we need to knock or ring the bell? Naomi hissed, grabbing my arm. And there it was again. That electricity charging my blood, waking up my body like it had been exposed to some kind of threat, some kind of danger. We both looked down at her hand, and she quickly dropped it. Not necessary around here, Nash assured her, unaware that my blood was on fire and Naomi was blushing again. Liza J, I bellowed. The response was a fevered fit of barking. Oh my, Naomi whispered, putting herself between Waylay and the fur circus. Waylon shoved himself between my leg and the doorframe just as two dogs raced into the foyer. Randy the Beagle had earned his name by humping everything in sight for the first year of his life. Kitty was a one-eyed, 50-pound pit bull who thought she was a lapdog. Both kept Liza J entertained in her solitude. It was cooler inside, darker, too. The blinds stayed closed these days. Liza J said it was so no one could snoop on her business. But I knew the truth, and I didn't blame her for it. Quit your hollering! A voice came from the direction of the kitchen. What's the matter with you? Your mama raised you in a barn. No, but our grandma did, Nash called back. Elizabeth Jane Persimmon, all five feet one inch of her, clomped out to greet us. She wore her hair cut short around her face, as she had for as long as I could remember. Never missed a trim. Her rubber gardening clogs squeaked on the floor. She was in her typical uniform of cargo pants and a blue t-shirt. She wore the same thing nearly every day. If it was hot, she wore the pants with the zippered legs. If it was cold, she added a sweatshirt in the same color as the tee. Should have drowned you in the creek when I had the chance, she said, stopping in front of us and crossing her arms expectantly. Liza J. Nash dutifully pressed a kiss to her cheek. I repeated the greeting. She nodded her satisfaction. Warm and fuzzy time was over. So, what the hell kind of mess did you bring me? Her gaze slid to Naomi and Waylay, who were being skeptically sniffed by the dogs. Kitty broke first and headbutted Naomi in the legs in a bid for affection. Waylon, not to be left out, muscled his way in, knocking her off balance. I reached out, but Nash got there first and steadied her. Put the disaster dogs out. Let them run off the devil for a bit, Liza J ordered. Nash let go of Naomi and opened the front door. Three streaks of fur took off. Liza J, this is Naomi and her niece, Waylay, I said. They'll be staying at the cottage. They will, will they? She didn't like being told what to do any more than I did. Neither one of us ever understood why Nash had gone all law and order. Unless, of course, you want to throw them out on the street, I added. I remember where I know you from, my grandmother announced, peering at Waylay through her bifocals. Been bugging me since I dropped off the bikes. You fixed my iPad at the library. You did? Naomi asked the girl. Waylay shrugged, looking embarrassed. I go in there sometimes, and sometimes old folks have me fix stuff. 
And you look like that one's troublemaking mother, Liza J pointed at Naomi. That would be my sister, she said, smiling weakly. Twins, I interjected. Naomi held out the bouquet. We brought you flowers and cookies to thank you for inviting us to dinner. Flowers, cookies, and two bleeding men, Liza J observed. Might as well come on back. Dinner's about done. About done in Liza J's house meant she hadn't started it yet. We trooped into the kitchen where all the fixings for Sloppy Joe's and salad awaited. Meat, I called. Salad, Nash conceded. Not before you both clean yourselves up, Liza J said, pointing to the kitchen sink. Nash did as he was told and turned on the water. I headed to the fridge and cracked open a beer first. Got some treats from the bakery today, Liza J said. She looked at Waylay, who was eyeing the salad ingredients with suspicion. Why don't you put them on a plate with whatever cookies my grandsons didn't eat and maybe taste a couple to make sure they're fit for eating? Cool, Waylay said, making a beeline for the bakery box on the counter. I peered over the kid's shoulder and helped myself to a lemon cookie, my favorite. I'll get the wine, Liza J said. You look like you know your way around a wine opener. She was addressing Naomi, who looked like she couldn't decide if it was a compliment or a judgment. Go on, I told her when Liza J headed out of the room. She took a step closer, and I caught the scent of lavender. Do not, under any circumstances, start another fight in front of my niece, she hissed. Can't promise anything. If eyes could shoot actual fire, I would have had a need to regrow my eyebrows. Chief, I trust you can keep the order for a few minutes, she said. Nash flashed her one of his stupid, charming grins. You can count on me. Jesus, I coughed into my fist. Waylay snickered. I'll be right back, Naomi promised Waylay. Chief Morgan is in charge. The kid looked confused. I guessed no one had ever bothered to tell her they were leaving, let alone when they'd be back. Naomi straightened her shoulders and followed my grandmother out of the room, that damn dress floating around her like she was some kind of fairy tale princess about to face a dragon. 8. The Mysterious Liza J. Naomi Unsure how I felt leaving Waylay in a room with two grown men who had been grappling in the road mere minutes earlier, I reluctantly followed Liza into a dark dining room. The wallpaper was a deep green in a pattern I couldn't quite make out. The furniture was heavy and rustic. The wide plank table stretched on for nearly 12 feet and was buried under boxes and stacks of papers. Instead of chafing dishes or family photos, the walnut buffet was stacked high with bottles of wine and liquor. Bar glasses were crammed into a nearby hutch so full the doors didn't close. I itched to dig into the mess. The only light in the room came from the far wall where an arched opening led into what looked like a sun porch with floor-to-ceiling glass that needed a good scrubbing. You have a beautiful home, I ventured, gently shifting a half dozen china plates stacked precariously on the corner of the table. From what I'd seen so far, the house had buckets of potential. It was just buried under piles of drapes and dusty stuff. Liza straightened from the buffet, a bottle of wine in each hand. She was short and soft on the outside, like anyone's favorite grandma, but Liza greeted her grandsons with chores and gruffness. I was curious what was said about the Morgans that family relationships didn't make it into introductions. If anyone had a right to avoid claiming their family in this town, it was me. Used to run it as a small lodge she began, setting the bottles on top of the buffet. Don't anymore. Guess you'll be wanting to stay for a while. Okay, not big on small talk. Got it. I nodded. It's a lovely cottage, but I understand if it's an inconvenience. I'm sure I could come up with an alternative soon. 
That wasn't exactly a truth, so much as a hope. The woman before me was my best chance of creating a little stability in the short term for my niece. Liza swiped a cloth napkin over the dust on the wine label. Don't bother. It was just sitting there going unused. Her accent ventured a little farther south than the mid-Atlantic tone of Northern Virginia. I prayed that there was a dash of Southern hospitality mixed in there somewhere. That's very kind of you. If you don't mind, I'd like to discuss the rent and security deposit. She shoved the first bottle at me. Openers in the drawer. I opened the top drawer of the buffet and found a tangle of napkin rings, coasters, candlesticks, matches, and finally a corkscrew. I went to work on the cork. As I was saying, money's a little bit tight. That's what happens when you got yourself a sister who steals from you and a new mouth to feed, Liza said, arms crossed. Knox or Nash had a very big mouth. I said nothing and popped the cork free. Guessing you'll need work, too, she predicted. Unless you work from home or something. I recently left my job, I said carefully. And my home, my fiancé, and everything else in that life. How recently? People in Knock em Out were not shy about sticking their noses into other people's business. Yesterday... Heard my grandson drove you out here with a wedding dress flying like a flag out the window. You a runaway bride? She set two glasses next to the open bottle and nodded. I poured. I guess I am. After a full year of planning, of choosing everything from the cocktail hour appetizers to the color of the table runner on the charcuterie table, it was all over. Wasted. All that time, all that effort, all that planning all that money. She picked up a glass and held it aloft. Good. Heed my words. Don't ever let a man you don't like make decisions for you. It was odd advice coming from a stranger that I was trying to impress, but considering the day I'd had, I raised my glass to hers. You'll do okay here. Knock em out will take care of you and that little girl, she predicted. Well then, about the cottage... I pressed. I have some savings I can access. Technically, it was my retirement account, and I'd have to borrow against it. You and the girl can stay rent-free, Liza J. decided. My mouth opened wider than the fish mounted on the wall above us. You'll pay the utilities on the cottage, she continued. The rest you can trade by helping around this place. I'm not the neatest housekeeper, and I need some help getting things cleaned up. My squeals were internal. Liza was my fairy godmother in gardening clogs. That's very generous of you, I began, attempting to process what was happening. But after the past 24 hours, my brain was on hiatus. You'll still need a paycheck she continued, unaware of my mental predicament. I still needed a lot of things. Bike helmets, a car, some therapy appointments. Oh, I had a job offer today. Someone named Sherry Fiasco said I could take a shift at a place called the Honky Tonk tomorrow night. But I need to find someone to watch Waylay. We heard the scrabble of paws, and in seconds, Waylon trotted into the room and looked at us expectantly. Way lay, not way lun, Liza said to the dog. He sniffed around, making sure we weren't dropping food on the floor, and then headed back into the kitchen. You didn't by chance mention to Knox about that job offer, did you? Liza asked. We don't have that kind of relationship. We just met, I said diplomatically. I didn't want to come out and tell my new landlord that I thought her grandson was a brutish oaf with the manners of a pillaging Norseman. She studied me through her glasses, and the corner of her mouth turned up. Oh, I can tell. A word of advice. Maybe don't tell him about the new job. He might have opinions, and if he does, he'd definitely share them. If Knox Morgan thought I was interested in his opinions on my life, I could add narcissistic tendencies to his long list of flaws. My business is my business, I said primly. Besides, 
I don't think I'm going to be able to find someone I'm comfortable leaving Wele with in such a short time. Already did, though the girl probably don't need it. Probably been making her own dinner since she was six. She can stay with me. Hell, maybe she can make me dinner. Bring her by on your way to work tomorrow. Keep an entire human being alive and safe went into the major imposition column on my internal spreadsheet of things to avoid at all costs. Asking my fairy godmother landlord to please babysit my niece until who knew when while I worked a late shift in a bar rose to the top of that list, edging out, helping me move, and chauffeuring me to or from surgery. Major impositions were only put upon responsible family members and close friends. Liza was neither of those. Oh, but I don't know what time I'll get off, I hedged. It could be very late. She shrugged. Makes no difference to me. I'll keep her here with me and the dogs, then bring her back to the cottage after dinner. Don't mind waiting around there. Always like that place. She headed toward the doorway, leaving me with my feet glued to the rug and my mouth still gaping. I'll pay you, I called after her, finally rediscovering the ability to move and speak. We'll discuss it, Liza said over her shoulder. I know you think you're getting the good end of the deal, but you got no idea what a mess you're getting involved in. We found everyone, including the dogs, alive and unharmed in the kitchen in an oddly homey scene. Wele was perched at the island, judging every ingredient Nash added to the salad as she added mixed seasoning and condiments in a bowl. Knox was drinking a beer and stabbing at the meat in the pan while reading out ingredients to Wele. There appeared to be no new bloodshed. Both men had cleaned up their wounds, leaving behind only blood stains and bruises. Nash looked like a hero who had taken a few hits for a damsel in distress. Knox, on the other hand, looked like a villain who'd gone a few rounds with the good guy and come out victorious. It was definitely my recent mistake with the good guy, on paper at least, that had me overcorrecting and finding Knox and his villainous attitude attractive. At least that's what I told myself when Knox's gaze landed on me, and I felt like hot bacon grease had just been poured directly into my spinal column. I ignored him and his sexy standing at the stoveness, choosing to focus on the rest of the room instead. Liza's kitchen had an astronomical amount of counter space that had my fantasies shifting gears and thinking about the Christmas cookie baking potential. The refrigerator was ancient. The stove, practically an antique. The countertops were battered butcher block. The cupboards were painted a lovely loden green. And, judging from the contents visible inside the glass-fronted ones, they were all close to overflowing. I'd start the clean-out in here, I decided. The kitchen was the heart of the home, after all. Though Liza didn't seem like she was the sentimental type, more like the frozen-in-time type. It happened. Life threw someone an unexpected curve, and things like household maintenance went right out the window, sometimes permanently. When it was ready, we took the food and wine into the sunroom, where a smaller table looked out over the backyard. The view was all woods and creek, dappled in gold as the sun sank lower in the summer sky. When I moved to take a seat next to Wele, Liza shook her head. Uh-uh. These two sit next to each other. They'll be wrestling on the floor before cookies. I'm sure they can behave themselves for one meal, I insisted. She snorted. <laughs> no, they can't. No, we can't, Knox said at the same time. Of course we can, Nash insisted. Liza jerked her head at Wele, who scampered to the opposite side of the table with her plate. The dogs filed in and trotted up to claim their sentry positions around the table. Two of them had judged Wele to be the one most likely to drop food and station themselves next to her. Waylon plopped down behind Liza at the head of the table. Both men moved to take the chair next to mine, Knox winning it by throwing an elbow that nearly had Nash dropping his plate. See their grandmother said with a triumphant jab of her fork. 
I took my seat and tried to ignore my acute awareness of Knox as he sat down. The task became downright impossible when his denim-clad thigh brushed against my arm as he sat down. I yanked my arm back and nearly put my plate in my lap. Why are you so jumpy? Waylay asked. I'm not jumpy, I insisted, bobbling my wine glass when I reached for it. So, what were you fighting over this time? Liza asked her grandsons, magnanimously changing the subject. Nothing, Knox and Nash said in unison. The glare that passed between them made me think they didn't like being on the same page about anything. Aunt Naomi broke them up, Waylay reported, studying a slice of tomato with suspicion. Eat your salad, I told her. Who was winning? Liza asked. Me, the brothers announced together. The pronouncement was followed by another chilly silence. Rough and tumble as they come, these two, Liza reminisced. Of course, they used to make up after a fight and be back to being thick as thieves in no time. Guess y'all outgrew that part. He started it, Nash complained. Knox snorted. <laughs> Just because you're the good one doesn't mean you're always innocent. I understood the dynamics of the good sibling versus the bad one all too well. You two with Lucy thrown in the mix? Liza shook her head. Whole town knew trouble was coming when you three got together. Lucy? I asked before I could help myself. Lucian Rollins, Nash said as he used his bun to scoop up the ground beef that escaped to his plate. An old friend. Knox grunted. His elbow brushed mine, and I felt my skin catch fire again. I withdrew as far as I dared without ending up in Liza's lap. What's Lucy up to these days? She asked. Last I heard, he was some big wig mogul in a suit. That's about the truth, Nash said. Kid was a hustler, Liza explained. Always knew he was meant for bigger and better things than a trailer and hand-me-downs. Waylay's gaze slid to Liza. Lots of people come from humble beginnings, I said. Knox looked at me and shook his head in what might have been amusement. What? Nothing. Eat your dinner. What? I demanded again. He shrugged. Chivalry. Humble beginnings. You talk like you read the dictionary for fun. I'm so glad you find humor in my vocabulary. It just makes my day. Don't mind Knox, Nash cut in. He's intimidated by women with brains. You want my fist up your nose again? Knox offered gamely. I kicked him under the table. It was purely on reflex. Ow! Fuck! He muttered, leaning down to rub his shin. All eyes came to me and I realized what I'd done. Great, I said, throwing down my fork in mortification. A few minutes here and there with you and it's contagious. Next thing you know, I'll be putting strangers in headlocks on the street. I'd pay to see that. Waylay mused. Me too, Knox and Nash said together. The corner of Liza's mouth lifted. I think you'll fit in just fine around here, she predicted. Even if you do talk like a dictionary. I take it that means you're letting them stay, Knox prodded. I am, Liza confirmed. I didn't miss the quick flash of relief that played over Waylay's face before her mask returned. One less thing to worry about. A nice, safe place to stay. You boys know our Naomi here's a runaway bride. She left some guy standing in a church and stole his car, Waylay announced with pride. I picked up the bottle of wine and topped off Liza's glass and then my own. You know, where I'm from, we mind our own business. Better not be expecting that in a place like Knockemout, Liza advised. What did he do? Nash asked, but he wasn't asking me, he was asking Waylay. She shrugged. Dunno, she won't say, but I bet it was something bad, cause that was a real nice dress she ran out in. It would take something pretty damn bad to make me run away instead of showing it off to everyone. I felt the heat of Knox's gaze on me and shriveled like a raisin. Waylon must have sensed my desperation because he lay down on my feet under the table. 
how about we talk about something else? Anything else. Religion? Politics? Bloodthirsty sports rivalries? Sure nice having you boys at the table at the same time, Liza said. This mean I don't have to do Thanksgiving in two shifts this year? We'll see, Nash said, eyeing his brother. I could feel the tension between them. Not wanting to have dinner end in a wrestling match, I desperately changed the subject. You know, I didn't actually steal the car. That's what Knox said when Mrs. Whelan down at the pop and stop caught him with a pocket full of candy, Nash said. Not all of us were born with Dudley do right shoved up our ass. For God's sake, Knox, language. I elbowed him in the arm and pointed at Waylay. She flashed him a toothy grin. I don't mind. Well, I do. Fireflies winked in and out of existence in the dusk as Knox and Waylay pitched pebbles into the creek. All three dogs took turns dashing into the creek, then turning around to shake themselves dry on the bank. Waylay's giggle and Knox's low murmur echoed off the water, made me feel like maybe today wasn't the worst day ever. I had a belly full of sloppy joes and a cozy house to return to. Doing okay? Nash came up next to me on the grass. He had a nice, calming presence. I didn't feel the exasperation around him that I did with Knox. I think so. I turned to look at him. Thank you for everything. It's been a stressful day. You and Liza, and I guess even your brother, made it better for Waylay and me. Way's a good kid, he said. She's smart, independent. A lot of us in town know that. I thought about the scene in the grocery store. I hope you're right, and I hope I can do right by her until we get things figured out. That reminds me. I brought this for you he said, handing over a brochure that it was too dark to read. It's about kinship custody arrangements. Oh, thanks. Basically, you're looking at an application process with a few legal hoops to jump through. If all that goes well, you'll have six months to decide if you want to make it permanent. Permanent? The words sent me reeling. I stared unseeing as Waylay and Knox took turns throwing a soggy tennis ball for the dogs. I asked around about Tina, Nash continued. Rumor has it she got herself a new man a few weeks back and there were whispers about some big score. A new man and a big score were both painfully on brand for my sister. Do you really think she might not come back? Nash edged into my line of sight and dipped down until I looked him in the eye. That's the thing, Naomi. She does come back. She's in a lot of trouble. No court's going to be thrilled with the idea of letting her retain custody. And if it's not me, it's foster care, I said, filling in the unspoken blanks. That's the long and short of it, he said. I know it's a big decision. And I'm not asking you to make it right this second. Get to know her. Get to know the town. Think on it. I've got a friend who does casework. She can help you get started with the application process. He was asking me to put the next six months of my life on hold for a little girl I'd just met. Yep. It was safe to say my bruised and battered life plan had officially disintegrated. I blew out a sigh and decided tomorrow was as good a day as any for panicking over the future. Waylay, it's time to go, I called. Waylon galloped to me, ears flying. He spit the tennis ball out at my feet. Not you, buddy, I said, leaning down to pet him. Do we have to? Waylay whined, dragging her feet as if they were encased in concrete. I shared similar sentiments. Knox put his hand on the top of her head and guided her in my direction. Get used to it, kid. Sometimes we all gotta do things we don't want to. Nine. Backyard urination and dewy decimal. Naomi. 
I found the cottage's back porch to be a lovely little spot for organizing my daily to-do list by priority as I waited for the pot of coffee to brew. I'd slept, like a coma patient, and when my eyelids popped open at 6.15 on the dot, I'd tiptoed across the hall to Waylay's room and peeked in to make sure my niece was still there. She was, tucked between fresh sheets in a white four-poster bed. I stared down at my list and tapped the end of a blue highlighter against the page. I needed to contact my parents and let them know I was alive and not having some kind of breakdown, but I wasn't sure how much else to tell them. Hey guys, you remember your other daughter? The one who gave you migraines for 20 years before she vanished from our lives? Yeah, well, she has a daughter who has no idea you exist. They'd disembark from their cruise ship in a hot minute and be on the first plane headed in our direction. Waylay had just been abandoned by her own mother and was now under the roof of an aunt she'd never met. Introducing grandparents into the mix might not be the best idea this soon out of the gate. Plus, it was my parents' first vacation together in ten years. They deserved three weeks of peace and quiet. The choice was only partially weighted in favor of the fact that I wouldn't have to come up with a diplomatic way to explain that they had missed out on the first 11 years of their only grandchild's life. Yet. I didn't like doing things until I knew the exact right way to do them. So I would wait until I knew Waylay a little better and my parents were back from their anniversary cruise, well-rested and ready for crazy news. Satisfied, I collected my notebook and highlighters and was just about ready to stand when I heard the distant squeak of a screen door. Next door, Waylon trotted down the back stairs into the yard where he promptly lifted his leg on a dead spot he clearly enjoyed using as a toilet. I smiled, and then the muscles of my face froze when another movement caught my eye. Knox, the Viking, Morgan, strolled off the deck in nothing but a pair of black boxer briefs. He was all man. Muscles, chest hair, tattoos. He stretched one arm lazily overhead and scratched the back of his neck, creating a picture of sleepy testosterone. It took me a full ten seconds of open-mouthed ogling to realize the man, like his dog, was peeing. My highlighters flying made a rapid-fire racket as they hit the wooden planks beneath me. Time froze as Knox turned in my direction. He was facing me with one hand on his... Nope. 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 I left my highlighters where they were and fled for the safety of the cottage, all the while congratulating myself for not trying to get a better look at Knox Jr., why is your face so red? You get sunburnt? I let out a shriek and crashed back against the screen door, nearly falling out onto the porch. Waylay was standing on a chair, trying to reach the Pop-Tarts I'd hidden above the fridge. You're so jumpy, she accused. Carefully, I closed the door, leaving all thoughts of urinating men in the outside world. Put the Pop-Tarts down. We're having eggs for breakfast. Aw, man... I ignored her disdain and placed the house's only skillet on the stove. How do you feel about going to the library today? The Knockamout Public Library was a sanctuary of cool and quiet in the Virginia summer swelter. It was a light, bright space with white oak shelves and farm-style work tables. Pairs of overstuffed armchairs were clustered by the tall windows. Just inside the door was a large community bulletin board. Everything from piano lessons to yard sale announcements and charity bike rides dotted the cork board in evenly spaced increments. Beneath it sat a gray wash table displaying several genres of books from steamy romance to autobiographies to poetry. Glossy green plants in blue and yellow pots added life on shelves and sunny flat surfaces. There was a colorful kids' section with bright wallpaper and a rainbow of floor cushions. Quiet instrumental music murmured from hidden speakers. 
It felt more like a high-end spa than a public library. I approved. Behind the long, low circulation desk was a woman who caught the eye. Tan skin, red lipstick, long, sleek blonde hair streaked with a warm, purpley pink. The frames of her glasses were blue and a tiny stud winked in her nose. The only thing that screamed librarian about her was the large stack of hardbacks she carried. Hey, Way, she called. You got a line already upstairs. Thanks, Sloan. You have a line for what? I asked. Nothing, my niece mumbled. Tech support, the attractive and surprisingly loud librarian announced. We get a lot of older folks who don't have access to their own 11-year-olds to fix their phones and Kindles and tablets. I recalled Liza's comment at dinner the night before, which made me recall Knox and his penis this morning. Whoops. The computers are over there next to the coffee bar in the restrooms, Aunt Naomi. I'll be on the second floor if you need anything. Coffee bar? I parroted, trying not to think of my nearly naked next-door neighbor. But my charge was already striding purposefully past the book stacks toward an open staircase in the back. The librarian tossed me a curious look as she shelled a Stephen King novel. You're not Tina, she said. How'd you know? I've never seen Tina so much as drop Waylay off here, let alone willingly cross the threshold. Tina's my sister, I explained. I gathered that from the whole you look almost exactly alike thing. How long have you been in town? I can't believe there hasn't been a trail of hot gossip blazed to my doorstep. I got in yesterday. Ah, my day off. I knew I shouldn't have buried myself in my fourth rewatch of Ted Lasso, she complained to no one. Anyway, I'm Sloane. She juggled novels in order to hold out a hand. I shook it tentatively, not wanting to dislodge the 20 pounds of literature she still held. Naomi. Welcome to knock em out, Naomi. Your niece is a godsend. It was nice hearing good things about the Witt family around here for a change. Thank you. We're, uh, just getting to know each other, but she seems smart and independent. And hopefully not too damaged. Want to see her in action? Sloan offered. I want it even more than a visit to your coffee bar. Sloan's ruby red lips curved. Follow me. I followed Sloan up the open staircase to the second floor, which housed even more book stacks, more seating, more plants, and a few private rooms off to one side. In the back was another long, low desk under a hanging sign that said Community. Waylay sat on a stool behind the desk, frowning at an electronic device. The device's owner, an elderly black man in a crisp button-down and trousers, leaned on the counter. That's Hinkle McCord. He's 101 years old and reads two books a week. He keeps messing with the settings on his e-reader, Sloan explained. I swear it's the damn great grandkids. Those sticky-fingered little punks see an electronic device and they go after it like kids went after sticks and candy in my day, Hinkle complained. She started coming in here a couple times a week after she and her sister moved here. One afternoon, some virus software update was giving the entire system shit, and Waylay got tired of listening to me yell at the computer. She popped behind the desk and voila! Sloan wiggled her fingers in the air. Fix the whole damn thing in less than five minutes. So I asked her if she minded helping out a few other folks. I pay her in snacks and letting her check out double the number of books everyone else is allowed. She's a great kid. I suddenly just wanted to sit down and cry. Apparently my face telegraphed just that. Uh-oh. You okay? Sloan asked, looking concerned. I nodded, willing away the damp from my eyes. I'm just so happy, I managed to choke out. Oh boy, how about a nice box of tissues and an espresso, she suggested, guiding me away from a group of senior citizens settled around a table. Belinda, I have the latest Kennedy Ryan novel you were asking for. A woman with a puff of white hair and a large crucifix nearly buried in her impressive cleavage clapped her hands. 
<laughs> Sloane, you are my favorite human being. That's what they all say, she said with a wink. Did you say espresso? I whimpered. Sloane nodded. We have really good coffee here, she promised. Will you marry me? She grinned and her nose studs sparkled. I'm mostly into men these days. There was that one time in college. She guided me into an annex with four computers and a U-shaped counter. There was a sink, dishwasher, and a small refrigerator with a sign that said, Free Water. Coffee mugs hung from cute hooks. Sloan headed directly for the coffee maker and got to work. You look like at least a double, she observed. I wouldn't say no to a triple. I knew I liked you. Have a seat. I planted myself at one of the computers and tried to compose myself. I've never seen a library like this, I said, desperate to make small talk that wouldn't render me an emotional lump of feelings. Sloan flashed a smile at me. That's what I like to hear. When I was a kid, the local library was my sanctuary. It wasn't until I got older that I realized that it still wasn't accessible to everyone. So I went to school for library science and public administration, and here we are. She set a cup in front of me and returned to the machine. It's all about community. We've got free classes on everything from sex education and budgeting to meditation and meal prepping. We don't have a huge homeless population here, but we've got locker rooms and a small laundry facility in the basement. I'm working on free after-school programs to help families who can't swing the cost of daycare. And of course, there's the books. Her face went soft and dreamy. Wow. I picked up my coffee, sipped, then said wow again. A soft chime sounded over the music. That's the bat signal. Gotta go she said. Enjoy your coffee, and good luck with your feelings. Naomi Witt, checking account balance. Overdrawn. Suspected fraud. Dear Mom and Dad, I'm alive, safe, and completely sane, I swear. I'm so sorry I left like that. I know it was uncharacteristic, Things just weren't working out with Warner, and I'll explain some other time when you're not sailing off to paradise. In the meantime, have a wonderful time, and I forbid you from worrying about me. I stopped in a charming little town in Virginia and am enjoying the volume the humidity gives my hair. Soak up some sun and send me proof of life pictures every day. Love, Naomi. P.S. I almost forgot. There was a teensy accident with my phone, and unfortunately, it didn't survive. Email is the best way to communicate for now. Love you lots. Don't worry about me. Dear Steph, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please don't hate me. We need to talk soon, but not on my phone since I ran over it at a rest stop in Pennsylvania. Funny story. You'd think me running out on the wedding was the big news. You looked great, by the way. But the bigger whammy is my sister called me out of the blue, robbed me, and left me with a niece I didn't know existed. Her name is Waylay. She's an 11-year-old tech genius, and underneath the board facade might be a girly girl. I need reassurances that I'm not adding to her trauma. I'm trying to be the cool yet responsible aunt in this place called knock em out where the men are unreasonably attractive and the coffee is excellent. I'll be in touch as soon as I get my bearings. There was an incident with my car and my checking account. Oh, and my laptop. I'm still sorry. Please don't hate me. Kisses, N. Tina. This is the last email address I have for you. Where the hell are you? How could you leave Waylay? Where's my freaking car? Get your ass back here. Are you in trouble? Naomi. Kinship Guardian to-do list. Complete guardianship application plus background check. Participate in three face-to-face -face interviews with applicant. Provide three character references, experience with children and caretaking, home study, dispositional hearing with family court. 
10. Haircuts and pains in the ass. Knox. I was in a shit mood after a shit night's sleep, both of which I blamed on Naomi Flowers in her fucking hair, wit. After spending half the night tossing and turning, I'd woken up for Waylon's first AM bathroom break with a raging heart on, thanks to a dream featuring my new next-door neighbor's smart mouth sliding down my cock. The kind of noises that men fantasize about coming out of her throat. It was the second night of sleep she'd ruined for me, and if I didn't get my head out of my ass, it wouldn't be the last. Beside me in the passenger seat, Waylon expressed his own exhaustion with a loud yawn. You and me both, bud, I said, pulling into a parking space and staring at the storefront. The color scheme, navy with maroon trim, shouldn't have worked. It had sounded stupid when Jeremiah suggested it, but somehow it classed up the brick and made Whiskey Clipper stand out on the block. It was wedged between a tattoo parlor that changed hands more often than poker chips and the neon orange awning of Dino's Pizza and Subs. They didn't open until 11, but I could already smell the garlic and pizza sauce. Until a few years ago, the barbershop had been a crumbling institution in Knock 'em Out. With a little vision from my partner, Jeremiah, and a lot of capital from me, we'd managed to drag Whiskey Clipper into the 21st century and turn it into a small town gold mine. Now a trendy salon, the shop didn't just serve old men born and raised here. It attracted a clientele that was willing to brave the Nova traffic from as far away as downtown DC for the service and the vibe. On a yawn of my own, I helped my dog out of the truck and we headed for the front door. The inside was as eye-catching as the outside. The bones of the space were exposed brick, tin ceiling, and stained concrete. We'd added leather and wood and denim. Next to the industrial-looking reception desk was a bar with glass shelves housing nearly a dozen whiskey bottles. We also served coffee and wine. The walls were decorated with framed black and white prints, most highlighting knock em out storied history. Beyond the leather couches in the reception area, there were four hair stations with large round mirrors. Along the back wall were the restroom, the shampoo sinks, and the dryers. Morning, boss. You're here early. Stasia, short for Anastasia, had Browder Klein's head in one of the sinks. I grunted and went straight for the coffee pot next to the whiskey. Waylon climbed up on the couch next to a woman enjoying a coffee in Bailey's. Stasia's teenage son, Ricky, swiveled back and forth rhythmically in the reception chair. Between booking appointments and cashing out clients, he played a stupid-looking game on his phone. Jeremiah, my business partner and longtime friend, looked up from the temple fade he was doing on a client in a suit and $400 shoes. You look like shit, he observed. Jeremiah wore his thick, dark hair rebelliously long, but kept his face clean-shaven. He had a sleeve tattoo and a Rolex. He got a manicure every two weeks and spent his days off tinkering with the dirt bikes he occasionally raced. He dated both men and women a fact that his parents were fine with, but which his Lebanese grandmother still prayed over every Sunday at Mass. Thanks, asshole. Nice to see you, too. Sit, he said, pointing with the clippers at the empty station next to him. I don't have time for your judgmental grooming. I had shit to do, paperwork to be inconvenienced by, women to not think about. And I don't have time for you to bring down our vibe looking like you couldn't even be bothered to run a comb and some balm through that beard. Defensively, I stroked a hand over my beard. No one cares what I look like. We care, the woman with the Baileys and coffee called. Amen, Louise, Stasia called back, shooting me one of her mom looks. Browder got to his feet and clapped a hand on my back. You look tired. Got some bags under those eyes. 
woman trouble? Heard you went a few rounds with Natina, Stasia said innocently as she ushered Browder to her chair. The one thing Stasia and Jeremiah loved more than good hair was good gossip. Not Tina. Great. Name's Naomi. Ooh, came the obnoxious chorus. I hate you guys. No, you don't, Jeremiah assured me with a grin as he finished the fade. Fuck off. Don't forget, you've got to cut at two and a staff meeting at three, Stasia called after me. I swore under my breath and headed to my lair. I handled the business end, so my client roster was smaller than Jeremiah's or Anastasia's. I'd have thought that by now, most of my clients would have been scared off by my excessive scowling and lack of small talk. But it turned out, some people liked having an asshole cut their hair. Going to my office, I said, and heard the thud of Wayland's body hitting the floor and the tip-tap of his nails on the floor following me. I'd already owned Honky Tonk when this building went up for sale. I bought it out from under some shiny loafer developer out of Baltimore who wanted to put in a chain sports bar and a fucking Pilates studio. Now the building was home to my bar, the barbershop, and three killer apartments on the second floor, one of which was rented by my jackass brother. I headed past the restroom and the tiny staff kitchen to the door marked employees only. Inside was a supply room lined with shelving units and all the shit required to run a successful salon. On the back wall was an unmarked door. Waylon caught up to me as I fished out my keys. He was the only one allowed in my inner sanctum. I wasn't one of those my door is always open bosses. If I needed to meet with staff, I used my business manager's office or the break room. I headed into the narrow hallway that connected the salon to the bar and punched the code into the keypad on my office door. Wayland bolted inside the second it opened. The space was small and utilitarian, with brick walls and exposed ducting in the ceiling. There was a couch, a small fridge, and a desk that held a state-of-the-art computer with two monitors the size of scoreboards. Over a dozen framed photos on the walls depicted a haphazard collage of my life. There was Waylon as a puppy, tripping over his long ears. Me and Nash, shirtless, gap-toothed kids on mountain bikes and one. Men on the backs of motorcycles, adventure stretching out before us on the ribbon of open road in another. We two became three with the addition of Lucian Rollins. There, on the wall no one else saw, was a photographic timeline of us growing up as brothers. Bloody noses, long days in the creek, then graduating to cars and girls and football. Bonfires and Friday night football games. Graduations, vacations, ribbon cuttings. Jesus, we were getting old. Time marched on. And for the first time, I felt a niggle of guilt that Nash and I no longer had each other's backs. But it was just another example of how relationships didn't last forever. My gaze lingered on one of the smaller frames. The color was duller than the rest. My parents bundled up in a tent. Mom grinning at the camera, pregnant with one of us. Dad looking at her like he'd waited his whole life for her. Both excited for the adventure of a lifetime together. It wasn't there for nostalgia. It served as a reminder that no matter how good things were in the moment, they were bound to get worse until that once bright, shiny future was unrecognizable. Wayland deflated on a sigh, pancaking onto his bed. You and me both, I told him. I dropped into the chair behind the desk and fired up my computer, ready to rule my empire. Social media ad campaigns for Whiskey Clipper and Honky Tonk topped my list of things to do today. I'd been avoiding them long enough because they annoyed me. Growth disguised as change was, unfortunately, a necessary evil. Perversely, I shuffled the ads to the bottom of my stack and tackled the schedule at Honky Tonk for the next two weeks. There was a hole. I rubbed the back of my neck and dialed Fee. What's up, boss? She asked. Someone grunted obscenely next to her. Where are you? 
Family jujitsu? I just threw Roger over my shoulder and he's looking for his kidneys. Fee's family was a shaken cocktail of weird, but they all seemed to like life better that way. My condolences to Roger's kidneys. Why is there a hole in the server schedule? Chrissy quit last week, remember? I vaguely remembered a server with a face and hair scurrying out of my way every time I stepped out of my office. Why'd she quit? You scared the shit out of her, called her a tray-dropping gold digger, and told her to give up on marrying rich because even rich guys want their beers cold. It rang a bell, vaguely. I grunted. <laughs> so who's replacing her? I already hired a new girl. She starts tonight. Does she have experience, or is this another crystal? Chrissy, Fee corrected. And unless you want to start doing your own hiring, I suggest you gracefully back down and tell me I've been doing a kick-ass job and you trust my instincts. I yanked the phone away from my ear when Fee let out an ear-splitting, Hee-ya! You've been doing a kick-ass job and I trust your instincts, I muttered. That's a good boy. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to put my son on his ass in front of his crush. Try not to splatter too much blood. It's a bitch to clean up. Waylon let out a snore from the floor. I penciled in New Girl on the empty shifts and jumped into some vendor payments and other bullshit paperwork. Both Whiskey Clipper and Honky Tonk were showing consistent growth, and two of the three apartments rented for additional income. I was pleased with the numbers. It meant that I'd managed to do the impossible and turn dumb luck into an actual solid future. Between the businesses and my investments, I'd taken a windfall and built upon it. It was a good feeling even after a sleepless night. With nothing left to do, I reluctantly called up Facebook. Advertising was one kind of evil, but advertising that required you to have a social media presence that opened you up to millions of pain-in-the-ass strangers that was straight-up bullshit. I bet Naomi was on Facebook. She probably liked it, too. My fingers casually typed Naomi Witt into the search bar before the sane, rational part of me could hit the brakes. Huh. Waylon lifted his head quizzically. Just checking on our neighbor, making sure she's not into Amway sales or running a long con as a pretend twin, I told him. Satisfied that I would save him from whatever threats social media held, Waylon fell back to sleep with a rumbling snore. The woman obviously had never heard of privacy settings. There was a lot of her to get to know on social media. Pictures from work, vacations, family holidays. All without Tina, I noted. She ran 5Ks for good causes and raised funds for neighbors' vet bills and she lived in a nice-looking house at least twice the size of the cottage. She went to high school and college reunions and looked damn good doing it. Throwback pictures proved my theory that she'd been a cheerleader, and someone on the yearbook committee had been a fan since it seemed like her entire senior year had been dedicated to her. I blinked at the handful of pictures of Naomi and Tina. The twin thing was undeniable. So was the fact that, beneath the surface, they were very different women. I was already invested. There was no pulling me out of the online stocking rabbit hole, especially not when the only other things I had to do were boring. So I dug further. Tina Witt fell off the digital plane of existence after high school graduation. She didn't smile in her cap and gown. Certainly not next to young, fresh Naomi with her honor cords. She'd already had an arrest record by then. Yet there was Naomi, an arm around her sister's waist beaming wide enough for the two of them. I was willing to bet money that she'd done what she could to be the good one. To be the low-maintenance kid. The one who didn't cause their parents sleepless nights. I wondered how much living she'd missed out on wasting all that time being good. I followed the Tina line a little deeper, discovering a trail on Pennsylvania District Magistrate court cases and then again in New Jersey and Maryland. 
DUIs, possession, skipping out on rent. She'd done time about 12 years ago. Not much, but enough to have made a point. Enough to have her becoming a mother less than a year later and steering clear of the cops. I went back to Naomi's Facebook and stopped on a family picture from her teenage years. Tina scowling, with her arms crossed next to her sister as their parents beamed behind them. I didn't know what went on behind closed doors, but I did know that sometimes a bad seed was just a bad seed. No matter what field it was planted in, no matter how it was tended, some just came up rotten. A glance at the clock reminded me I only had a little time before my two o'clock, which meant I should get back to the ad campaigns. But unlike Naomi, I didn't like worrying about what I should do. I typed her name into a search engine and had immediate regrets. Warner Dennison III and Naomi Witt announced their engagement. This Dennison guy looked like the kind of asshole who hung out on golf courses and always had a story to top everyone else's. Sure, he was vice president of whatever, but it was at a company with his last name on it. I doubted that he'd earned his fancy title. Judging from her face this morning, this Warner suit had never taken a piss in the great outdoors. Naomi looked heart-stoppingly gorgeous, not to mention happy in the formal photo, which for some stupid reason annoyed me. What did I care if she was into men who ironed their pants? My next-door neighbor was no longer any of my damn business. I'd found her and way a place to stay. Anything that happened from here on out was her own problem. I closed out of the window on my screen. Naomi Witt no longer existed to me. I felt good about that. My phone buzzed on the desk and Waylon's head popped up. Yeah, I answered. Vernon's here. Want me to get him started? Jeremiah offered. Get him a whiskey. I'm on my way out. Will do. There he is. Vernon Quigg called when I returned to the shop. The retired Marine was six feet tall, 70 years old, and the proud owner of an impeccable walrus mustache. I was the only person allowed near the stash with scissors. It was both an honor and an annoyance, seeing as how the man loved nothing more than fresh gossip. Afternoon, Vernon, I said, clipping the cape around his neck. Heard about you and not Tina throwing down on Cafe Rev yesterday, he said gleefully. Sounds like those twins are carbon copies of each other. I heard that she's the complete opposite of her sister, Stasia said, plopping down in the empty chair next to my station. I reached for my comb and gritted my teeth. I heard there's a warrant out for Tina and not Tina helped her escape, said Doris Bacon, owner of Bacon Stables, a farm with a reputation for turning out champion horse flesh. Fuck me. 11. Boss from Hell Naomi I accepted the leather and denim apron Sherry Fee Fiasco handed me and tied it around my waist. Shirt looks good, Sherry said, giving my honky-tonk v-neck an approving nod. Thanks, I said and tugged nervously at the hem. The shirt was tight and showed more cleavage than I was used to accentuating. But, per my research at the library, ladies with their girls showing tended to make higher tips. Honky Tonk felt like a country bar that had a brief but satisfying affair with a glitzy speakeasy. I liked the fancy cowboy vibe. This here's Maxine and she'll be training you on the POS, Fee said plucking the lollipop out of her mouth. It's also how you clock in and out and order your own meals. Here's your pin number. She handed over a sticky note with 6969 scrawled across it in Sharpie. Nice. Hi, I said to Maxine. She had dark skin dusted with glitter over her enviable cheekbones and modest cleavage. Her hair was cut short and left to curl tightly in tiny magenta coils. Call me Max, she insisted. You ever sling drinks before? I shook my head. I worked in HR until two days ago. 
I gave her points for not rolling her eyes at me. I wouldn't want to train me either. But I learned fast, I assured her. Well, you're going to have to since we're shorthanded tonight, so unless you suck, I'll be pushing you out of the nest early. I'll do my best not to suck, I promised. You do that. We'll start with the drinks for my eight top. We've got two drafts of bud, Maxine began, fingers flying over the screen. Her glittery nails hypnotized me with their speed. I was nervous, but highly motivated. My bank had told me it would take up to a week for me to receive my replacement debit and credit cards, and Waylay had already polished off the entire box of Pop-Tarts. If I wanted to keep my niece in groceries, I was going to have to be the best damn server this town had ever seen. Then you hit send, and the printer at the bar spits out the order. Same for food, only it goes straight to the kitchen, Max explained. Got it. Great, here's the next one. Your turn. I only fumbled twice and earned a good enough nod from my trainer. Let's get those tips flowing. I hope your feet are prepared, Maxine said with a quick grin. I blew out a breath and followed her into the crowd. My feet hurt. I was hours behind on my water intake, and I was really tired of explaining that I wasn't Tina, especially since that seemed to have earned me the nickname Not Tina. Silver, the bartender, said something that I missed as I wearily unloaded glasses at the service bar. What? I yelled over the music. Hanging in there, she repeated, louder this time. I think so. Max had given me two tables of understanding regulars to handle on my own, and so far no one besides me was wearing beer or complaining about how long it took to get their brisket nachos, so I felt like I was doing an adequate job. I felt like I'd walked ten miles just going between the bar and the tables. Most of the patrons seemed like regulars. They knew each other's names and drink orders and razzed each other over sports rivalries. The kitchen staff was nice enough, and while Silver wasn't exactly friendly, she was a pro pulling pints with both hands while taking a to-go order over the phone. I admired her efficiency. I'd just dropped off a fresh round of drinks when I realized I'd spent the last few hours not thinking about, well, anything. I hadn't had time to worry about waylay at Liza's or about the four emails from Warner I hadn't opened, and the small roll of cash in my apron made me forget all about my thieving sister and my overdrawn accounts. I also hadn't given my hot, grumpy, urinating neighbor a passing thought. That's when I lost my focus and walked smack into a solid wall of chest under a black t-shirt. Pardon me, I said, slapping a hand to the muscly obstacle to stay upright. What the fuck are you doing? Not again. Are you kidding me? I squeaked, looking up to find Knox scowling at me. What are you doing here, Naomi? I'm checking Santa's naughty list. What does it look like I'm doing? I'm working. Now get out of my way or I'll hit you with my tray, and I've had a lot of espresso today. I could get you on the floor in three or four whacks. He didn't respond verbally, probably because he was too busy taking me by the arm and dragging me out into the hallway. He stormed past the restrooms and the kitchen door and opened the next door with a well-placed boot. Evening, Knox, Fee said, without looking up from her monitors. What the fuck is this? He snapped. Sherry spared him a glance. This, she repeated blandly. He pulled me farther into the room. This, he said again. This is Naomi, a human person who was halfway into her first shift, Sherry said, going back to her monitors. Don't want her working here, Fee. I'd had enough of the pissed off at the world in general and me in particular routine. I yanked my arm free and whacked him in the chest with my tray. Sherry looked up again, her mouth falling open. I don't care if you don't want me working here, Viking. Fee hired me. I'm here. Now, unless you have a reason for detaining me at a job I desperately need, you blonde Oscar the Grouch, I suggest you take up your hiring concerns with this establishment's management. I am this establishment's management, he snarled. Great. Of course he was management. I'd hit my new boss with a tray. 
I wouldn't have taken this job if I'd known you managed this place. I bit out. Now you know. Get out. Knox. Sherry sighed wearily. We need a replacement for the server you scared off with all your scowling and Oscar the Grouching. He pointed a threatening finger in her direction. I'm not letting you make that a thing. Call what's-her-name and get her to unquit. Sherry leaned back and crossed her arms. If you can tell me her name, I'll call her up right now. Knox muttered a curse. That's what I thought, she said smugly. Now, who makes the hiring decisions around here? I don't give a shit if it's the damn Pope, he growled. She's not working here. I don't want her around. Deciding I had nothing to lose, I hit him again with the tray. Listen, Viking, I don't know what your problem is with me. Whatever narcissistic, delusional roller coaster you're on, I'm not here to ruin your life. I'm trying to earn back some of the money my sister stole from me, and until the bank unfreezes my account, I'm not letting you or anyone else stand in the way of Waylay's Pop Tarts. Unless you want to take her tables for her, boss. I'm siding with Naomi, Sherry said. Knox's eyes glowed with icy fire. Fuck. Fine. One shift. You make one mistake, get one complaint, and your ass is gone. Your magnanimity won't be forgotten. I've got tables waiting. One mistake, he called after me. I flipped him off over my shoulder and stormed into the hall. Get rid of her, Fee. I'm not working with some uppity, needy pain in the ass. His words carried to me outside the door. My cheeks flamed. An uppity, needy pain in the ass. So that's what the gorgeous, bad-tempered Knox Morgan saw when he looked at me. I kept it together, pushing all thoughts of my stupid boss out of my mind and putting my full attention into getting the right drinks to the right people, bussing tables for turnover, and being helpful wherever I could. I squeezed in the shortest dinner break in the history of dinner breaks, sneaking a pit stop at the bathroom and a few bites of a spectacularly good grilled chicken salad from Milford in the kitchen. Then made a beeline for the bar, where Silver was pouring a stream of liquor into a cocktail shaker with one hand and opening a beer bottle with the other. Her hair was buzzed short, leaving nothing to distract from the dramatic smoky eye makeup and tiny eyebrow ring. The sleeves of her black blazer were rolled up, and she wore a striped tie loose over a honky-tonk tank. She was androgynously attractive in a way that made me feel like an eighth grader with a crush on the cool girl. Silver, do you mind if I use the phone to check in with my babysitter? I asked over the thump of the music. She jerked her head toward the phone between the two tap systems, and I took that as approval. I checked my watch and dialed the cottage's number. Liza answered on the third ring. We ordered pizza instead of eating that mound of veggies you left us, she said over the blare of the TV on her end. Are those gunshots? I asked, plugging my ear with a finger so I could hear her over the musical stylings of country singer Mickey Guyton on my end. Can you believe she's never seen the usual suspects? Liza scoffed. Liza, relax. We're just shooting real guns in the house, not watching R-rated movies. Liza, you're right. Your aunt really is wound tighter than a necktie on Friday, Liza said, presumably to my big-mouthed niece. Everything's fine. Way helped me in the garden, we ate pizza, and now we're watching a PG-13 edited for TV action movie. Sylvester Stallone just called someone a poop head. I sighed. Ugh, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. Kind of nice to have company for once. When's your next shift? I bit my lip. I'm not sure. This might be a one and done. My new boss doesn't seem to like me. She laughed softly. <laughs> Give him time. I realized my babysitting fairy godmother had predicted this and wondered what she knew that I didn't. This ain't social hour. Get your ass off the phone, Daisy. 
I gritted my teeth at Knox's interruption. Your grandson says hi. Liza chuckled. Tell him to kiss my ass and to pick up a rotisserie chicken for me tomorrow. I'll see you when you get home, she said. Thanks again. I owe you. Bye. I turned and found Knox looming over me like a sexy turkey vulture. Your grandmother says kiss her ass and bring her a rotisserie chicken. Why are you on the phone with my grandma on your first and last bar shift? Because she's watching my 11-year-old niece so I can earn money for groceries and back-to-school clothes, you uncharitable oaf! Figures, he muttered. Lay off, Knox, Silver said as she shook two cocktail shakers at once. You know being a dick costs you in turnover. I want this one to turn over, he insisted. Why don't you hide in the kitchen and text like everyone else? Because I don't have a cell phone. I reminded him. Who in the fuck doesn't have a cell phone? Someone who lost hers in a tragic rest stop accident, I shot back. I'd love to continue this stimulating conversation, but I need to help Max turn over some tables. You tell him not, Tina, Hinkle McCord crowed from his bar stool. Knox looked like he was going to pick him up and hurl him through the door. I took a cleansing breath and did what I did best. Stuffed all of my feelings into a little box with a tight lid. Is there something you need before I go back to work? His eyes narrowed at my polite tone. We stared each other down until we were interrupted. There she is! A familiar voice boomed over the din. Justice! My cafe-owning future husband had his arm around a beautiful woman. I brought the wife so she could meet my fiancé. Justice joked. Wait till Muriel hears about this, <laughs> Hinkle cackled, whipping out his phone. I'm Tallulah, she said, leaning over the bar to offer her hand. Hubs told me all about your first day in town. She was tall, with a cascade of long braids down her back. She was wearing a St. John Garage t-shirt, jeans, and cowboy boots. Somehow I missed your first time in the cafe. Heard it was quite a show. This one hasn't been half bad either, Hinkle interjected. It's nice to meet you, Tallulah, I said. I'm sorry for proposing to your husband, but the man makes coffee that angels sing about. Don't I know it, she agreed. There's your section. We're here to patronize you, Justice said. Knox rolled his eyes. Don't mind him, Silver said, elbowing the boss out of the way. He's just pissy because Nay hasn't screwed up yet. I wanted to kiss her for giving me a nickname other than not Tina. He gave me one shift and no mistakes, I explained, not caring that he was standing behind me. Knox Morgan, Tallulah chided. That's not how we welcome new knockamouts. Where's your sense of community? Go away, Tally, Knox grumbled, but there was no heat to it. Naomi, I'll have your darkest, strongest beer, Tallulah said. And the hubs here will have a pina colada with whipped cream. Justice rubbed his palms together in anticipation. And we'll split an order of the pulled pork flatbread. Extra jalapenos. No sour cream, Tallulah interjected. You got it, I said with a wink. Have a seat, and I'll bring your drinks right out. You gonna write that down? Knox asked as the couple wove their way through the crowd. I flipped my hair over my shoulder. Nope. He looked at his watch and smirked. <laughs> you won't even make it to the end of the shift at this rate. I'll be happy to prove you wrong. In that case, you just got yourself another table. He pointed to a rowdy table in the corner where an older man with a pot belly and a cowboy hat appeared to be holding court. Don't do that to her on her first night, Noxie, Max chided him. If she's so confident she can handle it, no use letting her wait around in the kiddie pool. Gotta throw her in the deep end. There's a difference between sink or swim when you introduce sharks, Silver argued. 12. A Ride Home Knox
I had paperwork to do, but I was more interested in the impending crash and burn of my newest employee. Naomi strutted her high-class ass right on up to the table like an idealistic kindergarten teacher on her first day. I hated Wiley Ogden for good reason, but I didn't mind using him to prove my point. She didn't belong here, and if I had to prove that by dangling her in front of a wolf, then so be it. Wiley's squinty little eyes zeroed in on her, and his tongue darted out between his lips. He knew the rules. Knew I wouldn't hesitate to toss his ass out of here if he so much as touched one of my employees, but that didn't stop him from being a creepy old man. What's your problem with not Tina? Silver asked, punching the button on the blender and pouring vodka into three rocks glasses. I didn't reply. Answering questions only encouraged conversations. I watched as Wiley lavished Naomi with his pervy brand of attention without feeling the least bit guilty. She wasn't my type on any plane of existence. Hell, even in jeans and a honky-tonk t-shirt, she still looked high class and high maintenance. She wouldn't settle for a few nights between the sheets. She was the kind of woman with expectations, with long-term plans, with honey-do lists and would-you-minds and can-you-pleases. Normally, I could ignore an attraction to a woman who wasn't my type. Maybe I needed a break. It had been a while since I'd taken a few days off, had some fun, gotten laid. I did the math, winced. It had been more than a while. That's what I needed. A few days away. Maybe I'd hit the beach, read a few fucking novels, drink a few beers out of someone else's inventory. Find a good lay with no strings or expectations. I ignored the knee-jerk, meh. After hitting 40, I'd noticed an alarming ambivalence when it came to the hunt. Laziness, most likely. The hunt, the narrowing of the field, the flirtation. What had once been entertaining started to seem like a lot of work for just a night or two. But I'd work up the energy, work off the sexual frustration. Then I could come back here and not feel compelled to jerk off every time I saw Naomi Witt. Matter settled, I poured myself a water from the soda gun and watched Naomi try to leave the table only to be stopped by Wiley. The fucker actually grabbed her by the wrist. Oh shit, Silver said under her breath as I came off the bar stool. God damn it, I muttered as I made my way across the bar. Now, don't you dally, Naomi, Wiley was saying. The boys and I sure like looking at your face. Among other things, one of his idiotic friends said, sending the table into spasms of laughter. I'd expected her to be clawing her way free, but Naomi was smiling. I knew you boys were going to be trouble, she teased lightly. They're a problem, I snapped. Wiley's hand fell away from Naomi's wrist, and I didn't miss the fact that she immediately took a step back. Problem, Wiley said. I don't see no problem. Wiley and his friends were introducing themselves, Naomi said. I'll be right back with your drinks. With a parting glare in my direction, she sauntered back to the bar. I stepped into Wiley's line of sight, ruining his view of her departing ass. You know the rules, Ogden. Boy, I was running this town when you were nothing but a spark in your daddy's eyes. Don't run shit now, do you? I said. But this place, this is mine. And if you want to be able to drink here, you'll keep your goddamn hands to yourself. I don't appreciate the insinuations, boy. And I don't appreciate having to serve your crooked ass. Guess we're even. I left him and his cronies and went in search of Naomi. I found her at the POS by the bar. Chewing on her lower lip, she didn't bother glancing up from the screen where she carefully entered an order. From the sex on the beach and flaming orgasm, I guessed it was Wiley's table of morons. You hit me with a fucking tray for talking shit, but you let that sweaty asshole put his hand on you? 
I don't have time to point out the fact that you told me if I upset one table, you were firing me, so you'll have to settle for this, she said, holding up her middle finger in my face. Hinkle McCord and Tallulah burst out laughing. Y'all aren't getting dinner in a show, I warned before turning back to Naomi. Damn it, where's the substitute button, she muttered. I reached around her and paged through the options to the right one. Having her caged between me and the screen was making my libido malfunction. To be contrary, I didn't step back while she keyed in the rest of the order. When she was finished, Naomi turned to look at me. You sent me over there on purpose knowing what would happen. I didn't react the way you wanted me to. Get over it. I sent you over there so you'd be creeped out by Wiley, not so he could put his fucking hands on you. If he does it again, I want to know. She laughed, right in my face. Yeah, sure, Viking. I'll come running. Drinks up, Nay, Silver called. Gotta go, boss, Naomi said with the kind of fake bright politeness she'd used on Wiley. It made me want to punch a hole in the wall. Ten minutes later, I was still thinking about punching something when my brother strolled through the door. His gaze went directly to Naomi, who was delivering a second round of drinks to the St. John's. About a second later, he'd clocked Wiley at the table. The two exchanged a long stare before Nash headed my way. Look what the cat dragged in, Sherry crowed. My soon-to-be-fired business manager had come out of the office to watch the Naomi show. Nash dragged his eyes away from Naomi's ass and flashed her an easy grin. How's it going, Fee? he asked. Never a dull moment. You here to see the new girl? she asked, slyly, shooting me a look. Thought I'd drop in and see how Naomi's first day is going, he said. You and half the fucking town... Max said as she breezed by with a tray of drinks. She's doing great, Sherry told him, despite some headbutting with management. Nash glanced my way. Doesn't surprise me. Hi, Nash, Naomi chirped as she passed us on her way to the bar. He nodded. Naomi? Sherry elbowed me in the gut. Somebody's got a crush, she sang. I grunted. Two somebodies had a crush, and if I had anything to say about it, neither of us was going to get the girl. Pull up a stool, Chief, Silver said. Nash took her up on the offer and sat at the corner closest to the server station. On call or off for the night? Silver asked. Officially off. Beer it is, she said with a little salute. Don't you have payroll to approve? Sherry asked innocently as I hovered behind my brother. Maybe I already did it, I hedged, watching as Naomi approached Wiley's table again. I get an alert when it's been submitted, smartass. Tattletale technology. I'll get to it. Don't you have businesses to manage? Right now, I've got a man to manage. Quit being a dick to Naomi. She's good. The customers like her, the staff likes her, your brother likes her, you're the only one with a problem. My place, I get to have a problem if I want to have a problem. I sounded like a fucking toddler denied a cookie. Sherry slapped a hand to my cheek and squeezed, hard. Boss, you're a perpetual ass, but this isn't like you. You never paid attention to new hires before. Why start now? Naomi breezed by again, and it pissed me off that I watched her every step of the way. Come here often? Naomi asked, giving my brother a full wattage smile as she trayed up another round of drinks. Thought I'd drop by and give you the good news. What good news? she asked, looking hopeful. I cleared up your little Grand Theft Auto misunderstanding. You would have thought my brother had just whipped out a solid gold 10-inch dick with the way Naomi flew into him and wrapped him in a hug. Thank you, thank you, thank you, she chanted. No manhandling the customers, I snarled. She rolled her eyes at me and gave Nash a peck on the cheek that made me want to set my own brother on fire. 
Also figured I'd see if you wanted to lift home after your shift, he offered. Fuck me. She didn't have a car. She probably rode her goddamn bike here and planned to ride it home after closing. In the dark. Over my dead fucking body. That is so sweet of you to offer, Naomi said. Not necessary, I said, butting into the conversation. She's already got a ride. Sherry will take her. Sorry, Knox, I'm off in ten, my business manager said smugly. Then so she. I can't close out my tables and do my side work in ten minutes, Naomi argued. Max is showing me how to close in case you don't fire me after tonight. Fine, then I'm driving you home. I'm sure you have better things to do than to drive a needy pain in the ass home. Burn, Fee whispered gleefully. I'm driving you home. Law and order lives right upstairs. You're out of his way. It'd be an inconvenience to him to haul your ass home. I knew I'd push the right button when Naomi's smile faltered. I don't mind, Nash insisted. But Naomi shook her head. As much as it pains me to admit your brother is right, it'll be late and I'm out of your way. Nash opened his mouth, but I cut him off. I'm driving her. I could probably keep my mouth shut and my hands off her for the five-minute drive. In that case, you got a minute? He asked Naomi. You can have her for ten minutes, Max said, pushing Naomi at my brother. She laughed and held up a hand. Actually, I have tables I need to get to. Do you need something, Nash? He glanced my way. DC cops found your car today, he said. Her face lit up. That's great news. Nash winced and shook his head. Sorry, honey, it's not. They found it at a chop shop in pieces. Naomi's shoulders slumped. What about Tina? No sign of her. She looked even more dejected, and I was just about to order her to quit worrying when Nash reached out and tipped her chin up. Don't let this get you down, honey. You're a knock -em out We take care of our own. Once my handsy fucking brother and Wiley Ogden left, I locked myself in my office and focused on paperwork rather than watching Daisy bravely smile her way into the hearts of knock -em out Business was good, and I knew how important staff was to that bottom line. But Jesus, working with Naomi day in and day out, how long would it take before she'd spout off something smart and I'd pin her to a wall and kiss her just to shut her up? I kept an eye on the security monitor while I worked my way through the list of stuff Fee needed me to do. Payroll submitted, liquor order finalized, emails returned, and I'd finally gotten around to working on the ads. It was midnight, closing time, and I was beyond ready to call it a night. Come on, Waylon, I called. The dog bounded out of his bed. We found the bar empty of patrons. Decent night tonight, Silver called from the register where she was scanning the day's report. How decent, I asked, doing my best to ignore Naomi and Max as they rolled utensils into napkins and laughed about something. Waylon charged over to them to demand affection. Good enough for shots, Silver said. Did someone say shots, Max called. I had a deal with the staff. Every time we beat the previous week's sales, the entire shift earned shots. She slid the report across the bar to me, and I flipped to the bottom line. Damn, it had been a good night. Maybe the new girls are lucky charm, she said. Nothing about her is lucky, I insisted. You still owe us, I sighed. Fine, line them up, tear them on them. I glanced over my shoulder. Let's go, ladies. Naomi cocked her head, but Max jumped out of her seat. I knew it was a good night. Fat tips, too. Come on, she said, pulling Naomi to her feet. I didn't miss the wince as Naomi stood. She obviously wasn't used to being on her feet for hours at a time. But I respected her for stubbornly trying to hide her discomfort on the way to the bar. 
Waylon followed on her heels like a lovesick idiot. Boss called tequila, Silver said, producing the bottle. Max whistled and drummed the bar. Tequila? Naomi repeated on a yawn. Tradition, Silver explained. Gotta celebrate the wins. One more, I said before Silver started to pour. Her eyebrows winged up as she produced another glass. Boss man is in. This is a first. Max looked surprised too. Wait, don't we need salt or lemons or hot sauce or something? Naomi asked. Silver shook her head. That's for shitty tequila. Shots poured, we held our glasses aloft. You gotta make the toast, Max said to me when it became clear no one else was going to do it. Fuck, fine. To a good night, I said. Lame, Silver said. I rolled my eyes. Shut up and drink. Cheers. We touched glass to glass and then to the wood of the bar. Naomi mimicked us, and I watched her as she knocked back her shot. I expected her to start gasping and wheezing like a sorority sister during pledge week, but those hazel eyes went wide as she looked at her empty glass. So apparently I've never had good tequila before. Welcome to Honky Tonk, Max said. Thanks. And now that my first shift is officially complete, Naomi put her glass and apron on the bar and turned to me. I quit. She headed for the door. No! Silver and Max called after her. You better do something, Silver said, pinning me with a glare. She's good. And she's trying to support a kid, Noxie. Have a heart? Max pointed out. I swore under my breath. Walk each other out, I ordered, and then went after Naomi. I found her in the parking lot next to an ancient ten-speed. You're not riding that thing home, I announced, grabbing the handlebars. Naomi let out a long sigh. You're lucky I'm too tired to pedal or fight, but I still quit. No, you don't. Handing her the apron, I hauled the bike over to my truck and put it in the bed. She limped along after me, shoulders slumped. Jesus, you look like you got trampled by a herd of horses. I'm not used to being on my feet for hours at a time. Okay, Mr. Push's paper from a comfy desk chair? I opened the passenger side door and gestured for her to get in. She winced when she climbed up. I waited until she was settled before shutting her door, then rounding the hood and sliding behind the wheel. You're not quitting, I said, just in case she hadn't heard me the first time. Oh, I'm definitely quitting. It's the only thing that got me through the shift. I plotted all night. I'd be the best damn server you ever saw, and then when you had your change of heart, I'd tell you I quit. You're unquitting. She yawned. You're just saying that so you can fire me. No, I'm not, I said grimly. You wanted me to quit, she reminded me. I quit. You win. Yay you! Yeah, well, you didn't suck. And you need the money. Your benevolence is astounding. I shook my head. Even exhausted, her vocabulary still hit high on the SAT scale. She rested her head against the seat. What are we waiting for? Making sure the girls walk out together and get in their cars. That's nice of you, she said, yawning again. I'm not a complete asshole all the time. So just with me then? Naomi asked. I feel so lucky. Cards on the table? I didn't feel like sugarcoating it. You're not my type. Are you kidding me right now? She said. Nope. You're not attracted to me, so that means you can't even be civil to me? The back door opened and we watched Max and Silver exit with the last bag of trash. They marched it to the dumpster together and high-fived after heaving it in. Max waved and Silver tossed me another salute on their way to their respective cars. I didn't say I wasn't attracted to you. I said you're not my type. She groaned. I'm definitely going to regret this, but I think you're going to have to break it down for me. 
Well, Daisy, it means my dick doesn't care that you're not my type. It's still standing up, trying to get your attention. She was quiet for a long beat. You're too much work. Come with too many complications, and you wouldn't be satisfied with just a quick fuck. I believe Knox Morgan just said he couldn't satisfy me. If only I had a phone to immortalize that statement on social media. A. You're getting a new phone immediately. It's irresponsible to go without one when you have a kid to think about. Oh, shut up. It's been a handful of days, not months. I didn't know I was going to have a kid to think about, she said. B. I could satisfy the hell out of you, I plowed on, pulling out of the parking lot. But you just want more, and that doesn't suit me. Because I'm an uppity, needy pain in the ass, she said to the darkness out her window. I didn't have a defense. I was an asshole, plain and simple. And the sooner she realized that, the farther she'd stay from me, metaphorically speaking. Naomi let out a weary sigh. You're lucky I'm too tired to slap you, jump out of this vehicle, and crawl home, she said finally. I turned on to the dirt lane that led to home. You can slap me tomorrow. Probably just make you want me more. You're a pain in my ass. You're just mad because now you have to find a new spot to pee in your yard. 13. History Lessons Naomi Weiley and I had survived nearly an entire week together. It felt like a monumental accomplishment as our lives continued to hang in limbo. There had been no contact from the court system or Child Protective Services yet. But I'd ground up zucchini and green beans into last night's meatloaf to sneak past Waylay Witt's discerning nose, just in case anyone was watching. I'd worked two more bar shifts, and the tips were starting to add up. Another financial boon was the arrival of my new credit and debit cards that I got in the mail. I hadn't gotten all of Tina's charges erased from my credit card statement, but having access to my meager savings had helped immensely. I'd had the foresight to pay the mortgage early this month in anticipation of being too deliriously happy on my honeymoon to worry about things like bills. That, plus the fact that I no longer had a car payment or insurance to cover, meant I could stretch a dollar surprisingly far. To earn that free rent, I carved out a few hours to spend at Liza's. Who's that? Waylay asked, pointing at a framed photo I'd found tucked into the back of one of the cabinets in the dining room. I looked up from my dust rag and furniture polish to look. It was a picture of an older man looking proud enough to burst with his arm around a beaming redhead in a cap and gown. Liza, who had said repeatedly she didn't like cleaning but still insisted on following us from room to room, looked at the photo like she was seeing it for the first time. She took a slow, shaky breath. That's, uh, my husband, Billy. And that's our daughter, Jayla. Waylay opened her mouth to ask another question, but I interrupted, sensing Liza didn't want to talk about more family members that hadn't been mentioned until now. There was a reason this big house had been closed up from the rest of the world, and I guessed the reason was in that picture. Have any plans this weekend, Liza? I cut in, giving Waylay a little shake of my head. She put the photo face down on the table. Plans? Ha! She scoffed. I do the same thing every damn day. Drag my ass out of bed and putter. All day, every day, inside, outside. What are you puttering on this weekend? Waylay asked. I gave her a thumbs up that Liza couldn't see. Garden needs some attention. Don't suppose either you like tomatoes? Got them coming out of my ears. Waylay and I love tomatoes, I said as my niece mimed vomiting on the floor. I'll send you home with a bushel then, Liza decided. I'll be damned. You got all the burnt, crusty stuff off the stovetop, Liza observed two hours later. She was leaning over her range while I rested on the floor, my legs stretched out in front of me. 
I was sweating, and my fingers were cramped from aggressive scrubbing, but the progress was undeniable. The mound of dishes was done and put away, and the range gleamed black on all surfaces. I'd taken all of the papers, boxes, and bags off the island and tasked Liza with sorting it all into keep-and-toss piles. The keep pile was four times the size of the toss pile, but it still counted as progress. Waylay was making her own kind of progress. As soon as she'd fixed the errant e-reader that had eaten Liza's download and a printer that had lost its Wi-Fi connection, Liza had handed over an old Blackberry I'd found in the drawer next to the sink. If Waylay could coax it back to life, Liza said I could have it. A free phone with a number none of my old contacts had? It was perfect. I'm starving! Waylay announced, throwing herself down dramatically on the now visible counter. Randy the Beagle barked as if to emphasize the direness of my niece's starvation. Kitty the Pitbull was sound asleep in the middle of the floor, her tongue lolling out onto the floor. Then let's eat, Liza said, clapping her hands. On the word eat, both dogs and my niece snapped to attention. Course I'm not cooking in here. Not with it looking showroom new, Liza added. We'll go to Dino's, my treat. Their pepperoni is the best, Waylay said, perking up. I could eat a whole pepperoni pie myself, Liza agreed, hitching up her cargo shorts. It was nice to see my niece getting comfortable with an adult, but I would have liked it better if I was the one she was sharing pepperoni preferences with. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was failing a test in a class I'd forgotten to attend all semester. I changed out of my cleaning clothes and into a sundress. Then Liza drove us into town in her old Buick that floated around corners like a Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade float. She squeezed into a parking space in front of a storefront under an orange awning. The sign in the window said Dino's Pizza. A few doors down was some kind of salon or barbershop, its brick facade painted a deep blue. An arrangement of whiskey bottles and cacti in clay pots created an eye-catching window display. When we got out, a pair of bikers strolled out of the pizza shop, headed toward two Harleys. One of them shot me a wink and a grin. That ain't Tina, Liza bellowed. I know, he called back. How's it going, not Tina? Well, at least the fact that I wasn't Tina was starting to sink in, but I wasn't very fond of the not Tina nickname. I waved awkwardly and pushed Waylay ahead of me toward the restaurant door, hoping that the not Tina thing wouldn't catch on. Liza ignored the please wait to be seated sign and shoved herself into an empty booth. Waylay marched after her while I hesitated, wanting permission. Be right with y'all, the guy behind the counter called. Relieved, I slid into the booth next to Waylay. So, what do you think of knock him out so far? Liza asked me. Oh, uh, it's very charming, I said, perusing the salads on the menu. How did the town get its name? Don't know if there's an official answer. Just that this town has always settled its differences with a good old-fashioned fight. None of this dragging things out in court, getting hoity-toity lawyers involved. Somebody does you wrong, you ring their bell, and then you're square. Simple. Quick. That's not how everyone solves problems, I told Waylay sternly. I don't know. It's awful satisfying punching someone in the face, my niece mused. You ever try it? Physical violence is never the answer, I insisted. Maybe she's right. Liza said, addressing Waylay. Look at my grandsons. Some things can't be solved with a couple of punches. Knox had Nash in a headlock, Waylay said. Where is our server? I asked no one in particular. Sounds about right, Liza agreed with Waylay. What are they fighting about? My niece asked. Those mule-headed boys are always fighting. I heard it was about a woman. I jolted as the server leaned over the table to throw down napkins and straws. Now, what woman would that be, Niecy? Liza asked. 
I'm just repeating what I heard. Seeing as how everyone knows Knox hadn't dated a girl from this town since high school, remember Jilly Ocker moved herself to Canton just to see if a change in zip code would push him over the edge? Yeah. Then she met that lumberjack and had his four lumberjack babies, Niecy said. I didn't want to be interested in that particular information, but I couldn't help myself. I'm just repeating what I heard. It's a damn shame neither of those boys have ever settled down. Nisi adjusted her glasses and cracked her gum. If I were 20 years younger, I'd end their feud by selflessly offering to share myself with both of them. I'm sure your husband would have something to say about that, Liza ventured. Vin's fallen asleep on the sofa five nights out of seven every week for the past ten years. In my book, you snooze, you lose. You must be not Tina, the server said. Heard you and Knox got into screaming matches at the cafe and honky-tonk, and then he apologized, but you broke a chair over his head and he needed six stitches. I was rendered speechless. Waylay, on the other hand, erupted into peals of laughter. This town certainly loved its gossip. With rumors like that, it was no wonder I hadn't heard anything from the caseworker yet. They were probably working on a warrant for my arrest. This here's Naomi and her niece, Waylay, Liza said, making the introductions. And I didn't break a chair over anyone's head, no matter how much they deserved it. I'm a very responsible adult, I told Nisi in hopes that she'd pass that rumor along. Huh. Bummer, she said. Can I have a dollar to play some music? Waylay asked, pointing at the jukebox in the corner after we'd placed our orders. Before I could say anything, Liza shoved a crumpled $5 bill at her. Play some country. I miss hearing it. Thanks. Waylay snatched the bill out of Liza's hand and headed for the jukebox. Why don't you listen to country anymore? I asked. That same look she'd had when Waylay asked her about the photo came back, wistful and sad. My daughter was the one who played it. Had it on the radio morning, noon, and night. Taught the boys to line dance practically before they could walk. There was a lot of past tense in that sentence. Spontaneously, I reached out and squeezed her hand. Her focus came back to me, and she squeezed my hand back before pulling free. Speaking of family, my grandson sure has shown some interest in you. Nash has been so helpful since I got to town. I said. Not Nash, you ninny. Knox. Knox? I repeated, certain I'd heard her wrong. Big guy. Tattoos. Pissed off at the world. He hasn't shown interest, Liza. He's shown disdain, disgust, and malice. He'd also shared an aggressive announcement that his body found my body attractive, but the rest of him found the rest of me revolting. She hooted. I bet you're the one. The one what? The one who's going to have him reconsidering this whole bachelor deal. Bet money you're the first girl he dates from this town in 20 plus years. And by dates, I mean... I held the menu up over my face. I understand what you mean, but you're very, very wrong. He's quite the catch, she insisted. And not just because of the lottery money. I was 100% certain she was messing with me. Knox won the lottery, I asked dryly. 11 million, couple of years back. I blinked. You're serious, aren't you? As a heart attack? And he wasn't one of those buy a big ass mansion and a fleet of foreign cars winners. He's even richer now than when he got that big check, she said with pride. The man's boots were older than Waylay. He lived on his grandmother's property in a cabin. I thought of Warner and his family, who definitely did not have $11 million, but acted as if they were the crustiest of the upper crust. But he's just so... grumpy. Liza smirked. Guess it just goes to show money can't buy happiness. We were just digging into a large pepperoni and salad... Well, technically, I was the only one with salad on my plate. When the front door opened and in walked Sloane the librarian, followed by a young girl. 
Today, Sloane wore a long tie-dye skirt that skimmed her ankles and a fitted t-shirt with cuffed sleeves. She wore her hair down, creating a long golden curtain that moved like the material of her skirt. The girl behind her was a chubby-cheeked cherub. She had dark skin, assessing brown eyes, and wore her hair in an adorable puff on top of her head. Hey, Sloane, I greeted her with a wave. The librarian's red lips curved in a smile, and she jerked her head at the girl who followed. Well, if it isn't Liza, Naomi, and Wele. Chloe, do you know Way? Sloane asked. The girl tapped a sparkly pink-nailed finger to her chin. We had bee lunch together last year, didn't we? You sat with Nina, the short one with black hair Nina, not the tall one with bad breath. She's really nice. She just doesn't do a good job with the brushing. I'm in Mrs. Felch's class this year, and I'm not happy about it because everyone says she's a mean old lady. I heard she's even meaner because she and her husband are talking about a divorce. I noticed that Wele was staring at Chloe with wary interest. Chloe! Sloane sounded both amused and embarrassed. What? I'm only repeating what I heard from several very good sources. Whose class are you in? She asked Wele. Mrs. Felch, Wele said. Sixth grade is going to be awesome, even if we do have mean old Mrs. Felch, because we get to switch rooms and teachers for science, art, gym, and math. Plus, we've got Nina and Bo and Willow in class with us, Chloe plowed on. Do you know what you're wearing on the first day? I can't decide between an all-pink ensemble or a pink and white ensemble. It was a lot of words to take in from such a small person. <laughs> if you ever need to know anything about anyone, just ask my niece Chloe, Sloan said, looking amused. Chloe grinned, showing a dimple in one cheek. I'm not allowed to visit Aunt Sloan at the library because she says I talk too much. I don't think I talk too much. I just have a lot of information that needs to be disseminated to the public. Waylay was staring at Chloe with half of her slice of pizza hanging out of her mouth. It had been a long time since I'd been in school and faced with a cool girl. But Chloe had cool girl written all over her. We should get our moms, or I guess your aunt and my mom or my aunt, to schedule a play date. Are you into crafts or hiking? Maybe baking? Uh, Wele said. You can let me know at school, Chloe said. Thanks, Wele croaked. It occurred to me that if people in the grocery store were giving her the evil eye, Wele might not have a lot of friends at school. After all, it wasn't hard to imagine mothers not wanting their daughters to bring home Tina Witt's daughter. Inspiration struck. Hey, we're throwing a little dinner party Sunday. Would you two like to come? My day off and I don't have to cook? Count me in, Sloan said. What about you, Chloe? I'll check my social calendar and get back to you. I have a birthday party and tennis lessons on Saturday, but I think I'm free Sunday. Great, I said. Waylay shot me a look that made me think I sounded a little bit desperate. Perfect! Let's grab our to-go order before it gets cold, Sloan suggested, steering Chloe toward the counter. Damn, that kick and talk, Liza observed. She looked at me. So when were you gonna invite me to this dinner party? Uh, now? We ate our pizza. I ate our salad, and Liza picked up the bill like the patron saint of temporarily broke tenants. We hit the sidewalk and the Virginia heat, but Liza headed in the opposite direction of the car. She tottered down to the building on the corner and knocked loudly on Whiskey Clipper's plate glass window. Wele joined her and they both started waving. What are you two doing? I asked, hurrying after them. Knox owns this place, too, and does some barbering, Liza said with a hint of pride. Wearing his usual uniform of worn jeans, a fitted t-shirt, and ancient motorcycle boots, Knox Morgan was standing behind one of the salon chairs, taking a straight razor to a customer's cheek. He had a leather apron-like organizer hung low on his hips with scissors and other tools tucked in the pouches. I'd never had a barber fetish before. I didn't even know if that was a legitimate fetish. But watching those tattooed forearms, those dexterous hands work, I felt an annoying pulse of desire spark to life under the pizza I'd inhaled. 
His gaze met mine, and for a second it felt like the glass wasn't there. It felt like I was being dragged into his gravity against my will. It felt like it was just the two of us sharing some kind of secret. I knew what I'd be thinking about and hating myself for when I laid down in bed tonight. 14. The Dinner Party Knox Beer and catch a game? Beer and shoot the shit on the deck, I asked Jeremiah as he and Waylon followed me up the steps to my cabin. Once every two weeks or so, I'd take an early night and we'd get together outside of work. I want to find out what's got your beard so droopy. You were fine a couple of days ago, your usual grumpy self. Now you're pouting. I don't pout, I ponder, in a manly way. Jeremiah snickered behind me. I unlocked the door and, despite my best efforts, glanced in the direction of the cottage. There were cars parked in front of the cottage, music playing. Great. The woman was a socializer. Another reason to stay far the hell away from her. Not that I had to, seeing as how she'd been avoiding me like I was the problem. The past week had been a struggle, an annoying one. Naomi Witt, I'd discovered, was a warm, friendly person. And when she wasn't feeling warm and friendly towards you, you definitely felt the cold. She refused to make eye contact with me. Her smiles and sure thing, boss, responses were perfunctory. Even when I drove her home and we were alone in the truck, the frostiness didn't thaw a degree. Every time I thought I'd gotten a handle on it, she popped up, either in her backyard or at my grandmother's, in my own bar. Hell, a few days ago, she'd floated up to the window at Whiskey Clipper like a goddamn vision. She was driving me fucking nuts. See? That right there, Jer said, pointing a finger in my face. Pouting. What's going on with you, man? Nothing. I noticed my brother's department vehicle parked at the cottage. Fuck. There a reason you don't like seeing your brother's car parked at not Tina's? Is it the bisexual part of you that wants to talk about fucking feelings all the time? I asked. Or is it the, I come from a big Lebanese family that knows everything about everybody part that I can blame? Why not both? He said with a quick grin. A particularly loud burst of laughter caught our attention, as did the scent of grilled meat. Waylon's nose twitched. The white tip of his tail froze in the air. No, I said sternly. I might as well have said, Sure, bud, go get yourself a hot dog, because my dog took off like a streak. Looks like we're joining the party, Jeremiah observed. Fuck, I'm getting a beer first. A minute later, cold beers in hand, we wandered around the back of the cottage to find half of Knockemout on Naomi's porch. Sloane, the pretty librarian, was there with her niece, Chloe, who was wading knee-deep in the creek with Waylay and my grandmother's dogs. Liza J was sitting next to Tallulah while Justice manned the grill, and my pain-in-the-ass brother flirted with Naomi. She looked like summer. Considering I'd had two sips of beer, I couldn't blame alcohol on my mental prose. My mouth went dry as my gaze stared at her bare feet then moved up the long, tan legs to where they disappeared under the flirty, lemon-yellow sundress. So that's the problem, Jeremiah said smugly. He was looking right at Naomi, and I didn't much care for it. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. Waylon barreled his way up onto the porch and made a beeline for the grill. Waylon! Naomi looked delighted to see my dog. She crouched down to greet him, and even from here, the peak of cleavage was enough to tie my balls in a knot. Waylon, I barked. My jerk of a dog was too busy enjoying the affection of a beautiful woman to bother listening to me. Knox, Jer, Tallulah called when she spotted us in the yard. Join us. Naomi looked up, 
and I saw the sunshine fade from her face when she spotted me. The ice walls went up. We don't want to impose, Jeremiah said, cagily eyeing the spread. There were deviled eggs, grilled vegetables, some kind of layered dip thing in a fancy dish, and four kinds of desserts. On the grill, Justice was turning chicken breasts and hot dogs. You're welcome to join us, Naomi said through a smile that was more gritted teeth than invitation. Her message was clear. She didn't want me here at her cozy little dinner party. Well, I didn't want her in my head every time I closed my fucking eyes, so I considered the score equal. If you insist, Jeremiah said, shooting me a triumphant look. Nice flowers, I said. There was a blue vase overflowing with wild blooms in the center of the table. Nash brought them, Naomi said. I wanted to smack the smug look of satisfaction right off my brother's face. So he brought a girl flowers and I could barely get her to say two words to me. He should know better than to challenge me like that. I played dirty. Even when I didn't care about winning, I just wanted Nash to lose. Between eating and shooting the shit with Naomi's eclectic guests, I watched her. She sat between Waylay and Nash, who had all but pushed me out of the way like we were playing musical chairs. The conversation was lively, the mood upbeat. Naomi laughed and talked and listened, all while keeping an eye on everyone's plates and glasses, offering second helpings and top-offs with the expertise of someone who spent their life looking out for others. She was warm, attentive, funny, except to me. So maybe I'd been a bit of a dick. Personally, I didn't think that was enough of an infraction for me to be relegated to Ice Town. I noticed every time Sloane or Chloe mentioned something about school starting, Naomi got pale and sometimes excused herself to go inside. She talked to Jeremiah about hair and whiskey clipper. She talked about coffee and small business with Justice and Tallulah and had no problem smiling at any stupid thing that came out of my brother's mouth. But no matter how long I watched her, she never once glanced in my direction. I was the invisible dinner guest, and it was rubbing me the wrong way. Liza J was telling us stories of you and Nash growing up earlier, Justice said to me. I could only imagine which stories my grandmother had decided on. Was it the rock fight in the creek or the zip line from the chimney? I asked my brother. Both, Nash said, lips quirked. It was quite the childhood, I told Justice. Did your parents live with you? Waylay asked. It was an innocent question coming from a kid who knew what it was like to not live with her parents. I swallowed and looked for an escape. We lived with our parents until our mom passed, Nash told her. I'm so sorry to hear that. That came from Naomi, and this time she was looking right fucking at me. I nodded stiffly. Naomi, did you pick up Waylay's school laptop yet? Sloan asked. My sister said Chloe's was a little buggy. Yeah, every time I open the internet, it restarts. How am I supposed to watch age-appropriate videos on YouTube with no internet? Chloe chimed in. Or, I don't know, do schoolwork? Sloan teased. I could probably take a look at it, Waylay offered. Chloe's brown eyes widened. You're a STEM girl? What's that? Waylay asked with suspicion. Science, technology, engineering, math, Sloan filled in. Yeah, nerd stuff, Chloe added. Sloan elbowed her niece. Ow! I don't mean nerd like bad. Nerds are good. Nerds are cool. Nerds are the ones who grow up to run companies and make bazillions of dollars, Chloe said. She looked at Waylay. Nerds are definitely good. The tops of Waylay's ears turned pink. My mom always said nerds were losers, she said quietly. She shot Naomi a look. She said girls who liked dresses and doing their hair were, uh, bad. 
I had the sudden urge to hunt down Tina and drop kick her ass into the creek for not being the kind of mother her kid needed. Your mom got a lot of things mixed up, kiddo, Naomi said, running her hand over Waylay's hair. She didn't understand that people could be more than one thing or like more than one thing. You can wear dresses and makeup and build rockets. You can dress in suits and play baseball. You can be a millionaire and work in your pajamas. Your mom doesn't like dresses and hair, Chloe scoffed. She's missing out. I had two wardrobe changes for my birthday last year and I got a bow and arrow. You be you. Don't let someone who doesn't like fashion tell you anything. Listen to Chloe, who's about to lose a hot dog off her plate. Get down, Waylon, Liza said. My dog froze mid-sneak. We can still see you even if you're not moving, dumbass, I reminded him. Waylay giggled. Pouting, Waylon slunk back under the table. Seconds later, I noticed Waylay tear off a piece of her hot dog and casually tuck it under the checkered cloth. Naomi noticed it too, but didn't tattle on either one of them. If you brought your laptop along, I could take a look, Waylay offered. Well, if you're doing a little post-dinner tech support, Tallulah said, pulling a huge iPad out of her work bag. I just got this for the shop and I'm having trouble transferring everything over from the old one. Ten dollars a job, I said, slapping the table. Everyone's eyes came to me. Waylay's lips quirked. Waylay wit doesn't work for free. You want the best, you gotta pay for it, I told them. Her tiny smile was a smirk now, which morphed into a full-out grin when Tallulah yanked a $10 bill out of her purse and handed it over. First paying customer, Tallulah said proudly. Aunt Sloane, Chloe hissed. Sloane grinned and went for her purse. Here's $20 for your trouble. Miss Fashion here also dribbled honey on the space bar when she was making tea. Waylay pocketed the bills and sat down to get to work. This time, Naomi locked eyes with me. She didn't smile, didn't say thank you or get me naked tonight. But there was still something there. Something I itched to unlock simmering in those hazel eyes. And then it was gone. Excuse me, she said, pushing back from the table. I'll be right back. Nash watched her walk away, that bright yellow material sliding over tanned thighs. I couldn't blame him, but I also couldn't let him have her. When Jeremiah caught his attention with a question about football, I used it as an opportunity to follow Naomi inside. I found her bent over the roll-top desk next to the stairs in the living room. What you doing? She jumped, shoulders hitching, then spun around, holding her hands behind her back. When she saw it was me, she rolled her eyes. Is there something you need? A slap across the face? An excuse to leave? I closed the distance between us, slowly. I didn't know why I was doing it. I just knew that watching her smile at my brother made my chest tight, that being frozen out was getting to me. And the closer I moved to her, the warmer I felt. Thought money was tight. I said when she tilted her head to look up at me. Oh, bite me, Viking. Just saying, Daisy, your first night on the job, you gave me a sob story of losing your savings and supporting your niece. Now it looks like you're feeding half the county. It's a potluck, Knox. By the way, you're the only one who didn't bring anything to share. Besides, I wasn't doing it to socialize. I liked the way she said my name when she was exasperated. Hell, I just liked my name on those lips. All right, then. Why are you hosting half of Knock 'em Out for a potluck? If I tell you, do you promise to do us both a favor and go away? Absolutely, I lied. She bit her lip and peered over my shoulder. Fine. It's because of Chloe. You're throwing a dinner party for an 11-year-old? She rolled her eyes. No! That adorable chatterbox is the most popular girl in Waylay's grade. They have the same teacher this year. I was just trying to give them a chance to spend some time together. You're matchmaking sixth graders. Naomi's jaw jutted out and she crossed her arms over her chest. 
I didn't mind because it pressed her breasts up higher against the neckline of her dress. You wouldn't understand what it's like to walk through town and be judged by people just because of who you're related to, she hissed. I took a step closer to her. You're dead wrong about that. Okay, fine, whatever. I want Waylay to go to school with actual friends, not just rumors that she's Tina Witt's abandoned daughter. It was probably a solid play. I'd had my brother and Lucian on the first day of school when we'd moved here. No one in school had the guts to say shit about one of us since we were protected by the pack. Then what's this? I asked, grabbing the notebook she had clutched in one hand. Knox, stop! Emergency back to school to do, I read. Pick up laptop. Try to schedule meeting with teacher. Back to school clothes and supplies. Money. I let out a low whistle. A lot of question marks after that one. She lunged for the notebook, but I held it out of her reach and flipped back a page. I found another to-do list and another one. Sure do like lists, I observed. Her handwriting started out nice and neat, but the farther down the list it got, I could practically feel the panic in her penmanship. The woman had a lot on her plate, and not much to do it with if the glimpse of her bank balances scrawled at the bottom of a shopping list were any indicator. This time I allowed her to snatch the notebook back. She threw it on the desk behind her and picked up her wine glass. Stay out of my business, Knox, she said. Her cheeks were pink, and there wasn't a hint of frost in those gorgeous hazel eyes now. Every time she took a deep breath, her breasts grazed my chest and drove me just a little more insane. You don't have to do this alone, you know, I said. She clapped her non-wine-holding hand to her forehead in mock excitement. Of course! I can just ask for handouts from strangers. Why didn't I think of that? That wouldn't make me look like I'm incapable of taking care of a child in the eyes of the law. Problem solved. There's nothing wrong with accepting a little help now and then. I don't need help. I need time, she insisted, her shoulders tensing, hand fisting at her side. Sloan mentioned she might have a part-time position opening up at the library after school starts. I can save up and get a car. I can make this work. I just need time. You want extra shifts at Honky Tonk, say the word. I couldn't seem to stop wanting this woman's orbit to overlap with my own. It was a stupid, dangerous game I was playing. This from the man who called me an uppity, needy pain in the ass and tried to fire me on the spot. Forgive me if I don't ever ask you for anything. Oh, come on, Naomi. I was pissed off. She looked at me like she wanted to light me on fire. And, she said pointedly, and what? I said some shit because I was pissed off. You weren't supposed to hear it. Not my fault you were eavesdropping on a private conversation. You yelled two seconds after I walked out the door. You can't just do that. Words have power. They make people feel things. So stop feeling things and let's move on, I suggested. That might be the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Doubt that. You grew up with Tina. The ice in her had thawed and turned to molten lava. I did grow up with Tina. I was nine when I overheard her telling my best friend they should play without me because I was too snobby to have any fun. I was 14 when she kissed the boy she knew I liked and told me I was too needy for him or anyone to ever want me. Fucking A. This is why I hated talking to people. Sooner or later, you always stuck your finger in a wound. I ran my hand through my hair. Then along comes Knox Morgan, who doesn't want me around because despite my defective personality of being uppity and needy, you still manage to be attracted to my body. Look, Daisy, it's nothing personal. Except it is deeply personal. Put a lot of thought into being pissed off about this, haven't you? Maybe I wasn't the only one losing sleep. Go screw yourself, Knox. The brisk knock at the front door made Naomi jump. Wine sloshed over the rim of her glass. Am I interrupting? 
The woman on the other side of the screen door was a few inches shy of Naomi and wore a rumpled gray suit. Her dark hair was pulled back in a tight bun. Um... Naomi managed as she tried to blot at the wine on her chest with her hands. Uh... I'm Yolanda Suarez with Child Protective Services. Oh, fuck me. Naomi went rigor mortis stiff next to me. I snatched the box of tissues off the top of the desk and handed it to Naomi. Here, I said. When she just stared at the visitor without moving, I yanked a few tissues out and started to blot up the disaster. It took about two dabs into her cleavage before she snapped out of it and slapped my hands away. Um, welcome. This isn't my wine, Naomi said, eyes wide. The visitor's gaze slid to the now empty glass Naomi was holding. I mean, it is. I don't know why I said that, but I'm not drinking a lot of it. I'm responsible, and I hardly ever yell at men in my living room. Okay, is Chief Morgan here? He asked me to stop by, Yolanda asked coolly. Fifteen. Knox goes shopping. Naomi. Two days later, I was still having many heart attacks every time someone came to the door. Nash had invited Yolanda, Waylay's caseworker, to stop by so he could introduce us. He just had no idea that she'd show up when I was in the middle of unloading a lifetime of baggage on Knox Morgan. The introduction had been brief and awkward. Yolanda handed over a paper copy of the guardianship application, and I could feel her classifying me as a screaming shrew with a taste for too much wine. On the bright side, Waylay had been mercifully polite and didn't mention how I was torturing her with vegetables in her meals. I'd overanalyzed the informal meeting to the point where I was convinced I'd barely survived an interrogation and that Yolanda Suarez hated me. My new mission wasn't just to be judged an acceptable kinship guardian. I was going to be the best kinship guardian Northern Virginia had ever seen. The very next day, I'd borrowed Liza's Buick and marched into Knockamout's consignment shop. Pack rats had coughed up $400 for my custom-made, barely-worn wedding dress. Then I'd grabbed a coffee from Justice and gone straight home to finalize the back-to-school shopping list. Guess what we're doing today, I said to Waylay as we had our lunch of sandwiches and carrot sticks on the back porch. The sun was shining, the creek burbling lazily as it flowed past the edge of the grass. Probably something boring, Waylay predicted as she tossed another carrot stick over her shoulder into the yard. Back to school shopping. She looked at me with suspicion. Is that a thing? Of course it's a thing. You're a kid. Kids grow. They outgrow old stuff and need new stuff. You're taking me shopping for clothes? Waylay said slowly. And shoes and school supplies. Your teacher hasn't answered my emails yet, so I got a copy of the supply list from Chloe's mom. I was babbling because I was nervous. Waylay and I had yet to connect, and I was willing to attempt to buy her affection. Do I get to pick the clothes? You're the one wearing them. I might retain veto power in case you decide to go for a fur coat or velour tracksuits, but yeah, you get to pick. Huh. Okay, she said. She wasn't exactly jumping up and down and throwing her arms around me like she had in my imagination. But there was a twinkle of a smile happening at the corners of her mouth as she ate her turkey and provolone. After lunch, I sent Waylay upstairs to get ready while I reviewed the mall research I'd printed at the library. I was only halfway through the store descriptions when there was a knock at the front door. Fearing it was another drop-by from Yolanda... I took a moment to run my fingers through my hair, check my teeth for lipstick, and close the lid on the roll-top desk so she couldn't judge my obsession with notebooks and planners. Instead of Yolanda, I found the most annoying man in the world standing on the porch in jeans, a gray t-shirt, and aviators. His hair looked a little shorter on top. I guess when you owned a barbershop, you could get a haircut whenever you wanted. 
It was annoying how attractive he was, all bearded and tattooed and aloof. Howdy, neighbor, he said. Who are you and what have you done with blonde Oscar? I asked. Let's go, he said, hooking his thumb toward his truck. What? Where? Why are you here? Liza J said you needed a ride. I'm your ride. I shook my head. Oh, no. I'm not doing this with you today. Not playing games, Daisy. Get your ass in the truck. As charming as that invitation is, Viking, I'm taking Wele back to school shopping. You don't strike me as a spend-the-day-shopping-with-the-girls kind of neighbor. You're not wrong, but maybe I'm a drop-the-girls-off-at-the-mall-and-pick-them-up-when-they're-done kind of neighbor. No offense, but no, you're not that either. We can stand here arguing about it for the next hour, or you can get your ass in the truck. He sounded almost cheerful, and that made me suspicious. Why can't I just borrow Liza's car? That had been the plan. I didn't like when things didn't go according to plan. Can't now. She needs it. He leaned around me and called into the house. Way late. Get a move on. Bus is leaving. I heard the thunder of feet upstairs as my niece forgot to play it cool. I put a hand to his chest and pushed him back until we were both standing on the porch. Listen, this trip is important. I'm trying to bond with Wele, and she's never been back to school shopping before. So if you're going to do anything to ruin it, I'd rather take a lift to the mall. In fact, that's what I'm going to do. He looked downright amused. And how are you going to do that with a piece of shit phone that's too old to download apps? Damn it. Wele vaulted into the living room, landing with both feet before rearranging her expression into a look of boredom. Hey, she said to Knox. Knox is going to drive us, I explained with zero enthusiasm. Cool. How much stuff are you planning to buy if you need a whole entire pickup truck? Wele wondered. Your aunt said she plans to buy out half the mall. Figured it was best to come prepared, Knox said. I caught the little half-smile on her face before she led the way down the porch steps and said, Let's get this over with. My suspicions were further heightened when we got in the truck and I found a coffee for me and a smoothie for Wele. What's your game? I asked Knox when he slid behind the wheel. He ignored me to frown over a text. There was something about the way he hesitated that gave me a bad feeling. Is Liza okay? Did something happen at Honky Tonk? Relax, Daisy. Everybody and everything is fine. He fired off a response and started the truck. We headed east and joined the slog of Northern Virginia traffic. I checked my tidy stack of cash again while Knox and Whaley made small talk. I tuned them out and tried to squash the anxiety. Yesterday at the library, I'd logged into my accounts to confirm some budget numbers. Money was tight. The bar shifts and free rent were helping, but my income wasn't enough to impress any judge in any court, especially not if I added a car payment into the mix. I had three options. One, find a day job while Wele was in school. Two, borrow against my retirement savings. Three, sell my house on Long Island. Inwardly, I cringed. It had represented so much more to me than just three bedrooms and two baths. It was a gratifying step that was part of a larger plan. I'd landed a good job at Warner's family's investment firm, fallen for him, and bought a nice house to start a family. If I sold it, I was officially saying goodbye to the dream. Then where would I go after my six months of temporary guardianship with Wele were up? By the time we got to the mall, I was marinating in the misery of regrets and failures. Thanks for the ride, I said to Knox, who was now on his phone carrying on a conversation that seemed to consist of monosyllabic questions and answers. I hopped out, still clutching my coffee. Wele climbed out of the back seat and slammed her door. I expected him to accelerate away, leaving us in a cloud of fumes, but instead he got out and shoved his phone in his back pocket. What are you doing? Are you shopping with us? Wele asked. 
She didn't sound horrified. She sounded excited. Damn you, Knox Morgan. Got some things on my own shopping list. Figured you ladies could show me the ropes. We entered the air-conditioned mall, and with a cursory glance in my direction, Wele made a beeline for an accessories store. As soon as she disappeared into the store, I grabbed Knox's tattooed arm. What are you doing? Shopping. You don't shop. You don't go to malls. He rolled back on his heels, looking amused. That a fact? You're the kind of guy who wears his clothes until they disintegrate. And then you either start wearing something some female relative got you for Christmas, or you order the same exact thing you wore out online. You do not go to malls. You do not shop with girls. Knox moved into my space. Those eyes, more gray than blue today, went serious. You got a problem with me tagging along? Yes! What are you doing here, Knox? I'm trying to bond with Wele. Everything else I've tried so far hasn't put a crack in those walls. She's got a poker face at age 11 because of the amount of disappointment she's already faced. I want to see her smile. A real smile. Jesus, Naomi. I'm not here to fuck that up. Then why are you here? Wele knocked on her side of the store window and held up two pairs of earrings to her unpierced lobes. I gave her a thumbs up and mentally added Pierce Waylay's ears to the list. I got my reasons, just like I got my reasons for not telling you. That's not an acceptable answer. We were almost touching now, and my body was getting confused between the cold air conditioning and the heat pumping off his spectacular body. Only answer you're getting for now. This is why you're single, I pointed out. No woman in her right mind would put up with that. I'm single because I want to be, he countered. I was mid-eye roll when he decided to change the subject. So you're trying to buy your way in with Way? Yes, I am. Girls like presents. Do you like presents? He asked. I shook my head. No, Knox, I don't. I freaking love presents. It was true. I did. Warner had half-assed his way through the past few years of Christmas and birthdays, making me feel materialistic when I'd shown any disappointment at the thoughtless gifts and the wrong sizes. Knox cracked a half-smile. So where's the funding coming from for this spree? I know what you make at Honky Tonk. I craned my neck to make sure Wele was still inside. She was trying on a braided headband in pink and purple, it looked freaking adorable, and I itched to go in and drag her to the counter with it. Not that it's any of your business, but I sold my wedding dress. Things that bad? He asked. Bad? You just sold a wedding dress to pay for your niece's back-to-school shit. You don't have a phone, and you don't have a car. I have a phone, I said, digging out Liza's old Blackberry and holding it up in his face. The letter E just fell off the keyboard. Damn it, E was in a lot of words. I don't need your judgment, okay? Today, the priority is school stuff for Wele. I'll figure out the rest, so you do your thing, and I'll shower my niece with stuff. That half-smile was back, and it was wreaking havoc with my nervous system. Deal. I headed toward the store, then stopped short to admire the window display. A wall of hot, hard chest crashed into me. Problem? Knox asked. His beard tickled my ear. I turned around to face him and gritted my teeth. You're not going to leave us alone today, are you? Nope, he said, walking me backwards into the store with a hand spread across my stomach. I thought for sure we'd lose him in the first tween store, but he'd stuck through all of them, including the shoes. He'd even voiced a few opinions when Wele asked for them, and he'd made faces at her to keep her entertained while she got her ears pierced. She was glowing. Her frosty, don't-care demeanor had started to thaw on the second pair of shoes and had melted into a puddle when I insisted she get the sundress with pink and yellow flowers. And that was before Knox had whipped out his credit card when she gasped audibly over a pair of hot pink sneakers with bedazzled flowers. 
Why do you keep feeling your forehead, Aunt Naomi? Waylay asked. I'm trying to see if I have a fever, because I'm definitely hallucinating. The only alternative was I'd accidentally managed to fall into an alternate timeline in which Knox Morgan was a nice guy who liked to shop. We ran into Waylay's friend Nina, with the nice breath and black hair from school. I was happy to be introduced to her dads, Isaac and Gail, who seemed to accept it when Knox introduced himself only as our ride. Nina asked if Waylay could go to the arcade with them. I gladly said yes and was exchanging phone numbers with Isaac when Knox pulled a $20 bill out of his wallet. Go wild, Way, he said. Wow, thanks. Don't buy too much candy, I called after her. We haven't had dinner yet. She waved over her shoulder, a gesture I assumed meant she had no intention of listening. I turned on Knox. Why are you still here? You've shadowed us to every store. You keep checking your phone like you're a teenager, and you haven't bought yourself anything. You're very confusing and annoying. His face remained stony, and he didn't answer. Fine. I guess I'll just finish my shopping. Since I was living out of a suitcase, I really did need new underwear. Ducking into Victoria's Secret wasn't exactly a ruse to get rid of him, but I figured there was no way on earth Knox Morgan would follow me inside. I was shuffling through the sale bin when I felt a grumpy, looming presence. He was standing behind me, arms crossed over his chest. I rolled my eyes and decided to ignore him. What I couldn't ignore was the fact that every time a woman entered the store, she stopped in her tracks and stared. I couldn't blame them. He was unfairly gorgeous. Too bad about the whole terrible personality thing. I'd narrowed it down to two pairs of normal old briefs, but kept coming back to sigh over a silky pair with lace cutouts on the side and back when a sales associate appeared. Can I get a dressing room started for you? She asked. I thought about it. At least Knox couldn't follow me into the dressing room. She'll take these, he said, snatching the briefs out of my hand and pushing them at the saleswoman. My mouth fell open as he dug into the bin and yanked out three more pairs of the impractical, sexy-as-hell ones, pink, purple, and red. Then he grabbed a pair of adorable boxer-style undies with red hearts all over them, and these. He shoved them all at the woman, who gave me a sly grin before marching over to the register. Knox, I'm not buying all those, I hissed at him. Shut it, he said and whipped out his credit card. If you think for one second that I'm allowing you to buy me underwear. He cut off my tirade by slinging an arm over my shoulder and covering my mouth with his hand. Here, he said, sliding his card across the counter. I was squirming against him until he leaned down. If this is what it takes to get out of this fucking store without passing out from a goddamn hard-on, I'm buying you the fucking underwear. By my count, this was the second time he'd mentioned his man parts having a reaction to me. I wasn't a big enough liar to pretend I wasn't happy that he found himself in the same predicament as me, turned on by the physical, turned off by everything else. I stopped squirming when he pulled me in front of him. With my back flushed to his front, I could feel the irrefutable evidence of his claim. My body reacted entirely without my brain's input and went into five-alarm arousal. I worried that I was going to need to be carried out of the store. That was incredibly inappropriate, I said, crossing my arms over my chest as we left the store, his arms still around me. You wanted me to buy something. I bought something. Underwear! For me! I screeched. You look tired, he said smugly. Tired? I'm exhausted. We've walked 50 miles in a mall. I spent every dime and then some. I'm tired. I'm hungry. Most of all, I'm confused, Knox. You're so mean all the time. And then you show up today and buy me nice underwear? Maybe you'll think of me when you wear them, he said his gaze scanning ahead of us. You're the worst. You're welcome. We got one more stop, he said, taking my hand. I was tired. Too tired to fight. Too tired to pay attention to what store he dragged me into. 
Mr. Morgan, a tall, skinny kid with a dark goatee, waved at us. We just finished up, he said. We were in a cell phone store. I dug my heels in, but Knox merely pulled me forward to the counter. Good timing, Ben. Here she is, the kid said, sliding a brand new phone toward me. It's all set up and in the case. If you need any help downloading your old contacts from the cloud, we'll be happy to help you. Your new number is written inside the box. Baffled, tired, hungry, a little furious, and a lot confused, I stared down at the phone, then up at Knox. Thanks, Knox said to Ben, then handed me the phone. The case had sparkly daisies on it. You got me a phone? Let's go, he said. I'm hungry. I let him pull me out of the store, remembering at the door to give Ben a wave and a thank you. We were halfway to the arcade when my brain started connecting the dots. You walked me all over this damn mall without complaining just to wear me out so I'd be too tired to fight you on the phone, didn't you? Burgers, sushi, or pizza? He asked. Burgers. Knox? He kept on walking. Knox? I poked him in the shoulder to get his attention. When he looked down at me, he wasn't smiling, and he didn't look smug. You needed a phone. I got you one. Don't make this into a thing. You call me needy. You yell at me for working at your bar and tell me the only part of me worth spending time with is my body. Then you show up on my shopping trip uninvited and buy me underwear and a really expensive phone. That about sums it up. Minus the only part of you worth spending time with. Are you always this... this inconsistent? This confusing? He stopped walking and looked down at me. No, Naomi. I'm not always this fucking inconsistent. And I blame you. I don't want to be into you. I don't want to spend an entire day wandering around a goddamn mall and fighting traffic for you. I sure as hell don't want to watch you try on underwear. But I also don't want you home alone when there's some guy back in knock him out looking for you. Uh-oh. Some guy? Who is it? Dunno. Justice and Wraith are taking care of it. They'll call Nash in if they need to, he said grimly. What do you mean, taking care of it? I had visions of bodies and tarps and duct tape. Don't worry about it. I started laughing and kept right on going. I couldn't help it. I'd spent the last four years in a relationship where I took care of everything. Every dinner reservation, every vacation, every load of laundry, every grocery run. Here I was in town for less than two weeks, and the grumpy guy, who mostly hated me, had just taken care of me. Maybe someday I'd find a guy who both liked me and was willing to share the burden of taking care. Or maybe I would just end up alone, like Tina had always predicted. You having some kind of breakdown? "'Cause I sure as hell have better things to do than watch that.' "'Oh, good,' I said, smothering my hysteria. "'Grumpy Knox is back. "'What does this guy look like?' "'According to Justice, he looks like some dude named Henry Golding.' "'Henry Golding the hot actor, or Henry Golding some local biker?' "'It was a very important distinction.' "'I don't know any Henry Golding biker.' But this guy showed up at the cafe asking for you. Justice said he about lost it when he saw your sister's mugshot behind the register. I was never going to live this down. You know him? It was my turn to be evasive. Can we get Waylay and go for those burgers? 16. The infamous Steph. Naomi. On the way home, I programmed Nina's dad's numbers into my shiny new phone. They were not the first numbers in there. Knox had already programmed contacts for Liza, Honky Tonk, Sherry, Waylay's school, and Cafe Rev. There was even one for himself. 
I didn't know what that said or meant. And frankly, I was too damn tired to worry about it, especially when I had a bigger problem. That bigger problem was sitting on the front steps of the cottage with a glass of wine. Stay in the truck, Knox growled. But I was already halfway out. It's fine, I know him. Waylay, crammed in the back seat with all our purchases, rolled down her window and stuck her head out. Who's that? That's Steph, I said. He put down the wine and opened his arms. I ran into them. Stefan Lau was the world's perfect man. He was smart, funny, thoughtful, outrageously generous, and so pretty it hurt to look directly at him. The only son of a real estate developing father and an app developing mother, he was born with an entrepreneurial spirit and exquisite taste in everything. And somehow, I'd gotten lucky enough to land him as a best friend. He swept me up in his arms and twirled me around. I'm still incredibly pissed at you, he said with a grin. Thank you for loving me even when you're pissed, I said, wrapping my arms around his neck and breathing in his expensive cologne. Just seeing him, hugging him, made me feel more grounded. You gonna introduce me to Blondie and the Beast? Steph asked. Not done hugging yet, I insisted. Hurry it up. Beast looks like he wants to shoot me. He's more of a Viking than a beast. Steph tilted my head back with his hands and planted a kiss on my forehead. It's all going to be fine. I promise. Tears stung my eyes. I believed him. And the relief I felt from that was enough to release Niagara Falls of tears. Where do you want your shit? Knox growled. That was enough to dry up Niagara Falls. I spun around and found him standing only a foot away. Seriously? Got things to do, Days. Don't have all night to stand around watching you make out with Henry Golding. Henry Golding? Nice, Steph said. Waylay, come meet my friend, I called. High from her shopping, arcade, and burger experience, Waylay forgot to look annoyed. Waylay Witt, Knox Morgan, this is Stefan Lau, Steph for short, Way for short, and Leif Erickson when he's being moody. Steph grinned. Knox growled. Waylay admired Steph's shiny smartwatch. The pleasure is all mine. You look like your aunt, Steph said to Waylay. Really? Waylay looked not too horrified by that statement, and I wondered if my shopping bribery had worked its magic. Score. Knox, on the other hand, looked like he wanted to dismember Steph. What's your problem? I mouthed at him. He glared at me as if I was the one to blame for his sudden mood swing. Knox, Steph said, holding out a hand. I can't thank you enough for looking out for my girl here. Knox grunted and stared at the offered hand for a beat before shaking it. The handshake went on longer than necessary. Why are their fingers turning white? Waylay asked me. It's a man thing, I explained. She looked skeptical. Like pooping for 45 minutes? Yeah, something like that, I said. The handshake was finally over, and both men were now locked in a staring contest. If I wasn't careful, the penises and rulers would be next. Knox very graciously took us shopping today, I explained to Steph. He bought me pink sneakers and he bought Aunt Naomi underwear and a phone. Thank you for that information, Way. Why don't you go inside and not talk anymore? I suggested, giving her a shove toward the house. That depends. Can I have the last ice cream sandwich? It's yours as long as you stuff it in your mouth instead of talking. Pleasure doing business with you. See ya, Knox. He was already halfway back to his truck. Don't leave on my account, Steph called after him. Knox didn't say anything, but I did hear some sort of growl coming from his general direction. Hang on a second, I said to Steph. He's got the better part of a mall in his back seat, and I don't want him to drive off with it. I caught him just as he was opening his door. Knox, wait! What? I'm busy. I have shit to do. 
Can you give me one minute to get Waylay's department store out of your back seat? He muttered a few colorful expletives and yanked open the back door. I looped as many bags as I could over my wrists before his frustration took over. He marched all the new stuff to the porch and set it in a pile next to Steph. You did get new underwear, Steph said, sneaking a peek into the Victoria's Secret bag. Another low growl emanated from the vicinity of Knox's chest, and then he was storming back to his truck. I rolled my eyes and ran after him. Knox? Christ, woman, he said, rounding on me. Now what? Nothing, just... Thank you for everything today. It meant the world to waylay. And me. When I turned to leave, his hand shot out and caught my wrist. Future reference days? My problem is always you. I don't know why I did what I did next, but I did it. I raised on tiptoe and pressed a kiss to his cheek. He was still standing there when Steph and I walked inside with a dozen shopping bags between us. With Waylay asleep in a shopping-induced coma, I changed into pajamas and wondered why in the world I'd left my closet doors wide open, then decided it had probably been Waylay. I was surprised at the effect an additional human had on a household. Toothpaste tubes were squeezed haphazardly in the middle, snacks disappeared, and the TV remote was never where I left it. I closed the closet doors firmly and returned downstairs. The back door was open, and through the screen I saw Steph on the porch. He'd turned my back porch into a citronella candle fantasy land. You can't tell my parents about any of this yet, I said without preamble as I stepped out onto the porch. Steph looked up from the tray of fancy meats and cheeses he was organizing on the picnic table. Why would you even say that? I'm always Team Naomi, he said. I know you talk to them. Just because your mom and I have a standing date at the spa every month doesn't mean I'd rat you out, witty. Besides, I didn't tell them I was coming. I just haven't figured out how to tell them about Waylay. It took me an hour on the phone after I pulled a runaway bride before Mom agreed to still go on the trip. I know if I were to tell them what was going on, they'd be off the boat and on a plane in a second. That does sound like something your parents would do, he agreed, handing me a glass of wine. The man had brought an entire case with him. Your beast wants to devour you like a dozen hot wings. I flopped down on the lawn chair next to him. How is that the first thing you say to me? It's the most pressing. Not, why did you leave Warner at the altar? Or, what the hell were you thinking answering your sister's call for help? He propped his long legs on the railing. You know I never liked Warner. I was ecstatic when you pulled the disappearing act. I only wish you would have let me in on it. I'm sorry, I said lamely. Stop saying you're sorry. I'm... S our? You're the one who has to live your life. Don't apologize to other people for the decisions you make for yourself. My voice of reason, best friend. No judgments. No second guessing. Just unconditional love and support. And the occasional truth bomb. He was one in a billion. You're right. As usual. But I still should have let you know I was pulling a runaway bride. You definitely should have. Although, I did get great pleasure seeing Warner's mother break the news to him in front of the entire congregation. Watching them both trying not to freak out to keep their porcelain reputation intact was comedic. Besides, I took one of the groomsmen home. Which one? Paul. Nice. He looked good in his tux, I mused. He looked better out of it. hey oh. Speaking of hot sex, back to the beast. I choked on my wine. There's no sex happening with the beast. He called me needy and uppity and a pain in his ass. He's rude. He's constantly yelling at me or complaining about me, telling me I'm not his type, as if I wished I were his type. I scoffed. Why are you whispering? Because he lives right there, I said, pointing my glass in the direction of Knox's cabin. Ooh, grumpy next-door neighbor. 
That's one of my favorite tropes. The first time he met me, he called me trash. That bitch. Well, technically, he thought I was Tina when he was yelling at me in front of an entire cafe full of strangers. That vision-impaired bitch. <laughs> God, I love you. I sighed. Back at you, Witty. So, to clarify, you're definitely not sleeping with the hot, grumpy, tattooed neighbor who took you shopping for underwear and a phone? I am 5,000% definitely not sleeping with Knox, and he only went shopping with us because there were reports of a man in town looking for me. <laughs> you're telling me he's a grumpy, overprotective hottie next door, and you're not going to sleep with him? How wasteful. How about instead of talking about Knox, I'll tell you why I burned rubber out of the church parking lot and ended up homeless in Knockamout. Don't forget Carless, he added. I rolled my eyes. And Carless. I'll get the truffles I hid in your bedroom, Steph volunteered. I really wish you were straight, I said. If I could be straight for anyone, it would be you, he said, clinking his glass to mine. Where did these glasses come from? I asked, frowning at the barware. These are my car wine glasses. I always carry a pair. Of course you do. Dear Naomi, your father and I are having a wonderful time, even though you haven't been updating us on what's going on in your life. Barcelona was beautiful, but it would have been even more beautiful if we knew our daughter wasn't spiraling into a depression or some sort of midlife crisis. Guilt tripping over. You should have seen our tour guide, Paolo. Hubba hubba, as the kids say. I attached a photo that I took. He's single if you want me to bring you back a souvenir. Love, Mom. 17. Man to Man. Knox. It was too damn early for someone to be banging on my front door. They deserved what they got. I yanked on a pair of gym shorts and stumbled down the stairs, rubbing sleep out of my eyes. Someone better be dead, I muttered, nearly taking a header over Waylon, who put on the speed on the last three steps. What? I said, yanking the door open. The obnoxiously good-looking Steph, stupid, misleading name, peered at me over his expensive sunglasses. Good morning to you, too, he said. He wore golf shorts and one of those patterned button-downs that only lean guys who spent hours a week at the gym could pull off. My dog shoved half his body out onto the porch and gazed lovingly up at the intruder. Who's a good boy? Who's a handsome boy? Steph said, squatting down to pet him. Waylon basked in the attention. I rubbed a hand over my face. What do you want? Mr. Smooth held up two cups of coffee in a to-go tray. Coffee talk? I snatched one out of his hand and stomped away from the door into the kitchen. Waylon trotted after me, anticipating his breakfast. I popped the lid off the coffee and guzzled while I scooped up a helping of kibble. Dog fed, I shoved my head under the faucet and turned on the cold water, willing the shock to wake up my brain. I came up for air and found a hand towel hovering in front of my face. I took it without a thank you and dried off. Why are you bringing me coffee at an inhuman hour? To talk about Naomi, of course. I assumed you were quicker than this. I am when my sleep isn't interrupted. So maybe it hadn't been the sleep I was pissed off about. Maybe it was the dream involving Naomi's cherry-painted lips that had just been getting warmed up when this asshole decided to be social. My apologies, I figured this talk couldn't wait, he said, pulling out a stool at the counter. I crumpled up the towel and threw it in the sink. Is this the part where you tell me to back off your girl? Steph laughed. Something funny. You're one of those straights with baggage that complicates everything, he said, leaning on the counter. You have until I finish this coffee before I throw you out. Fine. I appreciate you looking out for Naomi. 
You hear a stranger is asking questions around town looking for her, and you got her and Wei Lei out, made sure they were safe. She's not used to someone taking care of her like that. Didn't do it because I want to get in her pants. No, even though you do, because you're not stupid. You did it because you wanted to protect her. So even though you've got this whole Oscar the sexy grouch thing going, you're already miles beyond Warner, in my opinion. I kept my face neutral, not willing to show any interest in this new topic. Warner used her, and I tried to warn her. Hell, I even warned him, but Naomi did what she's always done. Cleaned up everyone else's messes, I said. Steph raised an eyebrow. Well, 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 look who's been paying attention. Waylon let out a hearty burp from the floor. He sat staring at his now empty dish as if expecting it to magically refill. What's your point? She spent her entire life trying to make up for her sister, who sucks, by the way, and it keeps biting her in the ass. Be the perfect student. Get the perfect job. Marry the perfect guy. Now she signed up to take care of an 11-year-old in a strange place and is hoping that if she can just be good enough, she can stop her parents' hearts from breaking again. I shoved a hand through my hair. What does any of this have to do with me? Steph held up his hands and grinned. Look, I get it if you're in that whole I'm not interested phase. The last thing Naomi needs right now is a hot and heavy relationship that's going to get messy because of your baggage. But if you keep looking out for her like you did yesterday, we won't have a problem. And if I don't? If you use that accommodating nature of hers against her, then we're going to have a huge problem. I can be very creative when it comes to finding ways to make you regret being an asshole. It was ballsy. I had to give it to him. Showing up to a stranger's house with coffee and then threatening him. It felt like something I might do, minus the coffee thing. What kind of creative problem is this Warner asshole having right now? Steph took a long sip of coffee. Right now, I'm letting the humiliation of being left at the altar by the woman he told his friends was beneath his class do its work. But if he comes near her again, I'll ruin him. What did he do? I asked. He blew out a breath and took a sip of his own coffee. I didn't know specifics until last night, and I've been sworn to secrecy. Bad. Steph's jaw clenched. Bad, he agreed. I didn't like that this guy had Naomi's confidence, that he had access to her secrets, and I was on the outside left guessing. But I could think of a few dozen things that fell under the category of bad. Any one of them would be worth breaking an asshole's jaw over. He better hope he's never dumb enough to step foot in town limits, I said, putting my empty cup down. Hate to break it to you, Steph said, looking up from the full body scratch he was giving Waylon. He's definitely that dumb. Besides, where else would he go when he realizes that Naomi's the one who solved every problem he ever had? He's already emailing her every day. It's only a matter of time before he figures out where she is. I'll be ready for him, I said grimly. Good. I'm still sticking around for a while, at least until I know she's okay. But I can't be next to her at all times. It helps to know there's someone else looking out for her. She wouldn't take him back, would she? I surprised myself with the question. Steph seemed to enjoy the fact that I'd asked the question. No, but she's soft enough that she might try to help him clean himself up. Fuck. There's nothing our girl loves more than getting her hands on a disaster and making it shine. He gave me a long, even look, and I didn't much care for the connotation. I wasn't a disaster. There was nothing wrong with me. I had my fucking life figured out. Fine. So what do we do in the meantime? Money's tight for her. She spent most of her own savings on the wedding. Fucking romantics. 
never even considering that things could and would go horribly wrong. She's prickly about taking loans or handouts, though she might have no choice once her parents catch wind of the situation. They blow into town pissed off at Evil Twin and then try to take care of down-on-her-luck Good Twin, I guessed. He tossed me a salute. That about sums it up. I blew out a sigh. She's got no car, no computer. She's picked up some bar shifts from me. But it wasn't enough for a family of two to live off for long. And the best paying shifts were nights, which meant someone had to watch Whaley. Single moms were the world's unsung fucking heroes. Steph took his phone out of his back pocket, thumbs moving over the screen. I'm going to apply some charming pressure and push her to put her house up for sale. She's only had it two years, but she had a decent down payment and property values are going up in that neighborhood. There should be enough equity there to help her cash flow problem. I searched my memory for something that was niggling in the back of my head. The librarian said something about a part-time gig if a grant comes through. I could make sure that grant lands. He looked at me over his screen. Putting those lottery winnings to good use? So Mr. Smooth had looked me up. It wasn't exactly a secret, and I'd have done the same in his place. What exactly do you do? I asked. He shrugged, still typing. A little of this, a little of that. I've got a guy who can deal with the house. As soon as she gives the okay, we'll have an offer within a week. Two tops, he predicted. I drained the last of the coffee. So she didn't live with this asshole? Not officially. He was going to move in with her after the wedding. Reluctant bastard liked having his own place. Especially since Naomi cleaned it for him and took care of his meals and laundry. I hope that fucker is sitting in a pair of dirty underwear sobbing into a pot of Campbell's. I stared at him a beat. Who the fuck are you? Me? Steph laughed, stowing his phone back in his pocket. I'm the best friend. Naomi is family. And you two never... He sat there smugly and waited for me to say it. Never what? Never dated? Not unless you count taking her to senior prom because Tina got caught with her mouth on Naomi's date's dick in the locker room at school. Fucking Tina. Naomi's been my ride or die before ride or die was a thing. She has never once let me down and she's forgiven me for the handful of occasions that I've let her down. She's the most amazing woman I know, and that's counting her mother, who's pretty fucking awesome too. I don't like it when people fuck with my family. I could respect that. I'll take that grunt to mean we have an understanding. You'll watch out for her, you won't fuck with her, and together we'll make sure Warner fucking dipshit the third never gets within a city block of her. I nodded again. Fine. Give me your phone, he said, holding out his hand. Why? Oh, you want me to text Naomi when Warner shows up looking for her? I handed it over. Steph held it up to my scowling face to unlock it. Huh. Wonder if it would unlock if you were smiling. I don't know. Never tried. He smirked. I like you, Knox. You sure you're not interested in our girl? Definitely not. I lied. Steph studied me. Hmm. You're either dumber than you look, or you're a better liar than I thought. Are you done? I'd like to get back to not having you in my house. 18. Makeovers for everyone. Naomi. Surprise! Steph said as he pulled into a parking space directly in front of Whiskey Clipper. Uh-oh. What are we doing here? I asked. Back to school here, Steph said. Seriously? Waylay asked, biting her lip. She couldn't quite pull off the bored preteen vibe, and I knew it was going to be a good idea, even if it meant braving a run-in with Knox. Deadly, darling, Steph said, hopping out from behind the wheel of his spiffy little Porsche SUV. He opened the back door for her. 
First day of school is a fresh start for everyone, and from the reviews, this is the place for hair. I climbed out and joined them on the sidewalk. Steph slung an arm around both of us. First hair, then lunch, then nails, then fashion show for first day outfits. I grinned. Outfits? You're walking way to the bus. You need something that says, responsible yet hot aunt. Waylay giggled. Most moms just show up in pajamas or in sweaty workout stuff. Exactly. We need to make a statement that the wit women are fierce and fashionable. I rolled my eyes. Steph caught me and crossed his arms in impatience. What have I always told you, Naomi? And you listen to this too, Way. When you look good, you feel good, I recited. Good girl, now get your cute little asses in there. The interior of Whiskey Clipper was cooler than any salon I'd ever set foot in. Instead of the muted pastels and spa music typical in most hair establishments, here it was brick walls and 70s rock. Black and white photos of knock em out in the early part of the 20th century hung in stylish gallery frames. One entire wall was dominated by a bar of decanters and bottles of whiskey. Exotic flower arrangements occupied the low, curved front desk and the whiskey bar. The waiting area looked more like a VIP lounge with its leather couches and glass side tables. The concrete floor was covered with a faux cowhide rug. It felt cool, a little steampunky, and a lot expensive. I turned to my friend and lowered my voice. Steph, I know you were being nice, but money... Shut your stupid, beautiful face, Witty. This is on me. He held up a hand when I opened my mouth to argue. I didn't get you a wedding present. Why not? He looked at me dryly for a long beat. Right. Of course you predicted it. Look, you're getting your my fiancé likes my hair long shit cut into something you love. And that adorable smart-ass niece of ours is getting a style that is going to be more interesting to those little fuckers in the sixth grade. You're impossible to argue with, you know that? You might as well save your energy and quit trying. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Jeremiah called from a station with an ornate mirror and a scarlet cape draped over the chair. Who's ready to change their lives today? Waylay sidled up to me. Is he serious? Steph took her by the shoulders. Listen, Shorty, you've never experienced the miracle of the kind of haircut that is so good it parts the clouds and makes the angels sing. You're in for a treat today. What if I don't like it? She whispered. If you don't like it, our next stop will be Target, and I'll buy you every hair accessory in existence until we find the perfect way to style your new hair. Your hair is yours. You get to decide what to do with it, I assured her. You get to decide how you show up in this world. No one else gets to dictate to you who you are, Steph said. I knew he was saying it for Waylay's benefit, but the truth resonated deep down inside me, too. I'd lost myself while trying to convince someone else that I was what he wanted. I'd forgotten who I was because I'd let someone else take over the definition. Okay, Waylay said. But if I hate it, I'm going to blame you guys. Let's do this, I said with conviction. There she is, Steph said, booping my nose and then Waylay's. Now, let's get started. He made a beeline for Jeremiah. Your friend is weird, Waylay whispered. I know. I kind of like him. Yeah, me too. Maybe it was the second glass of champagne Jeremiah poured for me. Or maybe it was the fact that having a man's fingers massaging my scalp and playing with my hair was a long-forgotten delight. But whatever the reason, I felt relaxed for the first time in... I couldn't count backwards that far. It wasn't that I didn't have things to worry about. There were plenty of those looming, like the guardianship, and money, and the fact that I still hadn't told my parents about their granddaughter. But right now, 
I had a gorgeous man's hands rubbing delicious circles into my scalp, a glass full of bubbles, and a niece who couldn't stop giggling over whatever Stasia was saying to her while they worked on temporary lowlights. Steph and Jeremiah were deep in conversation about hair textures and product. I wondered if I was imagining the hint of spark between the two. The lingering smiles, the long, flirtatious glances. It had been a while since Steph had been in anything resembling a relationship, and the gorgeous, talented Jeremiah was definitely his kind of catnip. I heard the roar of a motorcycle out on the street. The engine revved once before cutting off abruptly. A few seconds later, the front door opened. Hey, boss, Stasia called out. My bubble of bliss popped. The responding grunt had my heart trying to flutter its way out of my chest like an anxiety-ridden butterfly trapped in a glass jar. Stay, Jeremiah said firmly, pressing a hand to my shoulder. I couldn't see Knox, but I could feel his presence. Knox, Steph drawled. Steph. I opened my eyes, wondering when the two of them had gotten on a grudging first-name basis. Hey, Way, Knox said, his voice a little softer. Hi, she chirped. I heard the approach of his boots, and every muscle in my body went rigid. No woman looked good with wet hair in a salon chair. Not that I was going for alluring or anything, although I was wearing the underwear he'd bought me. Naomi, he rasped. What was it about my name from that mouth that made my nether regions feel like they were being electrocuted? In a super sexy, fun way. Knox, I managed to choke out. Your face is red, Jeremiah noted. Is the water too hot? Steph snickered. I swear to God I could hear a smugness in the steady clomp of boots as they slowly retreated to the back of the shop. <sighs> Way to be cool, me. Steph let out a low whistle from the barber chair he was occupying. Sparks, he sang quietly. I raised my head out of the sink, sending a tidal wave of water over the lip of the bowl. What is the matter with you? I hissed. Shut up. He raised his palms in surrender. Fine, sorry. As Jeremiah gently stuffed me back into the sink, I fumed. I didn't want or need sparks, and I certainly didn't want or need anyone else calling attention to them. Jeremiah wrapped a towel around my sodden hair and led me back to his station. Waylay was in the chair behind me, discussing cut and style options with Stasia and Steph. So, how do we feel about getting rid of some dead weight? Jeremiah asked, holding my gaze in the mirror. He hefted the bulk of my damp hair in one hand and held it above my shoulders. We feel really good about that, I decided. I was mid-second thought panic as Jeremiah aggressively snipped his way through my long hair when Knox returned with a cup of coffee and some kind of short leather apron over his worn jeans. With his tattoo-adorned arms, the ruthlessly trimmed beard, and those scarred motorcycle boots, he looked like the definition of a man. Our eyes locked in the mirror, and my breath caught in my throat. After a too-long beat, Knox whistled and hooked his thumb at the client in the waiting area, the man hefted his tall frame out of the chair and lumbered back. How's it going, Aunt Naomi? Waylay called from behind me. Still look like a wet mop? Kids were jerks. She's being transformed as we speak, Jeremiah promised, sliding his long fingers through my significantly shorter hair. I choked back a purr. How's your hair? I asked my niece. Blue! I like it! She said it with a mix of reverence and excitement that had me smiling. I gave up worrying about whether or not I was overcompensating and turning Waylay into an entitled brat and decided to just go with it. How blue? Like Smurfette blue? Who's Smurfette? Waylay asked. 
Uh, who's Smurfette? Stasia scoffed. I heard her rummaging through her pockets and then the telltale sound of the Smurf theme song coming from a phone. That's Smurfette. Wish my hair was as long as hers, Waylay said wistfully. You got it pretty short before you came in here, but it'll grow, Stasia told her with confidence. Waylay was silent for a moment, and I craned my neck for a glimpse of her in the mirror. I didn't cut it, she said, eyes meeting mine. What's that, sweetheart? Stasia asked. I didn't cut it, Waylay said again. My mom did, as a punishment. Couldn't ground me because she was never around, so she chopped off my hair. That fucking b- Ouch! I kicked Steph, then spun my chair around. Waylay shrugged at the suddenly silent adults around her. It wasn't a big deal. That's what she'd told herself. I remembered the tidy bins of hair accessories in her old bedroom. Tina had taken something from her, something she'd taken pride in. Steph and Stasia looked to me, and I searched for the right words to make this okay. But someone beat me to it. Knox dropped the razor on a metal tray with a clang and crossed to Waylay's chair. You get that that was a dick move, right? Knox, language, I hissed. He ignored me. What your mom did was born out of a place of unhappiness and meanness inside her. It had nothing to do with you. You didn't cause it or deserve it. She was just being an asshole, yeah? Waylay's eyes narrowed as if she were waiting for the punchline. Yeah, she said tentatively. He nodded briskly. Good. I don't know why your mom does the things she does. I don't really want to know. Something's broke inside her, and that makes her treat others like shit. Got it? Waylay nodded again. Your Aunt Naomi over there isn't like that. She's not broken. She'll probably still fuck up now and then, but that's because she's human, not broken. Which is why, when you mess up, and you will because you're human too, there has to be a consequence. It won't be cutting your hair or not making you dinner, It'll be boring shit like chores and grounding and no TV. Got it? I got it, she said quietly. From here on out, if anyone says they have a right to decide what to do with your body, kid, you kick them in the ass, then come find me, Knox told her. Well, hell. The man's hotness had just escalated into underwear-melting territory. And me. Steph agreed. Jeremiah gave her a level look. Me too. Waylay's lips quirked, and she was having a hard time keeping her smile under wraps. I, on the other hand, suddenly felt a little damp in the eye and underwear areas. Then when they're done kicking ass, you come find me, Stasia said. And me. But preferably me first, before anyone goes to jail, I added. Party pooper, Jeremiah teased. You got it, Way? Knox pressed. The tiniest of smiles played on her lips. Yeah, I got it, she said. In that case, let's get back to giving you the best haircut in the world, Stasia said with extra cheer. My phone buzzed in my lap and I glanced at the screen. Steph told you your sister was a gigantic waste of DNA. I sighed and tossed him a glare, then typed. Me. I'm first in line for face punching when she turns up. Steph. Good girl. Also, I added a bikini wax to your mani-pedi. Me. Mean! Why? Steph. Growly tattoo guy deserves to get laid after that speech. Also, Jer is Fifty Shades of Gorgeous. Agree on both counts, Jeremiah said from where he was reading over my shoulder. Steph laughed while I turned six shades of scarlet. What are you agreeing to? Knox demanded. I clutched my phone to my chest and spun myself around to face the mirror. Nothing, 
No one is agreeing to anything, I said sharply. Face is burning up, Daisy, Knox observed. I considered crawling under my cape like a turtle and hiding there for the rest of my life. But then Jeremiah put his magic hands in my hair and did something lovely to my scalp, and I began to relax against my will. Everyone went back to other conversations while I snuck surreptitious glances in Knox's direction. Not only had the man just given a little girl a hero, he also appeared to be a competent barber. I'd never considered haircuts sexy until this moment, as Knox, arm muscles flexing, trimmed and shaped his client's thick, dark hair. Lots of mundane things were sexy when Knox Morgan was doing them. I'm ready for the razor? He asked gruffly. You know it, the man mumbled from under the hot towel on his face. I watched in fascination as Knox got to work with a straight razor and a sweet-smelling shaving cream on his friend's face. It felt more relaxing than all those pressure-washing videos I'd binged while planning the wedding. Straight, clean lines leaving behind nothing but smooth shine. You really should think about it, Jeremiah whispered as he liberated a curling iron from a tool organizer. Think about what? He caught my eye in the mirror and tilted his head in Knox's direction. Hard pass. Self-care maintenance, he said. I beg your pardon? Some women get manicures. Some get massages or go for therapy. Some hit the gym or their favorite bottle of Shiraz. But the best self-care maintenance, in my opinion, is regular, earth-shattering orgasms. This time I felt even the tips of my ears go pink. I just ran away from a groom and a wedding. I think my tank is topped off for a while, I whispered. Jeremiah deftly worked his way through my hair with the barrel of the iron. Suit yourself, but don't you dare waste this style. With a flourish, he whipped the cape from me and pointed at my reflection. Holy sh crap! I leaned in, shoving my fingers into the touchable chin-length bob. My dark brown hair now had russet highlights and curled in what I like to call sex waves. Steph let out a wolf whistle. Damn, Nomi! I'd spent two years growing my hair out for the perfect wedding updo because Warner liked long hair. Two years planning a wedding that didn't happen. Two years wasted, when I could have looked like this. Confident, stylish, sexy as hell. Even my eyes looked brighter, my smile bigger. Warner Dennison III was officially done taking things from me. What do you think, Aunt Naomi? Waylay asked. She stepped in front of me. Her blonde hair was cut short with a sweep of sleek bangs over one eye. A subtle blue teased through from the bottom layers. You look like you're 16, I groaned. Waylay gave her hair an experimental toss. I like it. I love it, I assured her. And with a sassy new cut, we'll be able to coax some length out of your hair if you want to grow it long again, Stasia told her. She tucked a strand behind her ear and looked at me. Maybe short hair isn't so bad after all. Stasia, Jeremiah, you're miracle workers, Steph said, pulling cash out of his wallet and pressing it into their hands. Thank you, I said, offering first Stasia and then Jeremiah a hug. Knox's eyes met mine in the mirror over Jeremiah's shoulder. I released him and looked away. Seriously, this was amazing. Where are we going now? Waylay wanted to know, still staring at herself in the mirror with that tiny smile on her lips. Nails, Steph said. Your aunt's hands look like talons. I felt the weight of cool blue-gray eyes on me and looked up. Knox watched me with an unreadable expression. I couldn't tell if he was smoldering or pissed off. See you around, boss. I carried the weight of his attention with me as I strutted for the door. Dear Mom and Dad, 
I hope you're having the best time on your cruise. I can't believe three weeks is almost up. Things here are good. I have some news for you. Actually, it's really Tina's news. Okay, here goes. Tina has a daughter, which means you have a granddaughter. Her name is Wele. She's 11 years old, and I'm watching her for Tina for a while. She's really great. Call me when you get home and I'll tell you the whole story. Maybe Wele and I can drive up for a weekend so you can meet her. Love, Naomi. 19. High Stakes, Naomi. Well, look who just strutted her fabulous ass in here, Fee called from the corner of Honky Tonk's bar where she was keying the night's specials into the system. I held out my arms and did a slow turn. Who knew a haircut could make me feel ten years younger and a thousand times sassier? Not to mention the short denim skirt Steph had talked me into. The man set the gold standard for being a best friend. While waiting for me to prance out of the dressing room in my new skirt, Steph had been on a conference call with his people, arranging to have my stuff packed and my house on Long Island put on the market. Tonight, he was staying with Wele, and I wasn't sure who was more excited about their plans to binge-watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine. "'You like the hair, Fee?' I asked, giving my head a shake to make the curls bounce. "'Love it. My brother's a damn genius with hair. Speaking of Jer, is your stuff single, and if so, can we play matchmaker?' "'Why? Did Jeremiah say anything about stuff? I demanded." He only casually mentioned that your friend was the hottest gay man to strut and to knock him out in a decade. I squealed. Steph asked me if Jeremiah was seeing anyone. Oh, it's so on, Fee announced, pulling the lollipop out of her mouth. By the way, I've got good news for you. I grinned as I stowed my purse behind the bar. Did Idris Elba come to his senses and offer to whisk you away to a private island? She grinned wickedly. Not quite that good, but you've got a party in the private room starting at nine. High rollers. I perked up. High rollers? Fee jerked her head toward the hallway. Poker game. Hush, hush. Half a dozen big spenders who feel like throwing away six figures on cards. Six figures? I blinked. Is this legal? I whispered the question despite the fact that we were alone in the empty bar. The lollipop returned to her mouth. Well, let's just say if Chief Morgan wanders his fine ass in here tonight, he doesn't get in that room. I wasn't sure how I felt about it. As someone who was supposed to be looking good in the eyes of the court, I probably shouldn't be lying to law enforcement about anything. But I'd cross that bridge when I had to tonight. Feeling happy, I swung into the kitchen to get set up for the busy night. The extent of my professional poker knowledge was entirely based on the snippets of games I'd seen on TV while changing channels. I was pretty sure the players on TV looked nothing like the ones crowded around the round table in Honky Tonk's secret back room. Beneath his turquoise polo shirt, the British-accented Ian had muscles that looked like he bench-pressed cars all day. He had dark skin, short cropped hair, and the kind of smile that made a woman's knees go weak. He was wearing a wedding ring with a whole lot of diamonds. On Ian's right was Tanner. He had reddish blonde hair that looked like a woman's fingers had just left it. He wore the DC commuter uniform of expensive fitted trousers, rolled up shirt sleeves, and a loosened tie no wedding ring, and he'd made certain I'd noticed with every top-shelf scotch I brought him. He fidgeted constantly and jumped every time the door opened. On Tanner's right was a man the rest referred to as Grim, though I doubted his parents had actually named him that. He looked like he'd walked right off the pages of a Silver Fox Motorcycle Club romance novel. Tattoos crisscrossed every inch of visible skin. He kept his sunglasses and scowl firmly in place as he lounged in his chair, sticking to club sodas. Next to Grimm was Winona, the only woman at the table. She was tall, built, 
black, and wore pink metallic eyeshadow that complemented the accents on her figure-hugging denim romper. Her hair was big and bold, just like her laugh, which she was sharing with the man next to her. Lucy, 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 she said. When are you going to learn not to bluff me? Lucian was the kind of handsome that made women wonder if he'd made some pact with the devil. Dark hair, dark smoldery eyes, dark suit. He gave off hints of power, wealth, and secrets like a cologne. He'd arrived later than everyone else, shedding his jacket and rolling up his sleeves as if he had all the time in the world. He took his bourbon neat and didn't try to look down my shirt when I served it. Maybe when you stop distracting me with your wit and beauty, he teased. Please, Winona scoffed, elegantly stacking her winnings with long red fingernails. I was in the middle of trying to figure out how much one chip was worth and topping off the pitcher of ice water in the corner when the door burst open. Tanner and I both jumped. Knox strode into the room, looking annoyingly sexy as always. You son of a bitch, he said. Everyone held their breath. Everyone, that is, except for Lucian, who continued to deal the next hand, unruffled by the interruption. I was wondering how long it would take word to travel, he said blandly. He set the deck down and came to his feet. For a second, I was sure they were going to launch themselves at each other like stags fighting for supremacy in a nature documentary. Or, you know, actual nature. Instead, Knox's scowl melted and was replaced with the kind of grin that made me feel as warm and gooey inside as a chocolate chip cookie fresh from the oven. Note to self, make chocolate chip cookies. The two men shook hands and exchanged back slaps that would have put me in a chiropractor's office. What the hell are you doing here? Knox asked, less aggressively this time. I'm currently losing to Winona and thinking about ordering another drink. I'll get it. Anyone else want another round? I squeaked. Knox's gaze fell on me. His grin vanished so quickly I wondered if he'd sprained a facial muscle. He took a leisurely, scowly tour of my appearance from hair to feet, disapproval snapping off him like electricity. Naomi, outside, now, he growled. Seriously? What's your problem this time, Viking? There a problem? Grimm asked, his voice low and dangerous. None of your concern. Knox's voice had dropped into sub-zero temperatures. Go ahead and bring everyone around, Naomi, Ian suggested, his eyes on Knox. I nodded and headed for the door. Knox was on my heels. He shut the door behind us and took me by the arm, steering me down the empty hallway away from the bar, past his secret lair office. He didn't stop until he'd opened the door at the far end of the hall, which opened into Whiskey Clipper's supply room. What the hell, Knox? What the fuck are you doing in that room dressed like that? I gestured at my empty tray. What does it look like? I'm serving drinks. This ain't tea time at some goddamn country club, sweetheart. And those people aren't on the PTA. I pinched the bridge of my nose. I'm going to need a pie chart or a Venn diagram or a database to catalog all of the many ways I piss you off. Why are you mad that I'm doing my job? You shouldn't be serving that party. Look, if you're not going to explain, then I don't think I'm responsible for listening. I have drinks to deliver. You can't just wander into dangerous situations like this. I threw up my arms. Oh, for Pete's sake, I didn't wander. I showed up for my shift. Fee gave me the table because she knew they'd tip well. He stepped close enough that his boots brushed the tips of my shoes. I want you out of that room. Excuse me. You're the one who lets them play here, and you're the one who hired me to serve drinks. Ergo, you're the one with the problem. He leaned in until we were almost touching. Naomi, these aren't just weekend warriors on bikes or your typical Beltway roadkill. They can be dangerous if they want to be. Yeah, well, so can I. And if you try to take me off that table, you're going to find out exactly how dangerous. 
Fuck me, he muttered under his breath. That's not happening, I scoffed. He closed his eyes, and I knew the big dummy was counting to ten. I let him get to six before stepping around him. My hand had just closed around the doorknob when he caught me, trapping me between the door and his body. His breath was hot on the back of my neck. I could feel my heartbeat in my head. Days, he said. Goosebumps prickled on my arms. Warner's only pet name for me had been Babe. And for a moment, I was paralyzed with a desire so intense I didn't recognize it as my own. What? I whispered. They're not your kind of people. If that dickhead Tanner gets too much overpriced scotch in him, he starts hitting on anything with a rack and losing hands. That skirt you're barely wearing is already a distraction. He loses too much, he starts talking shit and starting fights. Grim? He runs his own motorcycle club in D.C. Mostly personal protection now, but he still dabbles in less legal ventures. Trouble follows him. Knox was close enough to me that his chest brushed lightly against my back. Ian's made and lost more millions than anyone else at that table. He's got enough enemies out there that you don't want to be standing next to him when one of them shows up. And Winona carries a grudge. She feels she's been done wrong. She'll burn down your world with a smile on her face. What about Lucian? For a moment, there was nothing but the sound of our breathing to cover the silence between us. Loose is a whole other kind of dangerous, he said finally. Carefully, I turned to face him, not quite managing to cover the flinch when my breasts brushed his chest. His nostrils flared and my heart rate picked up. I've had no problems at that table, and I'm willing to bet if it were Fee or Silver or Max on that party, you wouldn't be having this conversation. They know how to handle trouble, and I don't. Baby, you showed up in town in a fucking wedding dress with flowers in your hair. You scream into pillows when you get stressed out. That doesn't mean I can't handle myself. He put a hand on the door behind me and leaned into the last bit of my space. You need a goddamn keeper. I'm not some helpless damsel in distress, Knox. Really. Where would you be if it wasn't me who found you in the cafe? Staying in Tina's shithole trailer with Way? No job, no car, no phone. I was getting very close to whacking him over the head with my tray. You caught me on a bad day. Bad day? Fuck me, Naomi. If I didn't drive your ass to the goddamn mall, you still wouldn't have a cell phone. Like it or not, you need someone watching out for you because you're too damn stubborn to do it yourself. You're too busy trying to take care of everyone else to bother with yourself. His chest was pressing against mine, and I was having trouble focusing on the fury that rose in my throat. Hot, hard muscle against soft flesh. His proximity made me feel drunk. You're not kissing me, I insisted. In hindsight, the warning was a tad presumptuous since he'd never kissed me before. But to be fair, he really looked like he wanted to kiss me. I'd rather wring your pretty little neck right now, he said, eyes narrowing on my mouth. I licked my lips, preparing to definitely not kiss him. The low rumble in his chest vibrated through my body as he dipped his head toward mine. A new vibration interrupted us. Fuck, he hissed, yanking his phone out of his pocket. What? He listened, then let out a string of colorful curses. Don't let him pass the bar. I'll be out in a second. What's wrong? I asked. See? That right there is your problem he said, pointing a finger in my face as he yanked the door open. What? You're suddenly too worried about me to watch your own ass while you're serving a table of criminals. 
Has anyone ever told you you're ridiculously dramatic? I asked as he hauled me out. He was texting with his free hand. No one who didn't have a death wish. Let's go, Daze. This time, I'll let you make my problem yours. 20. A Winning Hand Knox My problem, besides the length of Naomi's skirt, was leaning against the bar in full uniform, making small talk with a handful of regulars. I dragged Naomi with me into the alcove of the kitchen doors. My brother doesn't get near that room. Got it? Her eyes widened. Why are you telling me? Because you're going to distract him and get him the hell out of here. She dug in her heels and crossed her arms. I don't recall the section of my job application that required me to lie to law enforcement. I'm not telling you to lie. I'm telling you to get those good girl eyes and that cleavage over there and flirt with him until he forgets all about busting that game. That doesn't sound any better than lying. It sounds like prostitution, and I'm pretty sure any family court judge would frown upon that during a custody hearing. I blew out a breath through my nostrils, then dug out my wallet. Fine. I'll give you a hundred bucks. Deal. I was still blinking when she snapped the bill out of my hand and headed in my brother's direction. It was an asshole move on my part, using her need for cash and putting her in a sketchy position. But I knew my brother, and Nash wouldn't do anything to hurt Naomi's chances at becoming Waylay's guardian. Hell, any idiot with one good eye could tell the woman was several classes above her sister. Fuck. I muttered to no one. Interesting. I found Fee leaning against the wall smugly enjoying one of the lollipops that served as a cigarette surrogate. What? Her eyebrows wiggled. You never freaked when Max or me served that party. You and Max know how to handle yourselves, I argued. Looks like Naomi was handling herself just fine in there. Maybe the problem isn't her? You want to be my new problem, fiasco? I snarled. She was not remotely intimidated, which was exactly why a boss shouldn't be friends with their employees. I think Knox Morgan is Knox Morgan's biggest problem, but hey, what do I know? She said with an annoying little shrug. Don't you have work to do? And miss the show? Fee nodded over my shoulder. I turned and spied Naomi putting a flirtatious hand on my brother's arm. When she laughed and tossed her hair, my brilliant plan didn't seem so brilliant. God damn it. I left Fee and maneuvered my way through the crowd, getting close enough to hear Nash say, Let me guess, illegal poker game in the back room and you were sent to distract me. Fuck me. Naomi's eyes went wide, and I realized the woman had no poker face whatsoever. Uh... Are you always this handsome and intelligent? She asked. I am, Nash said with a stupid wink that made me want to punch him in his stupid face. But it also helps that this town doesn't know how to keep its mouth shut. I'm not here for the game. Well, you're not here for my wait staff, so what the hell are you doing here? I said, interjecting myself into their cozy little conversation like a jealous idiot. Nash shot me a smug look as if he knew exactly how annoying I found him. Heard an old friend was in town. The rumors are true. We all turned and found Lucian standing just outside our circle. My brother grinned and shoved me out of the way. He welcomed Lucian with a hard hug and a slap on the back. Good to have you back, brother. It's good to be back, Lucian agreed, returning the hug especially since the waitstaff got even more interesting. He gave Naomi a wink. Why the fuck the entire town suddenly decided winking at Naomi was a good idea was beyond me, and I was going to put a stop to it as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, everything's great, 
I said. Don't you have drinks to serve? Naomi rolled her eyes. I didn't get rid of your brother yet? You can keep the hundred if you go away, I said, needing to get her out from between my brother and my best friend. Deal. Lucian, I'll see you back in there with a fresh drink, she promised. Nash, it was fun flirting with you. The pleasure was all mine, darling. My brother drawled, tossing her a little salute. We all watched her sashay to the bar. My head hurt from not yelling. My jaw was so tight I worried I'd crack a tooth. I didn't know what it was about that woman, but Naomi Witt had me tied up in fucking knots. I didn't like it one bit. What are you doing back in town? Nash asked Lucian. You sound like a cop, Lucian complained. I am a cop. Chief Nash rankled me. The three of us had grown up raising hell and bending laws until they broke. Nash growing up to be a cop felt like some kind of betrayal. The straight and narrow was too confining for me. I didn't stray too far from the line these days, but I made sure to step into the gray every now and again for old time's sake. Lucian was another story. Trouble didn't follow him. He had a tendency to make it wherever he went. If he was back and knock him out, it sure as hell wasn't for a stroll down memory lane. A man can't feel nostalgic for his childhood? Lucian mused, expertly avoiding the question. Your childhood sucked, Nash pointed out. You haven't been back in years. Something brought you back and it better not be trouble. Maybe I got tired of hearing how the Morgan brothers are too stubborn to remove their heads from their asses. Maybe I came back to help you bury the hatchet. Naomi breezed by with a tray full of drinks and an easy smile for Lucian and Nash. The smile changed to a scowl when she looked at me. No one needs any help with any hatchet, I insisted, stepping in front of him to cut off his view of Naomi's curvy, retreating ass. That hatchet that you two have been wrestling over for two years is stupid. Get over it and move the fuck on, Lucian said. Don't use that beltway bullshit tone with us, Nash said. Lucian had built a political consulting firm that involved far too many shadows for Nash's liking. Our friend had a gift for putting the fear of God into his clients or the people who stood between his clients and what they wanted. That shit don't fly and knock him out, I reminded him. You two have nothing to worry about. Let's have a drink for old time's sake, he suggested. Can't tonight, Nash said. On duty. Then I guess you'd better get back to work, I told my brother. Guess I better. Try not to let any pissed off poker players bust up the place tonight. I don't feel like handling the paperwork. Dinner, tomorrow night, your place, Lucian said, pointing upstairs. Works for me, I said. Fine, Nash agreed. It is good to see you, Lucy. Lucian gave him a half smile. It's good to be seen, he turned to me. I'll catch up with you when you're hovering over Naomi. I flipped him off. When he left, Nash turned to me. You got a second? Depends. It's about Tina. Fuck. I'll walk you out. The August night was still smotheringly humid when we went through the kitchen and walked out into the parking lot. What's the problem? I asked when we got to Nash's SUV. Got a few more details on Tina. She and her new man were moving stolen goods. Nothing major. TVs and phones, tablets. But rumor has it the boyfriend is connected to some bigger criminal enterprise. Who's the boyfriend? He shook his head. Either no one knows his name or they're not saying it to me. Don't got much of anything, do you? Just a gut feeling. Tina didn't just decide to abandon her kid for fun. I think she's in deep with some shit. He looked up at the inky night sky. 
Heard a couple of people saying they think they saw her over in Lawlerville. Lawlerville was less than a half hour's drive, which meant Tina probably wasn't planning on staying gone. Fuck, I muttered. Yeah. I knew what Nash wanted from me. Any other circumstance, I would have made a mask. But since this involved Naomi and Wele, I wasn't in the mood to fuck around. I'll ask around, see if any sources who avoid cops will feel chatty with me, I told him. Appreciate it. Instead of going home like I'd planned, I pretended to check a few things off my list. I played bar back for Silver while Max took her dinner break. Then I answered the two dozen or so emails I'd been avoiding. I even ducked into the shop supply room and cut down cardboard boxes for the recycler. The fourth time I caught myself heading in the direction of the poker game, I decided to remove myself from temptation and headed for the keg room. I hoped the chill and the physical labor of moving full kegs around would take the edge off my annoyance. I had a whole list of reasons to be pissed off at the world, and most of them revolved around Naomi Whip. Every conversation with her ended in me having a headache and a hard-on. Watching other men trip over their tongues when she was around only made it all worse. I didn't want her, but I wanted to claim her as mine just to keep every other asshole away from her. I needed to get drunk and laid. I needed to forget she existed. My hands were fucking frozen and my temper had cooled by the time I finished restacking the kegs. It was almost eleven. I figured I'd check in at the bar, then go the hell home. When I hit the bar, Silver glanced up from the moonshine she was pouring. Mind checking on the private party? She asked. Why? She shrugged. Been a while since I've seen Naomi. My temper reignited like someone had thrown a gas can and a lighter on it. I didn't exactly kick the door open, but it was a more dramatic entrance than I usually made. Tanner, the skinny idiot who partied too hard to hold on to his money, fell out of his chair. Naomi, however, didn't bother looking up. She was squeezed in between Winona and Grimm, tongue poking out between her lips as she studied the cards in her hand. Okay, tell me again what beats a pair, she said. Ian launched into a Texas Hold'em 101 lecture while Grimm leaned over to look at her hand. Raise him, he advised. Tentatively, she picked up a blue chip and looked at him. He shook his head. She added two more chips and on his nod, tossed them into the pile at the center of the table. Raise, she announced wiggling her ass in her seat. I rounded the table and leaned in. What the fuck are you doing, Naomi? She finally looked up at me, bemused. Learning to play poker. Fold, Winona sighed. Never trust a rookie's luck. I'll see you and raise you, Lucian decided, dropping a fistful of chips onto the table. Leave her alone, Morgan. Ian told me. Our drinks are full and she's never played. I bared my teeth. Relax, Morgan, Winona said. We all staked her some chips. It's just a friendly hand. Lucian and Naomi were engaged in a stare down. I leaned in again and whispered in her ear. Do you know what those chips are worth? She shook her head, watching as the action returned to Ian, who folded. They told me not to worry about it. That's 20 grand in the pot, Naomi. I'd push the right button. She stopped staring at Lucian and looked at me as she started to come out of her chair. Grim put a hand on her shoulder to hold her in place, and I fixed him with a cold glare. Fucking relax, Knox, he said. Winona's right, it's a friendly hand. No loans, no interest. She's a quick learner. Twenty thousand dollars? Naomi squeaked. I'll call, Tanner decided, throwing in his chips. Show him, Grim growled, shoving a matching stack of chips into the center of the table. 
Tanner lay down a shitty two pair. Lucian took his time arranging his cards before revealing a nice little straight. Uh oh, Winona hummed under her breath. Your turn, sweetheart, Grim said, his face unreadable. Naomi dropped her cards face up on the table. I believe this is a bigger straight than yours, Lucian, she said. The table erupted in cheers. You just won $22,000, Winona told her. Holy shit, holy shit! Naomi looked up at me, and the joy on her face was a sucker punch to my windpipe. Congratulations. Now get your ass up, I said, still capable of being an ass. Lucian groaned. Suckered in by those innocent eyes. Every damn time. I didn't want him looking at her eyes or any other part of her. I pulled Naomi's chair out for her. Wait! Do I get a victory dance? How do I pay everyone back? You definitely get a victory dance, Tanner said, lecherously patting his lap. Ian saved me the trouble and slapped him in the back of the head. Naomi, now, I said, hooking my thumb toward the door. Hold your horses, Viking. She carefully counted out equal shares of the chips and started returning them to their original owners. Grim shook his head and covered her hand with his tattooed one. You won fair and square. You're keeping the winnings and you can have my stake. Oh, but I couldn't, she began. I insist. And when I insist, people do what I tell them. Naomi didn't see a scary biker sort of criminal making that proclamation. She saw a cuddly, tattooed fairy godfather. When she tossed her arms around his neck and gave him a noisy kiss on the cheek, I saw the man actually smile, a feat previously thought to be impossible. For that reaction, you'll keep mine as well, Lucian said. Naomi whooped and rounded the table and kissed him loudly on the cheek. Ian and Winona did the same and laughed through Naomi's stranglehold hugs. Get that niece of yours something pretty, Winona told her. Christ on a cracker, exactly how much of her autobiography had she shared with him? I'm uh, just going to hang on to mine, Tanner said, pulling back the chips he'd loaned her. The rest of the table glared at him. Cheap ass, Winona said. Come on, it's been a rough week, he whined. In that case, here's a tip from me, Naomi said, handing over a $100 chip. The woman was a sucker, and it looked like Tanner was officially in love. Ladies, gentlemen, what do you say we call it a night? I hear there's a band out front tonight. We could steal one or two of Knox's private bottles and reminisce about the good old days, Ian suggested. Only if Lucy promises me a dance. Winona said. I waited until they'd cashed out and exited the room, leaving Naomi and me alone. She looked up from the pile of cash they'd left in front of her. It was one, one hell of a tip. Can we leave the lecture for tomorrow so I can just enjoy? Fine, I said through gritted teeth, but I'm driving you home tonight. Fine, but you're not allowed to yell at me on the drive. I can't make any promises. 21. Family Emergency. Naomi. My feet were begging for a break, but the $20,000 in my apron gave me more than enough energy to face the final hour of my shift. Naomi! I spotted Sloane at a table in the corner with middle-aged biker babes and library board members Blaze and Agatha. Sloane had her hair pulled back in a perky ponytail and was wearing cutoffs and flip-flops. Blaze and Agatha were in their usual uniform of denim and vegan leather. Hey, I greeted them with a spring in my step. Out on the town? We're celebrating, Sloane explained. The library just got a big fat grant that I didn't even remember applying for. 
Not only does that mean we can start offering free community breakfast and upgrade the second floor computers, I can also officially offer you that part-time gig. Are you serious? I asked, elation rising inside me. As serious as a nun in detention, Blaze said, slapping the table. Sloan grinned. It's yours if you want it. I want it. The librarian held out her hand. Welcome to the Knockabout Public Library, Ms. Community Outreach Coordinator. You officially start next week. Come by this weekend and we'll talk about your new duties. I grabbed her hand and shook it. Then I hugged her. Then I hugged Blaze and Agatha. Can I buy you beautiful, amazing ladies around? I asked, releasing a dazed-looking Agatha. A public librarian can't say no to free drinks. It's in the town charter, Sloan said. Neither can us literary support of lesbians, Agatha added. My wife is right, Blaze agreed. I floated through the crowd on the dance floor and plugged in the order for my new bosses. I was thinking about the car I could now afford and the desk I wanted to buy Waylay for her room when Lucian appeared. I believe you owe me a dance, he said, holding out his hand. I laughed. <laughs> I guess it's the least I can do since you let me win. I never let anyone win, he assured me, taking my tray and setting it at a table of lady horse farmers who didn't seem to mind. That's very mercenary of you, I observed. The band shifted into a slow, twangy tune about lost love. Lucian pulled me into his arms, and once again, I found myself wondering why Knockamout had such a large population of impossibly sexy men. I was also wondering what Lucian's motive was for asking me to dance. He struck me as the type of man who never did anything without an ulterior motive. Knox and Nash, he began. I congratulated myself on being so astute. What about them? They're my best friends. Their feud has run its course. I want to make sure it doesn't get stirred back up. What does that have to do with me? Everything. I guffawed right in the man's face. You think I'm going to reignite some feud that I had nothing to do with in the first place? You're a stunning woman, Naomi. More than that, you're interesting, funny, and kind. You're worth fighting for. Well, thank you for your kind but bizarre opinion. But you can rest easy knowing that Knox and I can barely stand being in the same room. That doesn't always mean what you think it means, he said. He's rude, mercurial, and blames me for everything. Perhaps because you make him feel things he doesn't want to feel, Lucian pointed out. <laughs> like what? Murderous? What about Nash? He asked. Nash is the opposite of his brother, but I just got out of a long-term relationship. I'm in a new town trying to do what's best for my niece, who hasn't had the easiest life. There's no time left on the clock to explore things with any man, I said firmly. Good, because I know you'd hate to unintentionally add fuel to the fire. What started their stupid fire in the first place? I asked. Stubbornness, idiocy, ego, he said vaguely. I knew better than to expect a straight answer from a man who was like a brother to the Morgans. Hey, Naomi, can we add an order of... Sloan cut off mid-sentence. The petite blonde was staring open-mouthed up at Lucian like she'd just been sucker-punched. I felt Lucian's entire body go rigid. My heart sank with the realization that I'd somehow betrayed my new friend. Hey, I said weakly. Do you know... My awkward introduction was unnecessary. Sloan, Lucian said. While I shivered at the ice in his tone, Sloane had the opposite reaction. Her expression went mutinous, and an emerald fire snapped in her eyes. Is there an asshole convention in town I wasn't aware of? Still charming as always, Lucian snapped back. Fuck off, Rollins. With that parting shot, Sloane spun around and marched toward the door. Lucian still hadn't moved a muscle, but his gaze was glued to her retreating back. His hands, still on my hips, gripped me hard. 
You about ready to unhand my waitstaff loose? Knox growled behind me. Startled, I yelped. There were too many pissed off people in my vicinity. Lucian released me, gaze remaining on the door. Are you okay? I asked him. He's fine, Knox said. I'm fine. It was clearly a lie. The man looked as though he wanted to commit a cold-blooded murder. I wasn't sure who I should attempt to fix first. Dinner tomorrow, he said to Knox. Yeah, dinner. With that, he headed for the door. Is he okay? I asked Knox. How the hell should I know? He asked irritably. The door opened just as Lucian got to it, and Wiley Ogden, creepy ex-police chief, stepped inside. The man flinched, then covered it poorly with a smirk when he saw Lucian in front of him. They stared at each other for a long moment before Wiley stepped sideways, giving him a wide berth. What in the hell was that? I asked. Nothing, Knox lied. Silver whistled from the bar and waved him over. Knox headed in her direction, swearing under his breath. The guy was wound tighter than a mummy wrapped in Spanx. Did Sloane just leave? Blaze demanded, arriving at my side with Agatha on her heels. Yeah, I was dancing with Lucian Rollins. She took one look at him and left. Did I do something wrong? Blaze blew out a breath. <sighs> That's not good. Agatha shook her head. Definitely not good. They hate each other. Who could possibly hate Sloane? Isn't she the nicest person in Northern Virginia? Agatha shrugged. There's some kind of sticky history between those two. They grew up next door to each other. Didn't run the same crowds or anything. No one knows what happened, but they can't stand the sight of each other. I'd been caught dancing with my new friend slash boss's mortal enemy. Damn it. I needed to make this right. At least ignorance was a plausible defense. I was already reaching for my phone when it started ringing. It was Steph. Shoot, I have to take this, I told the bikers. Hey, is everything okay? Witty, I've got bad news. My heart stopped and then stuttered to a start again. I knew that tone of voice. This wasn't, we're out of champagne and ice cream. This was family emergency. What's wrong? Is Wele okay? I plugged my other ear with my finger to hear over the band. Way's fine, he said. But Nash was shot tonight. They don't know if he's going to pull through. He's in surgery. Oh my God, I whispered. Some sergeant named Grave notified Liza. He drove her to the hospital. He's sending someone to notify Knox. Knox. I found him through the crowd behind the bar, half smiling at something a customer said. He looked up and locked eyes with me. My face must have telegraphed something because Knox vaulted over the bar and started pushing his way toward me through the crowd. I'm sorry, babe, Steph said. I've got way here at Liza's with all the dogs. We're fine. You do whatever you need to do. Knox reached me and grabbed my arms. What's wrong? Are you okay? I have to go, I said into the phone and disconnected. The front door opened, and I saw two officers in uniform looking grim. My breath hitched. Knox, I whispered. Right here, baby, what happened? His eyes were bluer in this light, searingly blue and serious as he held on to me. I shook my head. It's not me. It's you. What's me? With a shaking finger, I pointed at the officers making their way to us. Knox, we need to talk, the taller one said. I backed up the truck for the third time and pulled forward before finally being satisfied with my park job. The hospital rose in front of me like a glowing beacon. An ambulance unloaded a patient on a gurney at the emergency department entrance. Its light painted the parking lot in red and white. I puffed out a breath, hoping it would settle the anxiety that was burbling in my stomach like a bad chowder. I could have gone home. I should have. 
but when I'd finished my shift, I drove towards the man who had tossed me his keys and told me to drive myself home. He'd made me promise before he'd followed the deputies out the door into the night. Yet here I was at 2 a.m., disobeying direct orders and sticking my nose where it didn't belong. I should definitely go home. Yep, for sure, I decided, getting out of the truck and walking right on in through the front door. Given the hour, there was no one sitting at the information desk. I followed the signs to the elevators and the surgical intensive care unit on the third floor. It was eerily quiet on the floor. All signs of life were limited to the nurse's station. I started toward it when I spotted knocks through the glass in the waiting room, the wide shoulders and impatient stance immediately recognizable. He paced the dimly lit room like a captive tiger. He must have sensed me in the doorway because he turned swiftly as if to face an enemy. His jaw clenched, and it was only then that I saw the turmoil. Anger. Frustration. Fear. I brought you coffee, I said, lamely holding up the travel mug I'd prepared for him in Honky Tonk's kitchen. Thought I told you to go home, he growled. And I didn't listen. Let's just move past the part where either one of us pretends to be surprised. I don't want you here. I flinched, not at his words, but at the pain behind them. I put the coffee down on an end table stacked with magazines that pretended they could distract visitors from the endless loop of fear. Knox, I began, taking a step toward him. Stop, he said. I didn't listen and slowly closed the distance between us. I'm so sorry, I whispered. Just get the fuck out of here, Naomi. Just go. You can't be here. His voice was ragged, frustrated. I'll go, I promised. I just wanted to make sure you were okay. I'm fine. The words came out bitterly. I raised my hand to lay on his arm. He flinched away from me. Don't, he said harshly. I said nothing but stood my ground. I felt like I could breathe in his anger like it was oxygen. Don't, he said again. I won't. If you touch me right now, he shook his head. I'm not in control, Naomi. Just tell me what you need. His laugh was dry and bitter. <laughs> what I need is to find the motherfucking bastard who did this to my brother. What I need is to rewind the clock so I didn't waste the last however many years over some stupid fucking fight. What I need is for my brother to wake the fuck up. His breath hitched, and I had no control over my own body. Because one second I was standing in front of him, and the next I was wrapping my arms around his waist, holding on and trying to absorb his pain. His body was tight and vibrating as if he was seconds away from coming apart. Stop, he said on a broken whisper. Please. But I didn't. I held on tighter, pressing my face to his chest. He swore under his breath, and then his arms were around me, crushing me to him. He buried his face in my hair and clung to me. He was so warm, so solid, so alive. I held on to him for dear life and willed him to release some of what he'd kept bottled up. Why don't you ever fucking listen? He grumbled, lips moving against my hair. Because sometimes people don't know how to ask for what they really need. You needed a hug. No. I didn't, he rasped. He was quiet for a long moment, and I listened to his heartbeat. I needed you. My own breath tripped in my throat. I tried to pull back to look up at him, but he held me where I was. Just shut up, Daisy, he advised. Okay. 
His hand stroked down my back and then up again, over and over until I melted into him. I wasn't sure which one of us was giving the comfort and which was receiving it now. He's out of surgery, Knox said finally, pulling back incrementally. His thumb traced my lower lip. They won't let me see him till he wakes up. Will he want to see you? I asked. I don't give a fuck what he wants. He's seeing me. What was the fight about? He sighed. When he reached up and tucked a strand of hair behind my ear, I swooned internally. I don't really feel like talking about it, Daze. You have something better to do? Yeah. Yelling at you to go the hell home and get some sleep. Waylay's first day of school is tomorrow. She doesn't need a zombie ant pouring dish soap on her cereal. First of all, we're having eggs, fruit, and yogurt for breakfast, I began, then realized he was trying to distract me. Was it about a woman? He looked at the ceiling. If you start counting to ten, I will kick you in the shin, I warned. He sighed. No, it wasn't about a woman. Besides love, what's worth losing a brother over? Fucking romantics, he said. Maybe if you get it out, instead of bottling it up, you'll feel better. He studied me for another one of those long, pensive beats, and I was sure he was about to tell me to get my ass home. Fine. I blinked in surprise. Um, okay, wow, so this is happening. Maybe we should sit? I suggested, eyeing up the empty vinyl chairs. Why does talking have to be a whole damn thing with women? He grumbled as I led us to a pair of chairs. Because anything worth doing is worth doing right. I sat and patted the chair next to me. He sat, stretching his long legs in front of him and staring blankly at the window. I won the lottery, he said. I know that, Liza told me. Took home 11 million, and I thought it was the answer to everything. I bought the bar, a building or two, invested in Jeremiah's plan for some fancy-ass salon, paid off Liza J's mortgage. She'd been struggling since Pop died. He looked down at his hands as his palms rubbed against the thighs of his jeans. It felt so fucking good to be able to solve problems. I waited. Growing up, we didn't have much. And after we lost Mom, we didn't have anything. Liza J and Pop took us in and gave us a home, a family. But money was tight. And in this town, you've got some kids driving fucking BMWs to school on their 16th birthdays or spending their weekends competing on $40,000 horses. Then there was me and Nash and Lucy. None of us grew up with anything, so maybe we took a few things that weren't ours. Maybe we weren't always on the straight and narrow, but we learned to be self-sufficient. Learned that sometimes you gotta take what you want instead of waiting for someone to give it to you. I handed him his coffee and he took a sip. Then Nash gets a bug up his ass and decides to become Dudley fucking Do-Right which must have felt like a rejection to Knox, I realized. I gave him money, Knox said, or tried to at least. The stubborn son of a bitch said he didn't want it. Who says no to that? Apparently your brother. Yeah, apparently. Restless, he shoved his fingers through his hair again. We went back and forth about it for almost two years. Me trying to shove it down his throat, him rejecting it. We threw a few punches over it. Finally, Liza J made him take it. And you know what my stupid little brother did with it? I set my teeth in my lower lip because I knew. That son of a bitch donated it to the Knock em Out PD to build a new goddamn police station. The Knox Morgan fucking municipal building. I waited for a few beats, hoping there was more to the story. But when he didn't continue, 
I slumped in my seat. Are you saying you and your brother have barely spoken in years because he put your name on a building? I'm saying he refused money that could have set him up for the rest of his life and gave it to the cops instead. The cops who had hard-ons for three teenagers just raising a little hell. Fuck. Lucian spent a week in jail on some bullshit charges when we were 17. We had to learn to take care of things ourselves instead of running to a crooked chief and his dumb fuck cronies. And Nash just up and hands over two fucking million bucks to them. The picture was coming into focus. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> uh, are the same cops still with the department? Knox hitched his shoulders in a shrug. No. Does Nash allow the officers under him to take advantage of their position? I pressed. He poked his tongue into the inside of his cheek. No. Is it fair to say that Nash cleaned up the department and replaced bad cops with good cops? Don't know how good Grave is, considering he still likes to drag race on the weekends, Knox said stubbornly. I put my hand on his arm and squeezed. Knox. What? He asked the carpet. Look at me. When he did, I saw the frustration etched on his gorgeous face. I cupped his cheeks in my hands. His beard was coarse against my palms. I'm going to tell you something that you and your brother both need to know, and I need this to resonate in your soul, I said. His eyes locked on mine. Well, more on my mouth than my eyes, but it was good enough. You're both idiots. His gaze tore away from my lips and his eyes narrowed. I squished his cheeks together before he could snarl at me. And if either of you wastes one more damn day on the fact that you two have both worked so hard and given so much to this town in your own ways, then the idiocy is terminal and there's no cure. I released his face and leaned back. If this is your way of cheering me up about my brother getting shot, you suck at it. My smile spread slowly. Take it from me, Viking. You and your brother have a chance to fix things and have an actual relationship. Some of us aren't that lucky. Some burnt bridges can't be rebuilt. Don't burn one over something as stupid as money. That only works if he wakes the fuck up, he reminded me. I blew out of breath. Yeah, I know. We sat in silence. His knee and arm were warm and firm against mine. Mr. Morgan? A nurse in blue scrubs stepped into the room. Knox and I both came to our feet. I wondered if he realized he'd taken my hand. Your brother is awake and he's asking for you, she said. I blew out a sigh of relief. How is he? Knox asked. Groggy, and he's looking at a long recovery, but the surgical team is happy. The tension in his back and shoulders loosened. I gave his hand a squeeze. On that note, I think I'll head home to get Waylay's cereal and dish detergent ready. He tightened his grip on my hand. Can we have a minute? He asked the nurse. Sure, I'll be right outside. I'll take you to him as soon as you're ready. He waited until she stepped outside before drawing me in close. Thank you, Naomi, he whispered, just before his lips met mine. Hot, hard, unyielding. His hand slid up to cut my jaw and neck, holding me in place as he kissed every thought out of my head leaving me nothing but a riot of sensation. He pulled back, eyes fierce. Then he pressed a kiss to my forehead and left the room. 
22. One hatchet, two bullets. Knox. You look like shit, Nash rasped. The lights were on low in the room. My brother was propped up in his hospital bed, chest bare to reveal bandages and gauze over his left shoulder. Machines beeped, screens glowed. He looked pale, vulnerable. My hands clenched into fists at my sides. I could say the same about you, I said, rounding the bed slowly to sink into the chair by the dark window. Looks worse than it is. His voice was barely a whisper. I rested my elbows on my knees and tried to look relaxed. But inside, a rage simmered in my gut. Someone had tried to end Nash's life. You didn't mess with a Morgan and walk away from it. Some asshole tried to kill you tonight. You mad someone almost beat you to it? They know who did it, I asked. The corner of his mouth lifted as if it were too much effort to smile. Why? You gonna get him back? You almost died, Nash. Graves said you came this close to bleeding out before the ambulance got there. The truth of it had bile rising in my throat. It's gonna take more than a couple of bullets and a wrestling match to end me, he assured me. I ran my palms over my knees, back and forth, trying to tamp down the anger, the need to break something. Naomi was here. Even as I said it, I didn't know why. Maybe just saying her name out loud made everything feel a little more bearable. Of course she was. She thinks I'm hot. I don't care how many bullet holes you've got in you, I'm moving on that, I told him. Nash's sigh was closer to a wheeze. About damn time. The quicker you screw it up, the quicker I can swoop in and be the good guy. Fuck off, dick. Hey, who's the one in the hospital bed, asshole? I'm a damn hero. Women can't resist a hero with bullet holes. The hero in question winced when he shifted in the bed, his hand reaching for the tray, then falling back to the mattress. I rose and poured the water bottle into the waiting cup. Yeah, well, maybe you should stay in here out of my way for a couple of days. Give me a shot at fucking it all up. I pushed the cup and straw to the edge of the tray and watched him reach for it with his good arm. Beads of sweat appeared on his forehead, and his hand shook as his fingers closed around the plastic. I'd never seen him like this. I'd seen him every other way. Hung over, wrung out from the flu bug of 1996, exhausted after pouring his heart out in the homecoming football game his senior year. But I'd never seen him look weak. Another nurse pulled back the curtain with an apologetic smile. Just checking the fluids, he said. Nash gave him a thumbs up and we lapsed into silence while the nurse busied himself with IVs. My brother was hooked to a half dozen machines in the ICU, and I'd gone years with barely speaking to him. How's your pain? the nurse asked. Fine, practically non-existent. His answer was too quick his mouth too tight. My brother had played the second half of that homecoming game with a broken wrist, because he might be the nice brother, the good brother, but he didn't like showing weakness any more than I did. He's in it, I tattled to the nurse. Don't listen to him, Nash insisted, but he couldn't hide the grimace when he shifted on the mattress. A bullet just ripped its way through your torso, chief. You don't have to be in pain to heal, he said. Yeah, you do, he countered. Pain is what tells you you're alive. You numb that, and how do you know you're still here? She thinks we're both idiots, I said when the nurse left. Nash gave a wheeze, followed by a racking cough that looked like it was going to tear him apart before collapsing back on the bed. I watched the green spikes on his heart rate monitor slowly settle. Who? 
he said finally. Naomi. Why would Naomi think I'm an idiot? He asked wearily. Told her why things are the way they are. She wasn't impressed with your Robin Hood routine or my manly independence. Not even a little. She may have made a few points. About what? About how she thought it was over a woman. Not money. Nash's head was slowly lolling to the side, his eyelids getting heavier. So love is worth a family feud, but a few million isn't? That was the gist of it. Can't say she's wrong. Then why the fuck didn't you just suck it up and make it right? I snapped. Nash's smile was a ghost. His eyes were closed. You're the big brother. And you were the one trying to make me beholden to you by shoving cash down my throat. The only reason I'm not kicking your ass right now is you're attached to too many machines. He gave me a weak middle finger. Jesus, I grumbled. I didn't want you to be beholden or whatever the fuck to me. We're family, we're brothers. One of us wins, we both win. It also meant if one of us lost, we both did. And that was what the last few years had been. A loss. Fuck, I hated losing. Didn't want the money, he said, his words slurring. Wanted to build things on my own. You could have put it away for retirement or some shit, I complained. The same old cocktail of feelings was trying to rise in me. Rejection, failure, righteous fury. You deserved some good. After the shit we went through, then Liza J losing Pop, you deserved more than a cop salary from some shitty town. Our shitty town, he corrected. Made it ours. You in your way, me in mine. Maybe he was right, but that didn't matter. What did matter was the fact that if he would have taken the cash, he wouldn't be here in this hospital room. My little brother would be making a difference some other way, without towing the line, without paying the price. Should have kept the money. If you had, you wouldn't be lying here like roadkill. Nash shook his head slowly against the pillow. I was always going to be the good guy. Shut up and go to sleep, I told him. We went through some shit, but I always had my big brother. I always knew I could count on you. Didn't need your money on top of that. Nash's shoulders sagged. Sleep took him under its spell, leaving me to sit in silent vigil. The automatic doors opened, spilling me and a cloud of air conditioning into the humidity of the breaking dawn. I'd stayed by Nash's bedside, letting my rage simmer, knowing what came next. I wanted to punch a hole through the building's facade. I wanted to bring a tidal wave of retribution down on the person responsible. Idly, I picked up one of the smooth rocks from a flower bed and ran my fingers over it, wanting to send it flying to break something on the outside instead of feeling all the cracks on the inside. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I closed my fingers around the rock and squeezed. What are you doing here, Lucy? Lucian leaned against the limestone column just beyond the hospital entrance, the end of his cigarette glowing brighter as he sucked in a drag. He only allowed himself one cigarette a day. I guess this counted. What do you think I'm doing? Holding up the building, hitting on sexy surgeons? He flicked ash to the ground, eyes locked on me. How is he? I thought of the pain, the exhaustion, the side of my brother I'd never seen before. Okay, or at least he's gonna be. Who did it? The cool, dispassionate tone didn't fool me. We were down to business now. Lucian may not have been blood, but he was a Morgan in every way that counted. And he wanted justice as badly as I did. Cops don't know. Graves said the car was stolen. 
Nash hasn't given them a description of the suspect yet. Does he remember what happened? I shrugged and squinted up at the sky that was turning pink and purple as the sun worked its way off the horizon. I don't know, man. He was pretty fucked up on anesthesia and whatever they put in his IV. I'll start digging, Lucian assured me. Let me know what you find. I'm not getting cut out of this. Of course not. He studied me for a beat. You look like shit. You should get some sleep. People keep telling me that. Lucian, on the other hand, looked like he'd just walked out of the boardroom in a slick suit sans tie. Maybe you should listen, he said. He almost died, Luce. After I was an asshole to him, he almost bled out in a fucking ditch. Lucian stubbed out his cigarette in the concrete ashtray. We'll make it right, I nodded. I knew we would. This wouldn't stand, and the man who'd put a bullet in my brother would pay. And you'll make the rest of it right, too, he said, words clipped. You both wasted enough fucking time. It's done now. Only Lucian Rollins could make a statement like that and will it into reality. I thought of Naomi's proclamation. Maybe we had been idiots wasting time we thought we'd had. It's done, I agreed. Good. I was tired of my childhood best friends acting like they were still children. Is that why you came back? His expression darkened. One of the reasons. One of those other reasons have anything to do with a pretty little librarian who hates your guts? He sighed, absently patting his pockets. Already had your one, I reminded him. Fuck, he muttered. It was as flustered as he allowed himself to get. I had the temper, Nash had the good nature, and Lucian had the self-control of a fucking monk. Whatever happened with you two, anyway? I asked, enjoying the distraction of his discomfort. Your brother is in an ICU bed, Lucian said. That's the only reason I'm not knocking your teeth out right now. As close as we'd all been, the one thing Lucian never shared was what made Sloan hate him. Up until last night, I'd thought the feeling was mutual. But I'd seen his face when he saw her, when she walked away. I didn't know much about feelings, but whatever was written all over his face didn't look like hate to me. You probably don't even remember how to throw a punch, I teased. All those conference room negotiations. You just sick your lawyers on people instead of delivering a nice right cross to the face. Bet it's less satisfying. You can take the boy out of knock him out, but you can't take the knock him out out of the boy, he said. I hoped it was true. Appreciate you being here, he nodded. I'll stay with him until Liza comes back in. That'd be good, I said. We stood in silence, legs braced as the sun rose, adding gold to the pink and purple. A new day had officially begun. A lot of things were going to change, and I was keyed up to make it all happen. Get some sleep. Lucian dug into his pocket and tossed me his keys. Take my car. I caught them midair and hit the unlock button. A shiny Jaguar blinked its headlights at me from a primo parking spot. Always did have good taste. Some things never change. But some things had to. I'll see you later, man. He nodded. And then I surprised the hell out of us both by wrapping him in a hard, one-armed hook. Missed you, brother. 23. Knocks, knocks. Who's there? Naomi. I was torn from a fitful sleep on the couch by pounding at the front door. Disoriented, I stumbled around the coffee table and tried to remember where I was. The $20,000 in cash, still tucked away in my apron. Nash. Knox. Waylay's first day of school. No wonder I'd fallen prey to a nap attack. I opened the door and found a freshly showered Knox standing on the welcome mat. 
Waylon trotted inside, wagging his tail. Hey, I croaked. A man of few words, Knox said nothing and stepped over the threshold. I rubbed the sleep from my eyes. He looked tense, like he was spoiling for a fight. Well, if he'd come here for a fight, he was going to be disappointed. I was too tired to deliver one. How's your brother? I ventured. He shoved a hand through his hair. Long recovery ahead, but he'll be okay. Get way off to school this morning? His brother had been shot, and the man remembered to ask about Waylay's first day. I didn't know how to reconcile that with the jerk who yelled at me in front of his own customers. If he could ever settle fully into the thoughtful grump and give up the pissed-off bad boy, he'd make some woman very lucky someday. Yeah, I yawned. She slept at Liza's last night since I didn't get home until late. Liza, Steph, and I made her send off breakfast there. Steph made chocolate chip pancakes, even though I told him spikes in blood sugar make kids tired and unfocused at school. I was tired and unfocused, not because of pancakes, but because Knox's edginess made me nervous. Uh, speaking of Steph, I think he and Jeremiah might be into each other, I said, grasping for a topic that would warrant some kind of verbal reaction. But Knox remained silent as he prowled the tiny living room, looking much too big to belong here. He was a man with a lot of feelings locked up tight. Part of me wanted to crack him open. The other part wanted to just go back to bed and forget everything for a few hours. Do you want some coffee? Maybe some alcohol? I offered, following him as he moved toward the kitchen, his hands clenching into fists only to release again over and over again. I didn't have any beer, and the hardest alcohol in the house was a cheap rosé I'd been planning to crack open with Sloan. But I could sacrifice it for the guy whose brother had just been shot. He picked up the pretty yellow leaf on the counter. I'd found it in the lane that morning after walking Waylay to the bus. The temperature still said summer, but the change to fall was inevitable. Waylon hopped up on the couch in the living room. Well, make yourself at home, I told the dog. When I turned to face Knox, he was closing the distance between us. Naomi. His voice was rough as it caressed the syllables of my name. And then his hands were on me, yanking me into him. His mouth found mine, and I was lost to sensation, drowning in desire. Neither of us wanted to want this. Maybe that's what made it feel so damn good. One hand slid into my hair while the other pressed my lower back until I was flush against him. Knox, I breathed. This isn't what you want, I reminded him. It's what I need, he said before diving back into the kiss. This wasn't the kiss from the waiting room. This was different, desperate. I lost myself in it. Every thought tumbled out of my head until I was nothing but feeling. His mouth was hard and demanding, just like the man. I softened under him, welcoming him. He responded by tugging at my hair to angle my head just the way he wanted as he slanted his mouth over mine. His tongue didn't twine or dance with mine. It battled mine into submission. He stole my breath, my logic, every reason why this was a terrible idea. He took them all and made them disappear. That's what I need, baby. I need to feel you go soft under me. Need you to let me have you. I couldn't tell if this was dirty talk or romantic prose. Whichever side of the line his words fell on, I loved it. His fingers found the strap of my dress. My heartbeat skittered into high gear as he slid the fabric an inch down my shoulder, leaving my skin burning. He needed this. Me. And I lived to be needed. 
I reached for his shirt and slid my hands under the hem, finding the rigid muscle under warm skin. For once in his life, Knox appeared to be feeling helpful and yanked the shirt over his head with one hand. God, all that skin and muscle and ink. I dragged my nails over his chest and he growled into my mouth. Yes, please. With one deft swipe, he shoved the strap of my dress off my shoulder, then did the same to the other one. About time I find out what you've got on under these dresses, he murmured. I sank my teeth into his lower lip and yanked hard on his belt. I cursed myself for putting on my least sexy underwear this morning, but at least I hadn't bothered with a bra this morning. Between unsexy undies and unshackled boobs, I figured it all evened out. He lost his jeans at about the same moment my dress slithered down my body and pooled at my ankles. God damn it, baby, I fucking knew it. His mouth was on my neck, nibbling and kissing its way south. I shivered. Knew what? That you'd look like this. That you had a fuck-me body. He cupped one breast greedily. He backed me into the fridge, and the cold metal had me yelping. Knox! I'd apologize, but you know I'm not the least bit sorry, he said as his tongue darted out to stroke my aching nipple. I was no longer capable of forming words. I was no longer capable of drawing in a breath. All I could do was cup his erection through his boxer briefs and hang on for dear life. When his lips closed over my nipple and he started to suck, the back of my head hit the fridge. Those deep, decadent pulls echoed all over my body, and I had a feeling he knew it. He didn't stop sucking as he shoved his free hand into my unsexy underwear. We both moaned when his fingers found me. Knew it, he muttered again as his mouth moved to my other breast. Knew you'd be wet for me. My moan turned into a cry when he parted my slit with two fingers. The man knew what he was doing. There was no fumbling. No wasted, awkward movements. Even driven by need, every touch was magic. Need to feel you from the inside, he said, brushing his beard over my sensitized nipple. When his fingers thrust into me, my knees buckled. He was too much, too skilled, expert level, professional ruiner of vaginas, and I didn't know if I could keep up. When he started moving those amazing fingers, I decided I didn't care. His penis flexed in my grip. I clumsily shoved his briefs down, freeing his thick shaft and gripped it hard. Knox straightened on a groan and dropped his forehead to mine as we worked each other with eager hands. Need you in a bed, he growled as a drop of moisture leaked over my fingers. I gripped him harder, stroked faster. I sure hope you can get us to one, because I can't walk. Damn, baby, slow the fuck down, he ordered through gritted teeth. But I wasn't listening. I was too busy matching the pump of his fingers inside me. I gasped when he pulled out of my throbbing core. Mean, I hissed against his neck. But just when my body felt desolate over the loss, he tossed me over his shoulder. Knox! His only acknowledgement was a resounding slap on my behind. Which room? he demanded, taking the stairs two at a time. I was dizzy with lust and vertigo. This one, I managed. In seconds, I found myself on my back in bed with the naked Knox ranging himself over me. Oh my God, is this really happening? Whoops, I hadn't actually meant to say that out loud. Do not come to your senses yet, he ordered. No sense here, promise. He was too busy looking pained to be amused. 
I couldn't blame him after I got my first good look at his erection. It was arousing, intimidating. A thick, purple-headed leader in the world of erect penises. I got a little dizzy when Knox fisted it. I hoped to God he knew how to use it. Few things were more disappointing in this life than a well-endowed man who had no clue how to use his equipment. Apparently it wasn't time to find out, though, because Knox slid down my body, parting my legs and draping them over his shoulders. When he pressed his face between my legs, my stomach muscles contracted so hard I worried I'd pulled something. Oh, God. His beard was abrasive between my thighs, and I freaking loved it. His tongue. For being a man of few words, his tongue was pure magic. He paired long, greedy strokes with short, shallow thrusts. In a matter of seconds, I was ready to come. Wait, 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 I whimpered, gripping his hair. He stopped immediately, earning serious points. What's wrong? You okay? Concern warred with need in those steely blue-gray eyes. This is a one-time thing. I needed to say it aloud. To remind myself that this was the one and only time I was going to let Knox Morgan make me come. One time, he agreed, still watching me closely. Final offer. Don't talk like a game show host when your face is between my legs. Don't ask me to have a conversation when you were just about to come on my goddamn tongue. Point taken, I said. My insides were actually pulsing with greedy desire. One time thing. Make it count. Then you better hang the fuck on. It was a good thing I did as he told me, because a second or two after my hands wrapped around the brass headboard, he did something magical with his tongue at the same time that he crooked his fingers inside me and my entire body imploded. I closed so tight around his fingers I worried he was going to need an x-ray. Not worried enough to stop and check, of course, because I was in the middle of the best orgasm of my life, and I had priorities. If I had broken his fingers, he didn't seem to mind, because he just kept right on licking me through my bone-shattering release. Still coming. I can feel you, he said on a groan. At least that's what I thought he said. My ears were ringing like I was in a church bell tower on Sunday morning. Gonna need a minute, I gasped, fighting to get oxygen into my lungs. Uh-uh making it count, he said from somewhere that sounded very far away. Besides, I want to slide my cock in you while you're still coming. Okay. I heard the distinct crinkle of the wrapper from either a Pop-Tart or a condom. It appeared to be the latter because the wide crest of his erection was prodding at my very core. He paused long enough to swipe his tongue over each of my breasts before rising up on his knees. He looked like a vengeful warrior, tattooed and muscled, his lids heavy, chest heaving. At least I wasn't the only one having a damn good time, I realized. It was my last coherent thought before he thrust his hips and buried that long, thick weapon of mass destruction inside me. Our eyes locked, and his face froze in agonized pleasure and triumph as he hit the very end of me. I didn't realize I'd spasmed up into an ab curl until he put one of those big hands on my chest and pressed me back down to the mattress. Relax, baby. Relax, he whispered. I let out the breath that had been trapped in my lungs and sucked in another. He was so damn big. And he was right. I could feel the tiny little tremors working my muscles around him. You keep milking my dick like that, sweetheart, and this is gonna have to be a two-time thing. Mmm, good. Yes. He grinned down at me. So this is what it takes for you to lose that fancy vocabulary of yours. Ugh, are you gonna talk all day, or are you going to move? I grumbled. The need was already building in me again. 
I wondered if Knox's cock was some sort of magical wand that cast orgasm spells, rendering things like rally time and biological requirements non-existent. Look at me, Naomi, he said. I did as I was told. God damn it, you're beautiful. And so fucking wet for me. And he was rock hard for me. That's when he started to move. Slowly, languidly, sweat glistened on his skin. His jaw was set, but his hips pumped like a metronome as he glided in and out of me. It felt like heaven, but I could tell he was holding himself back, and I wanted to give him everything he needed, wanted him to take it. Don't be gentle, I groaned. Taking my time, deal with it. Knox, if you get any more blood in that appendage, it's going to explode. You've got an opinion on everything, even on how I fuck you, especially on how you fuck me. He kissed me, probably just to shut me up, but I didn't care, because when I hitched my hips higher, his thrusts came faster, went deeper. He was pushing me just past my comfort zone, making me take a little more than I was confident I could handle. And damn if I didn't get off on it. He was giving me what I needed without me having to spell it out for him and break it down, without me having to ask, without him saying... Maybe it's just easier if you do it yourself. Come back to me, Daisy. I blinked, and Knox's face came back into focus, hovering over me and looking serious. You're right here when I'm inside you. Nowhere else. Got me? I nodded, embarrassed that I'd nearly gotten lost inside my head. He was right. How many times had I gotten so wrapped up in my plans and lists that I missed what was right in front of me, or in this case, inside me? To prove I was with him, I sank my nails into his shoulders and squeezed my muscles around his shaft as he drove deep. That's my girl, he groaned. What we were doing felt so good, so right. His chest hair tickled my puckered nipples as my heels dug into those perfect ass cheeks of his. Another orgasm was already starting to build. It felt otherworldly good. He felt it too. His thrusts were harder now, less controlled, and I wanted more. Can't decide how I want you, he confessed through gritted teeth. Thought about too many ways. You have? I breathed, trying to sound surprised, like I didn't have a regular fantasy of him banging me bent over the pool table at Honky Tonk. He nipped at my bottom lip. Up against a wall in my office, my hand over your mouth so no one can hear me making you come. You riding me in my truck, these perfect tits in my face so I can suck you while I fuck you, on your hands and knees looking over your shoulder while I work you from behind... Okay, those were pretty good. My breasts felt heavy, swollen. Every nerve ending in my body was lighting up, and those ab muscles I thought I'd torn with my first orgasm were tensing again. Fuck, baby, you just keep getting tighter. I could feel every vein, every ridge, every inch of his arousal as he drove into me. Again and again, he rammed himself home. Euphoria filled my head like a fog. His muscles were taut under my fingers. We were both shaking. I was going to come with him inside me and never be the same again. He forced a hand between us and cupped my breast, my greedy nipple pebbling against his palm. Take it all, baby. And I did, opening as wide as I could and holding on for dear life as he drove me over the edge. He didn't ease me into the orgasm. He detonated it. It shot through me like high voltage, making me tremble from head to toe. I buried my face in his neck and screamed. Ah, fuck! Fuck! I opened my eyes to find him powering into me, eyes half-closed, all vestiges of control snapped. 
I felt his erection swell inside me as he grunted on the next thrust and the next. I was still coming when he jerked inside me, letting out a guttural shout of triumph. He buried himself deep and held there. Our bodies aligned, releases synchronizing. With every wrenching pulse of his erection, my muscles gripped him tighter. Naomi, he growled into my neck as we rode it out together, hearts pounding as one. 24. Uninvited Guests. Naomi. A soft snore startled me from my incredibly steamy dream about Knox Morgan. When I heard the snore again, felt the warm, hard body against me. My eyelids flew open cartoon shade style. This wasn't a dream. I'd accidentally had sex with my grumpy boss, infuriating neighbor, and flagrant backyard peer. I waited for the stampede of regrets to charge through my brain like bison on a dusty prairie, but it seemed my body was too sated to allow for that. Knox had banged my brain and body into submission. Carefully so as not to disturb my snoring bed partner, I rolled to face him. He was naked, the sheet tangled up in his legs, leaving most of his spectacular body on display. This was the first time I'd had the opportunity to study him up close without him knowing. That thick, dark, dirty blonde hair was must from my hands. There was a small scar between his eyebrows and another one, longer, more jagged, near his hairline. His lashes were long enough to make me jealous. His lips, usually closed in that firm, disapproving line, were parted slightly. He slept on his back, one tattooed arm under his head, the other around me. I hadn't pegged him for a cuddler. No one in their right mind would. But the hold he had on me said differently. His chest rose and fell with deep, even breaths. I studied his stomach muscles with fascination. Mine were sore from the unexpected ab workout orgasms delivered. His looked like they could withstand anything, tapering down to a taut V that disappeared beneath the sheet. He looked so peaceful that even the perpetual line of annoyance between his eyebrows had smoothed. I couldn't believe Knox Morgan was naked in my bed. Oh God, Knox Morgan was naked in my bed. And the sneaky son of a bitch had given me two of the most intense orgasms known to humankind. How in the hell was I supposed to look him in the eye now and not send my vagina into involuntary spasms? Ah, there it was. My old friend, abject panic. What was I doing in bed with a man I knew better than to sleep with, mere weeks after running away from my own wedding? I needed to get out of this bed because if Knox woke up and gave me a sleepy-eyed stare, I'd throw caution to the wind and hop right back on that cock of his without another thought. It took a few tries, but I managed to extricate myself from his surprisingly snugly grip. Not wanting to wake him by rummaging through drawers, I grabbed the nightgown I'd set out for tonight and wiggled into it before tiptoeing out of the room. One time thing, I chanted to myself as I made my way down the stairs. It happened. It was over. Time to move on. I tripped over a discarded boot on my way into the kitchen. Ow! Damn it! I hissed. Waylon lifted his head from the couch, let out a yawn, and stretched luxuriously. Hi, I said, feeling self-conscious that the dog might be judging me for sleeping with his human. But if the basset hound was feeling judgmental, it didn't last, because he rolled over and promptly went back to sleep. I moved Knox's boots away from the foot of the stairs. We'd left a trail of clothing on the first floor, something else I'd never done. I'd pick it all up and fold it just as soon as I had a hit of coffee. The late night, the worry over Nash and Waylay's first day, not to mention the mind-altering orgasms, had all rendered me nearly comatose. I quickly started a pot of coffee, then rested my forehead on the counter while I waited for it to brew. I thought about Waylay trudging onto the big yellow school bus in her purple dress and pink sneakers, 
her new backpack full of supplies and snacks. She hadn't been excited for her first day of sixth grade. I could only imagine how awful last year her first in knock em out had been. Hopefully, between Nina, Chloe, and a new teacher, Waylay would get the second chance she so deserved. And if that didn't do the trick, I would find another solution. Waylay was a smart, funny, sweet kid, and I wouldn't let the world ignore that. The coffee maker beeped its siren song of a finished pot. My fingers had just closed around the handle of the coffee carafe when there was a peppy knock at the front door. Waylon's head popped back up from the couch. Hastily, I poured a mug and took a scalding swallow before throwing open the door. I choked on the mouthful of caffeine when I found my parents standing on the porch. There's our girl! My mother, looking tan and happy, opened her arms. At 61, Amanda Witt still dressed to accentuate the curves that had caught my father's eye in college. She took pride in coloring her hair the same auburn it had been on their wedding day, though now she wore it in a daring pixie cut. She golfed, worked part-time as a school counselor, and breathed life into every room she entered. Mom? I croaked, automatically leaning in for a hug. Lou, isn't this the cutest little cottage you've ever seen? She said. My father grunted. He had his hands stuffed into the pockets of his shorts and was nudging the porch railing with the toe of his sneakers. Seems solid, he said. Mom was impressed by pretty things. Dad preferred to appreciate sturdiness. How you doing, kiddo? He asked. I transferred my hug to him and laughed as my toes left the ground. While Mom was a few inches shorter than Tina and me, Dad was over six feet tall. A bear of a man who always made me feel like everything was going to be okay. What are you two doing here? I asked as he carefully put me down. Sweetheart, you can't tell us we have a granddaughter and not expect us to drive straight here. Did we get you out of bed? That's a lovely nightgown. Mom noted. Bed. Nightgown. Sex. Knox. Oh, God. Ah! Uh... I told you we should have cut that cruise short, Lou, Mom said, slapping Dad in the shoulder. She's obviously depressed. She's still in her pajamas. She's not depressed, Mandy, Dad insisted, wrapping his knuckles on the doorframe as he stepped inside. What is this, Oak? I don't know, Dad. Mom, I'm not depressed, I said, trying to figure out a way to get them out of the house before my naked guests woke up. I just, um, worked late last night, and there was a family emergency. Mom gasped. Is something wrong with Waylay? No, Mom, sorry, not our family. The family who owns this place and the bar I work at. I can't wait to see it. What's it called again? Hanky Pank? Honky-tonk, I corrected her, spying my dress on the floor. Did you see the living room? It came out as an almost shout, and my parents exchanged a glance before pretending to be enthralled with the space I was waving at. Just look at that fireplace, Lou. Yes, look at the fireplace, I all but screeched. Dad grunted. As my parents admired the fireplace, I hooked the dress with my toes and swept it under the kitchen table. And you got a dog. My, you have been busy since the wedding. Moylan lifted his head, a jowl still stuck to the pillow. His tail thumped on the cushion, and my mom dissolved into a puddle of affection. Who's a handsome boy? You are, sir. Yes, you are. See, Mandy, she's not depressed. She's just busy, Dad insisted. Uh, isn't the view of the woods great? I said, the words sounding strangled as I pointed frantically at the windows. When they turned to admire the woods through the glass, I grabbed Knox's jeans off the floor and threw them into the cabinet under the sink. Beeper! Come meet your niece or nephew doggy! My mother was using her straight-A report card on the refrigerator voice, which was definitely loud enough to wake the man upstairs in my bed. You guys brought Beeper? Beeper was my parents' latest rescue dog. She was a mix of breeds. I got them the DNA test for Christmas the previous year. 
that had been scrambled together and came out looking like a large brown Brillo pad with feet. The Brillo pad appeared in the doorway and trotted inside. Waylon sat up and gave an appreciative woof. This is Waylon. He's not mine. He belongs to my, um, neighbor. Hey, do you guys want to get out of here and go for breakfast or lunch or just leave for any reason at all? Waylon hopped off the couch and booped noses with Beeper. Beeper let out a high-pitched yap, and the two of them began to zoom around the minuscule first floor. Daisy, baby, what the fuck are you doing down there? I watched in horror as bare feet attached to naked, muscular legs appeared on the stairs. Mom and I froze to the spot as boxer briefs, thank God for penis-covering miracles, came into view. Dad, moving quickly for a big guy, put himself between us and the approaching boxer briefs. State your business, Dad shouted at Knox's bare torso. Wow, 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 Mom whispered. She wasn't wrong. The man was freaking spectacular. Waylon and Beeper chose that moment to take their zoomies up the stairs. Days, you want to explain what's going on? Knox drawled as he sidestepped the canine catastrophe. I ducked under Dad's arm and moved to stand between my parents and my boss... er... neighbor? One-time sex partner? Uh, okay. So, I really wish I would have had more coffee. Are those tattoos real? How many times a week do you go to the gym? Mom asked, peering under Dad's armpit. What the hell is going on? Dad rumbled. Oh, Lou, so old-fashioned, Mom said, giving him an affectionate pat on the backside before walking up to Knox and hugging him. Mom! Knox stood there, woodenly, clearly in shock. Welcome to the family, she said, pressing a kiss to his cheek. Oh my god, I'm going to die of embarrassment, I decided. Knox patted my mother awkwardly on the back. Uh, thanks. She released him and then grabbed me by the shoulders. We were so worried about you, sweetheart. It wasn't like you to just up and leave your own wedding like that. Not that we ever liked Warner that much anyway. I always thought he was a pretentious ass, Dad cut in. I thought maybe you were depressed, Mom continued. But now it all makes sense. You fell in love with someone else and couldn't go through with a sham of a marriage. Isn't that wonderful, Lou? I need coffee, Knox muttered and headed for the kitchen. Aren't you going to introduce us? Dad demanded, still not looking very pleased. <sighs> Naomi, Knox called from the coffee pot. Pants? I winced. Under the sink. He gave me a long, unreadable look before bending to retrieve his jeans. My mother gave me an incredibly inappropriate double thumbs up as Knox turned his back on us and zipped the fly of his jeans. Mom! I mouthed. But she just continued flashing me the thumbs and a creepy smile of approval. It reminded me of the time I'd taken her to see the Anderson Town Community Theater's production of The Full Monty. My mom had an appreciation for the male form. Okay, I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Mom, Dad, this is Knox. Uh, he's my neighbor and boss. We're not in love. My mother's face fell, and Dad looked at the floor, hands on hips, his shoulders hunched. I'd seen that reaction before. Concern, disappointment, worry, Never for anything I'd done. It was always Tina bringing them trouble. I hated that this time it was me. Is this some one-night stand? Are you having some kind of midlife crisis and this guy took advantage of you? My father, who had won Best Hugger three years running at the Witt family reunion, looked as if he was about ready to start throwing punches. Dad, no one took advantage of anyone. I shut up as Knox appeared at my side and handed me a fresh cup of coffee. How long are you two in town? Knox asked my parents. Dad glared at him. 
We haven't decided, Mom said to his tattoos. We're very excited to meet her granddaughter, and we're a little concerned about you-know-who. She pointed at me as if I hadn't heard her stage whisper. Knox looked at me and sighed. He put his free hand on the back of my neck and pulled me into his side. Here's the situation. Your daughter blew into town trying to help her no-good sister, no offense. None taken, Mom assured him. I took one look at Naomi and fell hard and fast. Knox, I hissed. But he squeezed the back of my neck and continued. We're just seeing where this thing goes. Could be nothing, but we're enjoying it. You raised a smart, beautiful, stubborn woman. Mom fluffed her hair. She gets that from me. What is it you do for a living, Knock? Dad demanded. Knox, I corrected. He owns businesses and some property, Dad. My father harumphed. Hmm, self-made man? Guess it's better than Mr. Nepotism. I assumed he was speaking of Warner, who got a job at the family company after college graduation. Got lucky a few years back and won the lottery. Invested most of it here in my hometown, Knox explained. Thought I'd used up all my luck till Naomi here showed up. Fake romantic Knox was going to ruin all real romance for me if I wasn't careful. His name's on the police station, I said with forced brightness. His grip on my neck tightened again. I reached behind him and pinched the skin just above the waistband of his jeans. He squeezed harder. I pinched harder. I need some Advil or something, Dad muttered, rubbing his forehead. You shouldn't have a headache, Lou. Our daughter is fine. I was the one who was worried on the way down here, remember? Mom said as if Knox and I weren't even in the room. Yeah, well, now I'm the one who thinks there's something wrong with her. Let me get you something for your head, I offered, trying to extricate myself from Knox's grip. But he merely squeezed tighter and took a sip of his coffee. Don't be silly. I have all of your father's favorite anti-inflammatories in my purse, Mom announced. She bustled over to where she'd planted her purse next to the front door. Dan shoved his hands in his pockets and wandered into the kitchen. I saw him frown at Knox's t-shirt where it lay crumpled on the stovetop. Waylay is going to be so excited to meet you. Where are you two staying while you're here? I asked, desperate to make small talk. There's a motel in town. We'll see if they have any rooms available, Dad said, opening cupboard doors and tapping the shelves. After a three-week luxury Mediterranean cruise, I didn't think my parents would enjoy the moldy, dilapidated motel. I was already shaking my head when Knox spoke up. I think we can do better than that. We'll find room for you at Liza J's. Knox! I hissed. How was I going to pretend to be in a relationship with Knox with my parents staying practically next door? He leaned in like he was going to nuzzle the side of my face and whispered, Shut up. Then he brushed his lips over my temple, and my nipples went hard. Mom waltzed by with a bottle of pills, beaming at me. I crossed my arms over my chest. I'm sure you'd want to stay as close to your daughter and granddaughter as possible, Knox said. Knox, can I see you outside? I asked through clenched teeth. Do you see how they can't keep their hands off each other? Mom trilled behind us. Yeah, you got any antacids in there? Dad asked, looking ill. I closed the door and dragged Knox onto the porch. So what are we supposed to do? Pretend to be in a relationship until my parents leave? You're welcome. You fucking owe me, Daze. Do you have any idea what this is going to do to my bachelor reputation? I don't care about your reputation. I'm the one who has to pass a home study. Besides... I'm tired of owing you. Why do you keep riding to my rescue? He tucked a strand of hair behind my ear. Maybe I like being the hero for once. My knees threatened to buckle as the knee-jerk desire to swoon swept over me. His grin was downright sinful when he pulled me into him. The contact with his body so soon after the best sex ever 
was frying my circuits. I didn't want to yell at him anymore. I wanted to kiss him. Or maybe, he whispered against my lips. I just want to know what it feels like to have your smart mouth wrapped around my cock. That was at least honest and dirty, and I liked it. He had one hand boldly cupping my rear end. The other held my hair at the base of my neck. Pardon the interruption. Instinctively, I jumped back from Knox. Well, I tried to. He still had a pretty good grip on me, which turned out to be a good thing since I probably would have fallen right over the railing when I spotted caseworker Yolanda Suarez eyeing us from the foot of the steps. Mrs. Suarez, how lovely to see you again. I choked the words out. 25. Family Fuss. Knox. Even with the unwelcome intrusions of Naomi's parents, followed by the disapproving caseworker who'd been missing a signature on a page, I was in a great fucking mood when I returned to the hospital. Sure, the whole pretending to be in a relationship thing was probably definitely going to be a pain in the ass but it would get Naomi out of a jam and piss my brother off. I'd woke up that morning knowing that once wasn't going to be enough when it came to her. Now we could fool around for a few weeks, get each other out of our systems, and once her parents headed home, go back to our regular lives with itches scratched. All in all, it wasn't a bad gig. I stepped into Nash's room and found most of the knock -em out PD crowded inside. Let me know what you find from the office and the storage unit, Nash said from the bed. His color was a bit better. Sure glad you didn't kick the bucket, son, Graves said. The rest of them nodded their agreement. Yeah, yeah, now get the hell out of here and try to keep knock em out from unraveling. I nodded to each cop as they left, thinking about what Naomi had said about Nash cleaning up the department to better serve the town. She was right. I guess we both wanted to do right by the town that had given us a place to call home. So, how's Naomi? Nash asked, sounding only a little irritated after the last officer walked out the door. Good, I said. Morgan men didn't kiss and tell or fuck and tell, but I did allow the smallest of smirks. You fuck it up yet? You're hilarious when you're pumped full of lead and drugs. He sighed, and I could tell he was already sick of being cooped up in the hospital. What's with the staff meeting? I asked. Couple of break-ins last night, an office and storage unit, both owned by Rodney Gibbons. Office wasn't bad. Someone got the petty cash and riffled through the safe combination was on a sticky note next to the computer. Storage unit was trashed. No one saw anything at either place, he explained. How long are they keeping you? I asked. Nash used his thumb to scratch between his eyebrows, a tell of frustration. Too fucking long? Said the soonest I can get out is a couple of days. Then it's PT to see how much mobility I can get back. If Nash didn't get back to 100%, he'd be handcuffed to a desk for the rest of his career. Something even I knew he'd hate. Then don't fuck around. I advised. Do what the docs say. Do your PT and get your shit together. No one wants you riding a desk. Yeah, Luce is digging into it, he said, changing the subject. He didn't sound happy about it. Is he? I hedged. You damn well know he is. It's police business. I don't need either of you amateurs out on the streets stirring shit up. I was offended by the amateur remark. We'd been professional hellraisers in our day. And though I might be a little rusty, I had a feeling our friend was even more dangerous now than he'd been at 17. Your boys get anything on the guy? I asked. Nash shook his head. Stolen car, wiped clean on the outskirts of Lawlerville. Locals found it about an hour ago. How clean? He shrugged, then winced. Dunno yet, 
No prints on the wheel or door handles. Assholes dumb enough to shoot a cop, he's dumb enough to leave prints somewhere, I predicted. Yeah, he agreed. He was moving his legs restlessly under the thin white blanket. Heard Liza has a few new guests? I nodded. Naomi's parents showed up this morning. Guess they're anxious to meet their granddaughter. Heard that too. Also heard that you made quite the impression coming downstairs in your birthday suit. Your grapevine needs some pruning. I was wearing underwear. Better dad loved that. He handled it. Wonder how you stack up against the ex-fiancé, he mused. Her parents weren't fans of the ex, I said, though I wasn't sure how I compared in Naomi's eyes. I peered down at Nash's untouched lunch tray, broth and ginger ale. How the hell are you supposed to survive on clear liquids? My brother made a face. Something about not taxing the system. I'd kill for a burger and fries. The boys are too scared of the nurses to sneak in any contraband. <laughs> I'll see what I can do, I promised. Gotta head out. Some shit to take care of before the big family dinner tonight, celebrating Way's first day and Naomi's parents coming to town. I hate you, Nash said, but there was no real heat to his words. Let this be a lesson to you, little brother. You gotta make your moves faster, or else someone else will make them for you. I started for the door. Tell Way to let me know if anyone at school messes with her, Nash called. Will do. Tell Naomi she's welcome to swing by any time. Not happening. Liza Jay's house no longer smelled like a mothball museum. It might have had something to do with someone opening the door to let four dogs in or out every five minutes. Then again, it probably had more to do with the fact that rooms that hadn't been touched in 15 years were getting Naomi's floor-to-ceiling treatment. Dusty drapes and the windows behind them opened wide. The lights were on in the den, a room that hadn't been used since the house had welcomed paying guests. I spied Steph behind the desk on the phone, staring at the laptop in front of him. There was music coming from the kitchen and I could hear the sounds of people socializing in the backyard. Maybe not all change was bad. I knelt to give the pack of dogs their rubs. Naomi's parents' dog, Beeper, was standing on one of Waylon's ears. Fuck yeah. The exclamation came from the den. Steph closed his laptop triumphantly and stood behind the desk, arms overhead in a V. The dogs, excited by his excitement, charged the doors and barreled into the room. Okay, no, everyone out, Steph said. These are very expensive gushy loafers you're destroying with your doggy toenails. Good news, I asked as he exited the den. The dogs took off toward the kitchen, moving as one clumsy organism of slobber and barks. Don't buddy up to me, I'm still mad at you, he said. When Naomi and I brought her parents over to meet my grandmother, Steph had tried to cover the fact that he'd been in town for days. No one would have bought his, what a coincidence, I just got here this morning, bullshit for long. I just helped them get here by telling Mandy and Lou what a relief it was to have Steph under Liza's roof for such a long visit. You'll get over it, I predicted. Just wait until you disappoint Mandy, he said. It feels like kicking a litter of kittens. I didn't really have anyone in my life to disappoint. I followed him into the dining room where my grandmother's buffet had been transformed into a high-end bar, complete with cut lemons and limes, an ice bucket, and several bottles of decent liquor. What are you drinking? He asked me. Bourbon or beer? It's too hot for straight room temperature liquor and beer isn't celebratory enough. We're having g and I could roll with that. What are we celebrating? Naomi's house, he said. It went on the market two days ago and she has three offers. Let's hope she thinks it's good news. Why the hell wouldn't she? 
Steph shot me a bland look, then started scooping ice into two highball glasses. You know how some people have dream houses? Well, Naomi had the next step house. She loved it. It was the perfect place to start a family. The right neighborhood, the right size, the right number of bathrooms. Giving up that house is like giving up on all her dreams. Plans change, I said, as he cracked open a bottle of tonic water. I'll say, since she had no intention of getting in bed with you. Here we go, I muttered. This is the part where you tell me I'm not good enough for her, and I tell you to fuck off. He poured a healthy slug of gin into each glass. Let's skip to the bottom line. She's giving up everything to clean up Tina's mess, again. As long as you're a pleasant distraction and not another mess to fix, I won't destroy your life. Gee, thanks. By the way, same goes if you hook up with Jer. To Steph's credit, he didn't fumble the lime slices or sprigs of rosemary he was adding to each glass when I mentioned my best friend. So that's what it feels like to have an obnoxious meddler sticking his nose where it doesn't belong, he said evenly. Yeah, not great, is it? Message received. Maybe a short-term palate cleanser is exactly what she needs to get Warner fuckface the third out of her head and start planning a life for herself and way. I'll drink to that, I said, ignoring the way palate cleanser rubbed me the wrong way. Cheers. Let's go tell our girl that in 15 days her money troubles are officially over if she's willing to kiss her dreams goodbye. We headed into the sunroom and out onto the deck. The humidity had broken just enough that it was almost comfortable outside. Oldie's music poured from a speaker on the table. Lou was manning the grill. The sizzle and scent of red meat made my mouth water. Amanda and my grandmother were sitting in Adirondack chairs, shading their eyes from the lowering sun. The dogs, wet now, shook and sunned themselves in the grass. But what caught and held my attention was Naomi. She was knee-deep in the creek, sunglasses on. That short, dark swing of hair pulled back in a clip. She was wearing a coral bikini that showed off every curve I'd enjoyed that morning. Waylay in a pink polka-dotted bathing suit doubled over and scooped two hands of cold creek water at her aunt. Naomi's shriek and ensuing laughter as she attempted to exact revenge on the kid hit me someplace besides my cock. I felt a warmth in my chest that had nothing to do with the damn good gin and tonic in my hand. Amanda adjusted her straw hat and sighed. This is heaven, she said to my grandmother. You must have had a different Bible than the one I grew up on, Liza quipped. I always dreamed of having a big family and a big house. All these generations and dogs all tangled up in each other's lives. I guess sometimes we're just not meant for certain things. She said it wistfully. Steph cleared his throat. Ladies, can I freshen up those Long Island iced teas? Liza held up her empty glass. I could do another round. I'm still working on mine, sweetie, Amanda told him. Have you decided to forgive me? Steph asked. Well, you did sneak down here without a word, she said, lowering her sunglasses to give him what I identified as a mom look. But you were just looking out for my girl. Anyone who does that is always all right in my book. Steph dropped a kiss on top of her head. Thanks, Mandy. Naomi and Wele were now in a full-fledged splash battle. Arcs of water rose high, catching glints of the late afternoon sun. How much time left on those burgers, Lou? Liza called. Five minutes, he said. Knox, Amanda said, drawing my attention. Yes, ma'am. Take a walk with me, she said. Uh-oh. Steph flashed a smug look at me and disappeared inside with Liza's glass. I followed Amanda to the end of the deck and down the stairs into the yard. It felt like only yesterday that it was Nash and me in the creek fooling around, scaring the fish. Pop, manning the grill. 
She slid her arm through mine as we walked. You've only known Naomi for a short time, she began. I already didn't like where this was going. Sometimes you don't need a history to see the future, I said, sounding like a damn fortune cookie. She squeezed my arm. I meant in her entire life, my daughter has never jumped into anything, especially bed with someone. I didn't know what to say to that, so I kept my mouth shut. She's a born caretaker, always fussing over everyone else in the room. It's no surprise to me that she'd step up to keep waylay even when the rest of her life is spiraling out of control. She gives until she's got nothing left. This wasn't news to me. If Naomi wasn't slinging drinks to customers, she was doing everyone else's side work in the kitchen or cleaning out Liza's mausoleum of a house. You brought her a cup of coffee doctored up just the way she likes it, she continued. She also told me that you got her this place to stay and gave her a job. You drive her home? Steph mentioned you got her a cell phone when she didn't have one. I was getting antsy. I wasn't known for my patience with conversations when I didn't know where they were going. She's a worrier, but doesn't want anyone worrying about her, Amanda continued. I get that. You worrying about her, you taking care of her when you only just met, says a lot about your character. So does the fact Naomi let you into her bed without the usual 99-point inspection. I was equal parts uncomfortable and oddly pleased. All due respect, Amanda, I don't like talking about your daughter's sex life with you. That's because you're a man, sweetie, she said, patting my arm. I just want you to know that I see how you're taking care of my girl. In all their time together, I never once saw Warner bring her a cup of coffee. Never once saw him do anything that benefited her unless it benefited him, too. So, thank you for that. Thank you for seeing my girl and wanting to be there for her. You're welcome. It seemed like the appropriate response. Out of curiosity, why do you call her Daisy? She asked. She had flowers in her hair when I met her. Amanda's smile broadened. She left Warner and drove straight to you without even knowing it. Isn't that something? I didn't know if it was something or nothing. Yeah, something. Well, I like you, Knox. Lou will come around, eventually. But I like you already. Dinner's ready, Liza J bellowed from the deck. Get your behinds around the table. I'm starving, Amanda announced. Why don't you get our girls out of the creek? Uh, sure. I stood there as Naomi's mother made a beeline for the house steps. Naomi's laugh and another splash caught my attention. I walked over to the edge of the creek and whistled. Wele and Naomi paused their water fight, both laughing and dripping. Dinner's ready. Get your asses out of the water, I said. He's so bossy, Naomi said in a stage whisper. Wele let out a girlish giggle. I tossed a starfish towel over Waylay's wet head. How was your first day, kid? Fine, she said, peering quizzically out from under the towel. The kid was a fucking rock. Abandoned by a no-good mother, taken in by an aunt she didn't know, then meeting her grandparents for the first time on the first day of school. And it was fine. She turned and ran for the stairs and the promise of food. Go wash your hands, Way, Naomi called after her. Why? I just got out of the water, Waylay yelled back. Then at least don't pet the dogs until after you eat. Fine. That's all she'd tell me, too, Naomi said as I helped her up onto the bank. You worried? I asked, unable to tear my gaze off her breasts. Of course I am. How am I going to fix any problems if I don't know they exist? So talk to the teacher, I said, watching the outline of her nipples get more pronounced under the two triangles of fabric that stood between me and what I wanted. I think I will, she said. How's Nash doing? 
Instead of answering, I clamped a hand over her wrist and hauled her over to the shady patio under the deck. Her skin was cold from the creek. Seeing her curves all wet like that was messing with my head. I picked up the fluffy beach towel next to her neatly folded clothing on one of the lounge chairs that hadn't seen the light of day in years and handed it to her. Thanks, she said, bending over in front of me to run the towel through her hair. A man only had so much self-control and I'd just reached my limit. I pulled the towel out of her hands and walked her backwards until her back met the support column. Nox, I pressed a finger to her mouth, then pointed above us. Who wants medium rare? Lou asked. Staff, this drink ain't gonna refill itself, Liza J said. What are you doing? Naomi whispered. Pinning her in place with my hips, she got the message pretty damn quick. When her mouth opened in an O, I yanked the triangles of her top apart. Full, luscious, wet. My mouth watered, and it had nothing to do with the food being passed above us. Jesus, Days. I see you like this, and I can't wait to get back in your bed. I dipped my head and closed my mouth over one chilled peak. Her sexy little gasp, the way her hands clamped on my shoulders, the way she leaned into my mouth like she wanted it as bad as I did. It all went straight to my dick. I'd fuck you right here if I thought for a second I could get away with it. She took one hand off my shoulder and shoved it between our bodies, cupping my erection through my jeans. I covered her hand with mine and squeezed, hard. I thrust against our hands, greedy for the friction. Kids, dinner, Amanda called from above us. Aunt Naomi, how many green beans do I have to eat? The glassiness in Naomi's eyes cleared. Oh my God, she mouthed at me. I gave both nipples a not-so-gentle tweak before readjusting her top. I wanted to fuck her in that bikini, to untie one or two of those strings and guarantee all the right access. Then I wanted to take her every way possible until neither one of us could walk. Instead, I was going to have dinner with a hard-on and an audience. Sometimes life just wasn't fucking fair. She slugged me in the shoulder. What is wrong with you? She hissed. Our families are right up there. A whole lot of things, I said with a grin. You're the worst. We're coming, she yelled. We will be later, I promised under my breath. 26. PMS and the Bully. Naomi. I arrived at Honky Tonk early for my shift in my dad's pristine Ford Explorer. A bonus to having my parents in town. Another bonus was the fact that they were having a movie night sleepover with Wele at Liza's. I was under orders to buy a car ASAP. Between my poker winnings and the proceeds from the sale of my house, I found myself in a pretty solid financial position, even with the impending purchase of a decent car. Then there was the quickie Knox had coaxed me into that afternoon when he came over to help me put together Waylay's new desk. I was feeling pretty damn good about life when I strolled into Honky Tonk. Hello, ladies, I said to Fee and Silver. You're looking gorgeous today. You're early and in a good mood, Fee noted, sliding the cash drawer into the register. I hate that about you. Silver glanced my way as she flipped the stools off the bar. She paused. She's got orgasm face. She's not one of us. Crap. The last thing Knox or I needed was our co-workers gossiping about our incredibly satisfying sex life. <laughs> oh, come on. I scoffed, hiding my face behind a curtain of hair as I tied my apron. A girl can be in a good mood without having orgasms. What's with the chocolate and heating pads? Next to the register was a plate of brownies wrapped with pink cellophane, a box of stick-on heating pads, and a bottle of Midol. Knox's monthly care package, Silver said. Who gave you the O-face? Care package for what? 
I asked, ignoring the question. All our cycles synced up. Stages, too, Fee explained. Every month, the boss puts together a period survival kit and is nice to us for a day or two. That's really nice of him, I said. Fee slapped the bar. Oh my god, you had sex with Knox. What? Me? Knox? I felt my face getting hot. Why would you think that? Can I have a brownie? She's definitely deflecting, Silver decided. Yeah, Nomi, your poker face needs some serious work. This is so fucking exciting. You know, he's never shagged an employee before. Man, I knew there were sparks. Didn't I tell you there were sparks? Fee slapped Silver in the shoulder. Yeah, sparks, Silver agreed. So are you guys a thing? Or was it a heat of the moment, my brother's just been shot kind of thing? On a scale of meh to my vagina is forever ruined, how good was he? Fee asked. This was not going the way I'd planned. My gaze slid to the kitchen doors and back to the expectant faces before me. News traveled fast in this town, and I did not want to feed the gossip. You guys, I really don't want to talk about this. They stood there staring at me. Then they looked at each other and nodded. Okay, here's how it's gonna go, Fee said. You're going to tell us everything, and in exchange, we won't tell anyone anything. Or else what? I hedged. Silver's smile was wicked. Or else we spend the whole shift wondering out loud who put that smile on your face in front of all the customers. You're evil. We're evil, but we can be bought, Fee reminded me. Your parents walked in on your one-night stand. Classic, Silver said ten minutes later when I'd finished verbally vomiting all over them. And your vagina is officially ruined, Fee added. And we aren't in a relationship, unless you're my parents or a caseworker weighing my stability as a guardian, in which case we've been swept away by an unexpected romance. But you are having sex, Silver confirmed. Temporarily, I said with emphasis. Silver raised a pierced eyebrow. Fee stopped gobbling down her brownie. Saying it out loud makes it sound stupid. Maybe we should finish getting ready to open? Eh, I'm PMSing. I'd rather read another brownie and talk about penis length and orgasm intensity, Fee said. I was saved from responding by my phone signaling a text. Sloan. My blabbermouth niece told me something I think you should know. Me. What? Is my side part out of style? Sloan. Yes. Also, she said the teacher's been pretty rough on way the last two days. Me. What do you mean? Sloan. Chloe said Mrs. Felch is being mean to Waylay, yelling at her in front of the rest of the class, making weird comments about her mom. Chloe and Nina got in trouble for defending her. Me. Thanks for letting me know. Sloan. You're going to go mama lion on an elementary school teacher, aren't you? I pocketed my phone. I hate to do this to you guys, but I need to go to Waylay's school. Is Way in trouble? Fee asked. No, but Mrs. Felch is about to be. Mind covering for me until I get back? Silver looked up from the heating pad she was taping to her stomach. I'll cover for you if you bring me back one of those pretzels with caramel dip from the place next to the school. Fee's eyes lit up. Ooh, bring two. Better make it three, Silver amended. Max is coming in at 4.30 and she's on day two of the red tide. Three pretzels with caramel dip. Got it, I said, untying my apron and grabbing my purse. You sure you don't mind covering for me? Fee waved away my concern. It's always slow the first hour or two after opening, and Knox won't be here with all us gals in the middle of Shark Week. Shark Week? She pointed at the Midol and brownies. Oh, right, that's Shark Week. Thank you for covering. I blew them kisses and headed for the door. The school was less than two blocks away, so I hoofed it. It gave me the time to work up a good head of steam. I was sick and tired of people thinking they could judge someone by their family's behavior. 
I'd lived in the shadow of Tina's misdeeds my entire life, and I hated that Waylay was facing the same kind of problem. She was just a kid. She should be having sleepovers, playing games, sneaking junk food, not dealing with the fallout of her mother's reputation. Worse yet, she hadn't trusted me enough to tell me she was having problems with her teacher. How could I fix a problem if I didn't know it existed? Knockamout Elementary School was a squat brick building in the middle of town. There was the standard wood-chipped playground to the right and the long drive out front where buses loaded and unloaded every day. The school day had already wrapped up, but I hoped I could catch Mrs. Felch in the building. The front doors were all still propped open from the mass exodus of students, so I headed inside. It smelled like floor polish and disinfectant. It was only the first week of school, but the bulletin boards outside the sixth grade classrooms were already full of artwork. Except for room 303. The board was empty, except for a calendar with a countdown on it and a piece of paper with the name Mrs. Felch. I hadn't met her at back-to-school night. She'd been out sick, and I'd spent most of the hour gently reminding parents and school staff that I wasn't my sister. I kicked myself for not making more of an effort to meet her before leaving her in charge of my niece. I spied a woman sitting behind the desk at the front of the classroom. Best guess put her in her early 50s. Her silver streaked hair was pulled back in a bun so tight I bet she got headaches from it. She was dressed in head-to-toe shades of beige, and her lips were pursed in a thin line as she scrolled through something on her phone. She gave off the air of someone who was disappointed in just about everything life had to offer. I gave a cursory knock and walked into the room. Mrs. Felch, you don't know me, but... The woman looked up and bobbled her phone, eyes narrowing behind her glasses. Don't play games with me. I know who you are. Good lord, hadn't the dang grapevine caught up to the teaching staff yet? I'm not Tina. Tina. I'm Naomi Witt. My niece, Waylay, is in your class, and I'd like to talk to you about how you've been treating her. I'd never been good at confrontations. Hell, I'd squeezed my ass out of a church basement window to run away from a wedding rather than tell the groom I wasn't going to marry him. But in that moment, I felt a fire burning in my belly. Backing down wasn't an option. Neither was retreat. Retreat. How I've been treating her? I've been treating her the way she deserves to be treated, Mrs. Felch snarled. The lines on her face carved deeper. I treat her the way the daughter of a whore deserves to be treated. Excuse me? You heard me. A movement out of the corner of my eye caught my attention, and I realized that I had a much bigger problem than a horrible sixth grade teacher. 27. Field Mice Revenge Knox I walked into Honky Tonk through the kitchen, twirling my keys around my finger and whistling. Someone's in a good mood, Milford, the line cook, observed. I wondered exactly how big of a dick I usually was that made my good mood breaking news, then decided I didn't really give a shit. Making sure to school my expression into my normal scowl, I headed into the bar. There were about a half dozen early birds scattered around the place. Max and Silver were eating brownies behind the bar and clutching their midsections. Fee came out of the bathroom with her hands on her low back. God, why do I have to pee 147 times a day when I'm riding the cotton pony? She groaned when she spotted me. Oh, what the hell are you doing here? It's period night. I own the place, I reminded her, scanning the bar. Yeah, yeah, and you're also smart enough not to show up when you have three menstruating women on shift. Where's Naomi? I asked. Don't you take that tone with me today, Noxie. I will break your face. I had taken no tone with her, but I knew better than to point that out. I brought you brownies. You brought us brownies so we don't cry in the kitchen. She had a point. 
V knew my secret. Tears were my kryptonite. I couldn't handle a woman crying. It made me feel desperate and helpless and pissed off. Where's Naomi? I asked again, trying to modulate my tone. I'm fine, Knox. Thanks for asking. Even though I feel like my uterus is being crumpled up inside my body so it can be expelled through my lady canal, I'm thrilled to be working tonight. I opened my mouth to retort, but she held up a finger. Uh-uh. I wouldn't do that, she advised. I shut my mouth and tagged Silver at the bar. Where's Naomi? Her expression stayed carefully blank, but her eyes skated to Fee, who was making an exaggerated slashing motion across her throat. Seriously? I asked. My business manager rolled her eyes. Fine. Naomi was here, but there was some trouble with Wele's teacher. She went to take care of it and asked us to cover for her. She's bringing us pretzels afterward, Max said around the brownie she held between her teeth as she shuffled by with two fresh beers. I was pretty sure that was a health violation, but was smart enough not to mention it. I eyed the women before me. You thought I'd be pissed that she went to take care of something at the school? Fee smirked. No, but it's a slow day. Thought it would be more fun this way. I closed my eyes and started to count to ten. Why haven't I fired you yet? Because I'm amazing, she sang, spreading her arms wide. She flinched and clutched her stomach. Fucking periods. Amen, Silver agreed. Strap on one of those damn heat pad things and take turns getting off your feet, I advised. Look who's Mr. Menstruation, Fee said. Working with the synced sisters has educated me in ways I never wanted to be. Who's the teacher? What teacher? Max asked as she blew past us again with a couple of empties. The brownie was now gone. I hoped it hadn't fallen into one of the beers. Waylay's teacher, I said in exasperation. Did she say what the problem was? Is there a reason you're so interested? Fee asked, looking too damn smug for my liking. Yeah, I'm paying her to be here and she's not here. Your tone is aggressive and I don't react well to aggressive during my lady business, Silver warned. This was why I didn't come near Honky Tonk during Code Red, which is how I labeled it in my calendar. Mrs. Felch, Max called from the corner two top she'd commandeered. She was sitting on one chair with her feet propped on the second and a damp bar towel draped over her forehead and eyes. I'm personally not a fan of Mrs. Felch. One of my kids had her. She gave homework over Christmas, Fee recalled. Fuck. Fee and Silver turned to look at me. Max peeked out from under her cold compress. Mrs. Felch is married, I said. That is usually what Mrs. means, Silver said, patronizing me. Mrs. Felch is married to Mr. Felch, Nolan Felch. Fee got it first. Oh, shit. That's not good. Wait, didn't Tina... Yeah, she did. I gotta go. Try not to scare off all the patrons. Fee scoffed. They're here for the free Bloody Mary shots we give out during crappy hour. Whatever later. Heading for the parking lot, I vowed never to come back to Honky Tonk during a code red. I made it almost to my truck when Liza's Buick rolled up. But it was Naomi's dad, worry lines carved into his forehead behind the wheel instead of my grandmother. Amanda was in the passenger seat, looking agitated. Everything all right? I asked, reading the mood. Wele is missing. Amanda announced, a hand clutched to her heart. She walked to the cottage to get her schoolwork together and was supposed to come straight back to Liza's. We were going to have dinner and a movie night. She didn't come back and her bike's gone, Lou said gruffly. We're hoping Naomi had seen her. I swore under my breath. Naomi's not here. There was some trouble at the school with Wei's teacher and she went to handle it. Maybe that's where Wei went. 
Amanda said, clutching her husband's arm. That's where I'm headed now, I said grimly. You're part of a parent-teacher conference? Lou scoffed. No, but I'm sure as hell gonna have your daughter's back when she walks into an ambush. I ignored the speed limit and stop signs on the short drive to the elementary school and noticed Lou did the same behind me. We pulled into adjacent parking spaces and stormed the front doors, a united front. I hadn't stepped foot in the school since I was a student here. It looked as though not much had changed. How do we know where to go? Amanda wondered when we walked in through the front doors. I heard raised voices coming from one of the hallways. My money's on that way, I said. Your sister ruined my life. I didn't wait for the wits. I headed toward the shouting at a dead run. I made it to the open door just in time to see a seething Mrs. Felch fisting her hands at her sides as she leaned into Naomi's personal space. I stalked into the room, but neither woman paid me any attention. From what you've told me, your husband ruined your marriage. An innocent 11-year-old certainly isn't to blame, Naomi said, hands on hips, not giving the woman an inch. She was wearing another flirty denim skirt. This one had a distressed hem with threads that skimmed her thighs. I both loved the way it looked on her and hated the fact that she was wearing it to serve beer to men who weren't me. She's got her mother's blood, doesn't she? There's nothing innocent about any of you, Mrs. Felch hissed, pointing an accusing finger in Naomi's face. My plans for Naomi and her tight little skirt would have to wait. Bullshit. My announcement had both women whirling around to face me. Mrs. Felch's eyes got big behind her glasses. I was a scary fucking guy when I wanted to be, and right now I wanted to be downright terrifying. I took two steps forward, and she backed into her desk like a cornered rat in bifocals. Knox, Naomi said through clenched teeth, I'm so glad you're here. She was tilting her head and subtly pointing toward the floating wall that created a coat room just inside the doorway. I glanced in the direction and caught a glimpse of blonde and blue hair. Waylay, holding a jar of God knows what, gave me an embarrassed finger waggle of a wave from her belly on the floor. For fuck's sake, I muttered. There's no need for language, Mrs. Felch barked. The fuck there isn't. I countered, angling myself to block part of the opening to the coat room. And I think Waylay's grandparents will agree. I jerked my head toward Lou, who, until that point, had been holding Amanda back with a good grip on her summer sweater. Seems we've got ourselves a family conference, I said, crossing my arms over my chest. Judging from how your daughter turned out... This episode of the video is temporarily over. To watch the next part, please return to the channel and find the next episode with the same title. Thank you for supporting the channel, and I wish you a delightful time listening to the story. I love you.